from the campfire to the chef's table. Food has always been the great convener. And while it is a distinct element of our unique cultural identity, it is also a common language. For when we share our plate with a stranger, we open ourselves not just to a new and thrilling experience, but also to understanding the connection with the other. Today, food security stands as a hallowed and unassailable tenant of true human dignity. This is a moment in which meaningful and effective international cooperation can entirely recast centuries-old imbalances, imbalances we can no longer sustain and under which we will never truly thrive. Let us do so to the benefit of billions of people whose quality of life depends on the establishment of an equitable system that rewards responsible and productive practices, protecting communities as well as the land those communities call home. Good morning, everybody. Sabah al-Khair. I hope this finds you well. Excellencies, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Food, Agriculture and Livelihoods Business Forum here at Expo. It's wonderful to see you all. This morning, the event is brought to you in association with PepsiCo. It's also co-curated by the governments of New Zealand, Estonia and the Dubai Chambers. Today, the overarching question that we need to consider is how do we sustainably grow food to meet future demand? It's a critical issue when you consider the forecasts for the world population reaching 10 billion by 2050. The COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, highlighted the vulnerabilities of our societies. And the UN World Food Programme's most recent assessment of the situation is pretty worrying. It says that food insecurity is soaring in no less than 20 regions and countries. These so-called hunger hotspots are also experiencing often conflict domestically or otherwise. Economic shocks, natural disasters, they're vulnerable especially to climate change and humanitarian access, which really is putting millions of lives at risk. A food crisis could potentially affect all of us at any time. And the UAE has carved out a food security leadership role on the world stage to really spotlight these issues. Today, we'll hear about its councils, its strategies, its valleys, its incubators, and its gateways, all dedicating to enhancing food security, environmentally, swiftly, and sustainably. Healthier, cleaner, affordable, non-impactful, plentiful food must be on the menu. Stronger collaboration, new tools, and involving the next generation of decision leaders will be imperative and must be on the agenda. We hope to leave you today with much food for thought and a greater thought for food. And so, without further ado, uh, to start proceedings, it is my great honor to invite to the stage Hassan Al Hashmi. He is the Vice President of International Relations at the Dubai Chambers. Please give him a very warm welcome. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Dubai Chamber of Commerce, 
I would like to welcome you all to the Food, Agriculture, and Livelihoods Business Forum. For those of you who are visiting from abroad, welcome to the United Arab Emirates, welcome to Dubai, and welcome to Expo 2020. With this mega event, the UAE and Dubai has made a promise to the world to openly discuss challenges and tackle issues that bond us as humans across multiple themes throughout Expo. At Dubai Chamber, which represents close to 300,000 private sector members, we are dedicating this business forum to stimulate broader thinking and engagement, particularly to this important theme week of food, agriculture, and livelihoods. With the world's population expected to grow to almost 10 billion by 2050, global trends are emerging that influence food security, poverty, and the overall sustainability of food and agricultural systems. Here in the UAE, the food and beverage trade has increased steadily to reach over 20 billion US dollars in the first nine months of 2021, according to a new Dubai Chamber analysis. Supported by growing demand and enhanced efforts to improve food security and diversify the food imports. Our nation imports close to 90% of its food products and our country's climate and growing population combined with the global pandemic has escalated the need for food security. Our government has underlined the importance of food security as a key element of comprehensive development and has formulated policies aimed at facilitating sustainable food production by utilizing the latest in technology and innovative approaches. As global food supplies become increasingly stretched by rising demand, the focus has shifted from capacity to achieving greater efficiency and self-sufficiency. In order to increase local production and reduce environmental impact, the UAE, along with other government, governments in the region, is investing in cutting-edge food production techniques, such as hydroponics and vertical farming, smart irrigation, and aquaponics. To add to this, advanced technologies such as AI offer new opportunities for the whole value chain related to this sector. The government has also implemented numerous initiatives and policies to ensure that UAE achieves its vision of becoming a leader in innovation-driven food security. Back in 2018, we implemented the National Strategy for Food Security with the aim of making the UAE among the world's best in the Global Food Security Index by the year 2051. Agrotech is transforming Dubai's agricultural landscape with the growth of Control Environment Agriculture, CEAs, in the form of indoor greenhouses and vertical farms that typically uses 95% less water than traditional farms. Ladies and gentlemen, there is immense potential in focusing on achieving sustainability through innovation and management of food and agricultural product production and resources. The recently launched F&B terminal at DP World is a progression in achieving this goal, which is aligned with the country's vision to establish Dubai as the leading innovation and F&B hub. With a strategic geographic location and strong focus on international trade, Dubai will continue to play an important role in ensuring business continuity and smooth movements of, good, of goods while it serves as an important trade link in the global food chain. Dubai Chamber will also continue to work to identify attractive trade and investment opportunities in the food sector and facilitating global partnerships that boost and diversify Dubai's food trade with other countries around the world. But most importantly, to highlight the role of the private sector and encourage a broader contribution across this important value chain. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to the forthcoming discussions, which will shed light on key trends and opportunities within the fast expanding food agriculture sectors. I hope you will find these sessions to be informative and insightful, and we are thankful for your participation. Special thanks to our supporters, PepsiCo, New Zealand, Estonia, and everyone else that is involved in putting this important sector on the focus. I wish you a very good day ahead. There we go. That's me on. You look a long way away, all of you. Good morning. My name's Hazel Jackson. I'm very, very excited to actually be learning with you today. Um, and I'm delighted with the first question that my panel needs to answer. I'm going to invite them out on stage. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Bada Sukari, Sanjay Sajeti, Celso Moretti, and live from, from New Zealand in the evening, Volker Kunsch. If you could come on stage, gentlemen, for me, please. Give them a round of applause, make them feel welcome. They have a small question as they come and take their seats to try and help us answer today. And I love this question. How will smart, sustainable technologies feed 10 billion people by 2050? So that's all they have to try and solve in the next 30 minutes. Uh, we'll, you'll be the judges to see whether we do a good job of it. Um, so welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with us here this morning. Fascinating conversation outside in the speaker room, learning from all of you. I can see you over there, Bada, um, a long way off. But I'm going to ask you each to give me one minute on why you should be sitting on this panel having the expertise to try and solve this big question. And Celso, I've loved your storytelling this morning, so kick us off with a short introduction. Hey, thank you very much, Hazel. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. I'm Celso Moretti. I'm the president of the Brazilian Agriculture Research Corporation, uh, Embrapa. And uh, I was telling Hazel that we had this uh, beautiful story in Brazil that back in the 70s, Brazil was a food insecure country. And because uh, Embrapa was established back in uh, 1973, uh, through science, technology, and innovation, we transformed Brazil in one of the world's powerhouses on food, fiber, and bioenergy. So I'm delighted to be here, and I'll be more than glad to share my vision and my thoughts with you. Fantastic. Thanks, Celso. Sanjay. Good morning, and uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, excellent uh, infrastructure, and what an event. Uh, would have loved to be here for a, a little longer. Uh, my background, uh, I work for an agribusiness, a multinational agribusiness, and I have been in this industry for about uh, uh, 25, 30 years, and uh, involved in uh, international trade, uh, farmer, and uh, supply chain related issues, agri supply chain related issues. I come from India, and India is where uh, the maximum resources uh, which uh, the planet can offer uh, for <laughs> agriculture have been invested. So it is people, about 560 million people, who are uh, employed in agriculture, and 150 million hectares of land, the largest uh, arable land which any country has deployed for agriculture. So thank you. Very pleased to be here. Fantastic. Thanks, Sanjay. Let's go to New Zealand to Volker, and then I'll come back to you, Bada, as our local uh, member of the panel. Volker. Thank you, Hazel, and good morning, or kia ora from New Zealand. I'm very glad to be joining. I apologize for not being there in person. My um, background is in the seafood industry, and you'll hear me talk with passion about the oceans. I am originally from Namibia, um, studied in South Africa, and then spent my working career in countries like Germany, the UK, the US, and Japan. And I'm now leading a science institute in New Zealand, where I feel we have amazing opportunity to make a difference in the future food supply, and looking forward to talking more about that in due course. Thanks, Volker. And Bada, final introduction. Not sure we can hear you. Just give us one second. Yeah. How about now? 
Bit better? Okay. I've been in the food industry for almost 25 years now, and I think I'm here today really to talk about all the initiatives that can be developed locally and how we bring suppliers and buyers together to really create more efficiencies, minimize wastes, and create a better overall business environment. Fantastic. So an awesome panel, lots of questions I'm going to dig straight in. Um, the last two years, one of the biggest challenges has been supply chain disruption. No one can ignore that. What do we expect to see changing in international logistics over the next decade to alleviate this part of the challenge? And Sanjay, I'm going to ask you to lead us off, if you may. I think COVID has been a wake-up call there. Uh, the kind of supply chain disruptions which we have seen in almost each and every country have been unprecedented. Uh, I guess uh, the, the nature of very fragmented logistics, the lack of standardization uh, uh, of uh, logistics-related practices and infrastructure across countries, and also uh, the lack of uh, probably uh, the scope for further application of technology. I think those are the key issues which I see there. Uh, first and foremost, I think it is greater integration of logistics how logistics on land, sea, and uh, again uh, at the destination end, how it is integrated and how technology, uh, there is a technology backbone to, uh, to integrate that. The second part is that uh, how do we get uh, the fragmented nature of logistics in most of the countries? How does it get more and more consolidated? I think that is one uh, trend which we would see over a period of time because the place where I come from, I've seen a lot of small fragmented logistics players uh, disappear and market shares being taken by larger players who are integrated, not only in the country, but beyond that. Mm -hmm. So I guess it is, it is a, a question of uh, technology and integration of the uh, logistics backbone. Fantastic. Bada, you had some comments to add to here. So, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> I think one of, the, one of the main issues that we've had, if we look at logistics over the past couple of years, is on one side, we've, we've almost become too reliant on systems that have to function seamlessly. If there is any issue that comes along the way, what we found is that we're really unprepared to tackle issues, to tackle problems that come, that, that come along. Uh, COVID was an excellent example. I think over the next five to ten years, we will start seeing a lot of companies, a lot of countries start to actively look at how they can diversify that logistical risk, potentially by, by setting up storage areas within other parts of the world to help alleviate any logistical issues or backups that they might have if indeed we do end up, uh, hopefully not, but if we do end up with, a, with another situation uh, such as COVID. Okay. Um, now, obviously, a lot of people's livelihoods are made particularly by the smallholder farms. And I know that all three of you had a long conversation around this. Um, how do we better empower and engage the global supply chain so that those smallholder farmers have got access and can make a difference to the future? So, also, you've done an awful lot of great work in Brazil and a lot of that connecting with the smallholder um, farms. Can you share some ideas and insight? Uh, in Brazil, we have uh, around 6 million farmers, and 85% of those farmers are small holders, small uh, farmers. And uh, uh, we have been uh, working really hard during the last uh, four, four decades on technology transfer. So we develop technology, uh, we do innovation, and we transfer those technologies to these small holders so they can be more competitive and then. Uh, during the last uh, years, uh, we are really focusing on more sustainable. So uh, basically, competitivity and sustainability is in the, the heart of the, uh, our strategy, and that's something that we have been doing with smallholders uh, uh, for many, many years now. India is the same. You've got a large group of smallholder farms. What have you been doing there? So India, as I mentioned, has about uh, 560 uh, workers in, uh, involved in agriculture, about 110 million households. And the issues there are basically uh, access to markets, access for, to input markets, access for crop produce uh, 
to the uh, terminal markets. Then access to finance and insurance and as well as technology. This is uh, an area where uh, greater collaboration between government, science and businesses along with uh, the farming uh, sector is the need of the hour there. Uh, the, the, the biggest issue there is how do we disintermediate because the supply chain is a broken supply chain and uh, the farmer, uh, farming sector has excessive, uh, excessive uh, reliance on, uh, on the intermediaries. So how do you, uh, how does business, how do businesses integrate the, uh, the farmers into the supply chain, deal directly with them, provide them the right inputs by way of uh, technology, farming practices, as well as uh, finance and uh, access for markets. I think that's the need of the hour and that's what uh, we have been trying to do there and government through its farmer producer organization initiative, which is to consolidate collectivize farms in smaller groups to make them more capable and stronger uh, is uh, trying to consolidate the farming sector. Okay. I do want to get very shortly to some of the innovations we see coming, but it also says to me that Brazil is doing some of the things that maybe India can learn from and vice versa, and that's the purpose of us all being together in, in, in Expo, in, in sharing these thoughts, and we'll, we'll come through to some of those ideas. Before we do, let's stay at a high level. Um, how can countries achieve food security, Bada, without distorting trade, causing inefficient land use, maybe overfishing through subsidiaries and tariffs. What's your view on kind of like the distribution issue? Well, I think what it all boils down to is, I don't really think that we have an issue with, with production per se. It's really with, with distributing what we currently produce and what we make to make sure that, that we make the most use of it. Today we have hundreds of thousands of, of pounds of food products sitting in warehouses across the globe. It's, I would see governments working with companies over the next few years to really try and improve their route to markets, getting products from these warehouses and making sure that the this entire distribution network works on a more effective and efficient model. It's not a production issue. In my opinion, it's more of a distribution issue that is the number one obstacle for countries to obtain food security right now. Does that get us to feeding 10 billion in 2050, or it starts the journey? It, start, it definitely starts the journey. Mm -hmm. If we take a look at the amount of waste that's generated annually and how much food is thrown, I mean, we can potentially feed everyone on the face of the planet if we had better systems of delivering food to them. Wow. So okay. it, it definitely gets us on the right path in another 10, 20 years, I don't see why that can't be achieved. Okay, fantastic. Volker, let's turn to your expertise. Um, the sea, 71% the sea, of the Earth's surface is covered by the ocean. What are we going to do to make sure we better utilize that to feed these 10 billion people? And I'll give you a little bit of a while on this. This is your passion, your life's work. So let's learn about the ocean. Thank you, Hazel. And um, admittedly, I'm not Jacques Cousteau. But um, I do have spent a lot of time with the oceans um, in seafood businesses around the globe. And the interesting number that you mentioned is 71% um, of our planet is ocean. But if you consider that only about 2% of all food comes from the ocean, or then in terms of protein, 17% of global supply um, comes from the ocean, then you would think that there must be more opportunity. Um, and um, the big question is why has that not been utilized more? The, um, we do have a fishing industry around the world, which admittedly in many parts has a bad reputation. Um, and we have an aquaculture industry where fish is being farmed or plants are being farmed around the globe as well. But all of that together does not live up to expectations that, that we could actually achieve. I think on the fishing side, just to take that off, the impression is very often that that's a very unsustainable um, environment. Um, there's overfishing, there's illegal fishing, um, unregulated fishing, etc. But a lot has been done in many developed countries to actually get that under control. And certification schemes these days highlight sustainable fisheries around the world. In international waters, there's unfortunately still quite a bit of 
this illegal fishing going on. Um, and practices are not always up to scratch, but I think with governments working together towards 2050, we can actually achieve a very sustainable outcome there. The other issue is obviously um, impact of fishing on the environment. Um, bottom trawling comes up a lot, and I do think that with innovation, we can actually overcome that challenge that we have. And then the carbon footprint of utilizing heavy fuels or diesel in um, vessels is also something that can be um, approached if we then actually get together on a much larger scale internationally to address that issue. Um, but first of all, I do believe that fishing actually needs to, to become a more socially accepted kind of environment, which in many countries, unfortunately, it isn't. And there is opportunity there for us to all work together. In terms of aquaculture, um, there's a bit of a negative reputation there as well, because we catch fish to feed fish. That used to be the big thing. That is, to a large degree, not the case anymore. The amount of fish that's these days caught to actually be used as fish feed is minimal. That's the one thing. And the other thing is that we do actually farm many species that don't have to be fed. Mussels, oysters, and then um, seaweeds, for example, ocean-based plants that um, have a wide variety of benefits. What I'm actually putting out there as a, as a theory is if we shifted some of our emphasis that we today put on land production towards the oceans, we could turn our climate much quicker into a climate positive um, environment, which is an amazing opportunity. And that is highlighted by the fact that some of the species that are being farmed in the ocean, oceans sequester carbon, um, are utilized as carbon sinks, that um, a seaweed has the potential to reduce methane emissions in cows by up to 95% wow. or more. And so there's great opportunity out there to actually um, to actually utilize the oceans to um, to not only provide more food, but at the same time have a Manage climate the climate. Positive. Volker, and I'm going to go. Let's let's turn our attention now to the future, because we've all a little bit talked about what we've done in the past or what some of the issues are. Smart. Um, agriculture is being embedded into different production systems throughout the world. We're using science, we're using technology. What are some of the key innovations you expect to impact us in the next 30 years? So let's not look backwards, let's look forward. Celso, tell us the top secrets. We want to know the secrets that you're doing in Brazil so we can spread them around the world. Okay, thank you, Hazel. <laughs> I, um, I will summarize in basically three pillars. First one, uh, digital agriculture. I have no doubt that the using of uh, Internet of Things, uh, drones, uh, sensors, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we are already using face, facial recognitions on cows because uh, the, the <laughs> nose of a cow is just like our fingerprint. So uh, we have cameras in the, the farms where you, uh, you uh, record the face of the, the, the cow and then you can manage and then you have less stressed, happier cows that you know will give off more and more milk. So that's part of the, uh, the secret. One is uh, digital agriculture. Uh, the second one is carbon neutrality. So we are moving really fast into the direction of uh, having carbon neutrality in the Brazilian agriculture. We already put in the market uh, the carbon neutral beef, one of the biggest players on uh, animal protein in Brazil. Uh, so carbon neutrality will be also on coffee, uh, sugarcane production, and other production chains. And last but not least, uh, bioeconomy. Uh, we are using an army of microorganisms to help Brazilian agriculture to be more effective, more efficient, and more sustainable. And one single example is that every year uh, we grow uh, 37, 38 million hectares of soybean without adding a single gram of nitrogen fertilizer wow. that comes from fossil fuel. We are using a bacteria that sequestrates nitrogen from the atmosphere and delivers to the soybean plant. So last year, we saved 18, 18, 18 billion US dollars on nitrogen fertilizers. And because it's a bacteria not comes from fossil fuel, uh, we did not emit 205 
million tons of CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. So that's why I like to say that agriculture is part of the solution for climate change and not Gosh. part of the problem. Fantastic. I love that. To build on that, technologies that you think are going to come through, innovations, um, Sanjay? Uh, just to add uh, to what Celso said, I think uh, from a smallholder farmer perspective, uh, farming is a service through uh, remote, uh, remote monitoring of farms and application of digital technology there. Uh, would be another trend which I see emerging in, uh, in countries where uh, smallholder farmers are uh, the dominant uh, segment. Okay. Better any build? There, there's definitely an element that technology will bring into the way, not from the production side, but, but also to the way we, we buy and sell and interact with one another as, as, as purchasers, as, as suppliers. We've seen a, a tremendous growth in digital sales over the past couple of years. I think that will definitely continue to grow. But there is also a, a very strong physical element that still exists within the, the entire purchase process that I think needs to develop over the, over the coming years to make it more streamlined, enable people to move more freely, to interact with more products, with more brands. The more they do that, and I think the more technology allows us to uh, to move around more freely, the more we end up taking pressure over, off of those supply chains, we can experience new products, find new brands to purchase. It, would, it enriches our overall purchase experience. Um, okay, I'm conscious that s somehow we lost a few minutes of time, thanks to the producers. Um, I'm gonna jump to a, a quick question, really, Salsa, that it's like, you were at uh, COP26 in Glasgow. You mentioned there that climate change, agriculture is a support. Um, also, Volta, really curious about your thinking about how we can accelerate um, the improvement of climate change, doing some things in oceans. One minute each on how do we have a role to make sure that we impact climate change. Celso to start, and then Volca to build. Okay. Thank you, Hazel. Um, as I said, uh, we understand that agriculture is part of the solution and not part of the problem on climate change. Brazil uh, signed the pledge uh, for the Global Methane Initiative to reduce uh, the emissions of uh, uh, methane until 2030. Uh, we are already working on having you know, uh, technologies that will allow us to reduce the production of uh, methane on beef and milk and other uh, production chains uh, uh, that we have in Brazil. We have other technologies, we have uh, public policies, so it's a set of actions that will help Brazil and I believe other countries in the world to tackle climate change. Fantastic. Volker, touch on the ocean slightly and then I'm going to go to our now 30 seconds closes, gentlemen. Yes, I highlighted the um, open oceans as an opportunity earlier. You can imagine that that's a quite dynamic environment. I think it ne necessitates governments business and science to actually come together, fund great innovation to make that paradigm shift happen. Um, we can't leave it to individual companies to, um, to put up hundreds of millions of dollars to invent technology that can conquer the oceans out there in a very sustainable manner. We need a bigger picture thinking there. Okay. We need the government, we need science, we need businesses to all work together. Final 30 seconds, one takeaway. Great audience here. Everybody's passionate about the subject. You gentlemen have to help us feed 10 billion people by 2050. What's the one takeaway that, that we could work on together as science, business and government that could make a difference? Bada. I think bringing a lot more producers to market, helping them, helping them consolidate what they produce and finding easier ways and more efficient and effective ways of displaying their products and, and getting it to the right places. Fantastic. Sanjay? I guess uh, farmer livelihoods and uh, the, their sustainability is the key issue uh, from a longer term perspective. And how do we integrate farmers into the larger value chain by uh, businesses collaborating with them along with the government support? Is the is probably the solution. Fantastic. It always comes down to collaboration and sharing of information in a lot of instances between government and countries. Celso. Yes, I have no doubt that science, technology, and innovation will play a key role on feeding 10 billion people in the future. 
and uh, I have to say that it's possible to feed the world and protect the environment, and we have been doing this in Brazil for the last five decades. Fantastic. Avolka from New Zealand, final comment for us. Um, introducing greater diversity in your diet and an absolute focus on reducing waste, I think, can take us a very long way. Fantastic. So we need to connect the smaller farms. We need to, we've got enough production. We need to figure out a way to manage distribution. And with the smart brains on this stage and in this audience, I'm sure we will get 10 billion people fed in 2050. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Volker. You can go to bed now. environment to thrive and that together we can better the path we are taking where technological prowess and scientific progress join forces where the quest for zero carbon footprint pioneers alternative energy and urban society is committed to creating a lifeline for tomorrow where our planet's sustainability feeds the economic agenda where educators and businesses partner to prosper where shared thinking fosters ingenuity and open sourced r&d accelerates experimentation where together we will architect a global blueprint for scalable and sustainable communities and as we take a step forward it's time to say join us make your mark Welcome to the path definers and the game changers amongst us. Welcome to a city of renewed energies. Welcome to Dubai. Everybody and uh, many thanks to Hazel and her esteemed guests for their contribution this morning. Time now for our first fireside chat. And the topic for discussion is positive food systems, how future demands will really be met by sustainable practices. We have an incredible panel for you. Uh, I will be your moderator, and I'm delighted to say that joining us first and live from Wellington in New Zealand is the Honorable Damien O'Connor, New Zealand's Minister for Agriculture, Trade and Export Growth, beaming live to us by the power of technology any second now. Minister, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I apologize for not being able to be there in person. It's wonderful to see you. I believe it's uh, coming up to seven o'clock in the evening in Wellington. Is that correct? It is indeed a beautiful uh, sunny evening. Probably not as hot as there, but uh, <laughs> we're enjoying it. Well, we look forward to seeing it and seeing you here in the not too distant future. I'd also like to welcome to the stage to complete our panel, Eugene Willemson. He is the CEO of AMESA, that's Africa and the Middle East and South Asia for PepsiCo. Please give him a very warm welcome. A little bit more volume. Briefing area, or can we get that? Gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you again for joining me. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, it's such an important topic for us to discuss today, and what an incredible fireside chat to kick off proceedings. Um, Minister, let me come to you first, if I may. Um, against the backdrop of COVID-19 and the pandemic that's affects, affected every single one of us for the past two years, of course, um, food and agriculture has very much been put in the spotlight, uh, not least getting food to people. Um, we need to address perceptions, how they have changed over the past 24 months, but also what the industry must do over the coming two to five years to make sure that not only demand is met, but also expectations. Minister, your thoughts, please. Um, you're all right. And look, uh, for New Zealand, uh, like many um, countries around the world, I guess the pandemic highlighted uh, just how central our food systems 
are. And for New Zealand, the agricultural systems that produce uh, the food that we mainly export, uh, about over 90% of the food that we produce is exported, um, but also internally. So, so we deem that workers in the food system were essential workers and they were able to continue with support uh, through the early stages of COVID and indeed uh, on till today. We have an export-led recovery. Uh, our wealth creation is off the back of the food we produce and sell around the world. So we were very focused on maintaining the biological systems in our horticulture, dairy and, and, and other uh, livestock systems that we have. But we believe a cooperation, of course, international cooperation plays a key role. We rely on fertiliser from other parts of the world. Uh, we rely on other components uh, into our food systems to enable us to export. And um, th that just as we were also reliant on medical equipment and on vaccines from countries we don't produce our own, we were able to assist with the export of food to countries where their food systems were reliant um, on, on our exports to them or, or from other countries. I mean, the pandemic, as we know, does create serious risks. Um, you know, food production systems in our country are interrupted by uh, people who are infected, who have to stay at home. Um, indeed, having the people to pick the crops, to milk the cows has been a challenge for us. But I think we're, we're rising to the challenge. Um, and we're able to assist where we can um, other countries to develop more resilient food systems. Um, people need nutrition. They require it every day where possible. So we have a, a responsibility um, to, to, from our learnings to get out and help people do that. So we will rely on our food production systems. We will assist others wherever we can and uh, make sure that the, the supply chains that we have across the world, not just for food, but for the components of food systems are open um, and reliable. Thank you so much, Minister. Eugene, um, Minister has, hello again. Thank you for being here. Um, the Minister summed it up uh, pretty much perfectly. Uh, uh, the challenges that have been presented are numerous. They've affected us all. It's our responsibility to make the situation good Lovely, again. Um, okay, international cooperation, again, so anymore. vital and pertinent to this survive? discussion. But talk to me about PepsiCo. What's your business doing? Companies globally, uh, operating in uh, in about 200 countries across the world, uh, with a wide variety of uh, food and beverage uh, products in our portfolio. Um, and I would say that at the core, PepsiCo is actually an agricultural company. So we uh, we work with about 100,000 farmers globally across the world in about 60 countries, uh, and those farmers grow 25 different uh, crops for us. So uh, helping create a sustainable food system is, is absolutely fundamental uh, to us, uh, to the world, uh, but also ultimately to our success. So what we've done uh, last year is we've launched uh, what we call PEP Positive, uh, which for us is, a, is an end-to-end -end, uh, transformation of the food system uh, with three uh, distinct pillars. And one is positive agriculture. Uh, with a very specific objective for us to convert over the next uh, eight years, so by 2030, 7 million acres, and which is equivalent to the land that we're using to grow those crops to regenerative agricultural practices. Um, second, and within that positive agriculture, also lift the livelihoods of 250,000 people within our agricultural uh, value chain. Uh, and third is uh, ensure that we sustain sorry, that we source 100% uh, of our crops sustainably also by 2030. So it's a massive undertaking. Part of PEP Positive is also uh, our commitments around uh, creating a positive uh, value chain uh, with, again, very specific commitments, uh, becoming net zero by 2040, and not just within our own company-owned operations, but across the entire value chain. So that would extend also into agriculture, but would include also our suppliers, as well as, uh, for instance, the bottling partners that we operate with across the world. Uh, it includes also a very specific commitment around becoming net water positive. So not just reducing water, but ensuring that we really leverage um, the know-how and skills that we have to conserve water to the benefit of uh, society at large and also work with other stakeholders to help them reduce that water, which in turn would make our company a net water positive company. Uh, and then third within positive uh, uh, value chain, also very specific commitments around packaging. 
Um, by 2030, again, we uh, aim to have reduced uh, the use of virgin PET by 50%. Um, and also, uh, we are working very extensively with stakeholders across all the markets where we operate to ensure that we can create truly a world where packaging never uh, has to become waste. And then the last, so there's three pillars, the last pillar within uh, PEP Positive is Positive Choices, which is all about further evolving our portfolio, um, ensuring that we, pro that we continue to provide a broad portfolio, that we also um, further improve the nutritional uh, credentials of our portfolio. Uh, and I think there's some great examples uh, uh, in our portfolio. I was in uh, South Africa two weeks ago, and in South Africa we really have an end-to-end -end portfolio that goes from the most basic food staples like maize, maize meal, wheat, etc., includes bread, includes all kinds of cereals, whole grains, etc., and then of course also our uh, beverage and, uh, and snacks portfolio. So I think that is a great example of how we uh, provide that, that broad spectrum. Um, and as I said, we're very committed to, to do what we can to help transform that uh, food system. Thank you very much, Eugene. Ambitious targets. Very ambitious and not easy to achieve. Yeah. But we'll get there, get yeah. there together. Ambitious targets, um, and this dovetails, of course, with uh, plans that the New Zealand government have as well, Minister. Let me come to you, because the UN's SDG 12, of course, addresses sustainable food production and consumption. And the government in New Zealand have something called Fit for a Better World Vision. Talk to me about the roadmap and how you're going to get there. And look, we're very proud of uh, the production systems that we've used over the last century, but we realise that the world is changing, expectations are growing on food systems, and so we sat down and developed a 10-year roadmap called Fit for a Better World, and, it, and it's aimed at accelerating productivity, um, but focused on sustainability and inclusiveness, which, which means that all the people involved in our food production systems must benefit, uh, not just um, you know, see some who, who are disadvantaged either through environmental impacts or through like, low returns for their, for their contribution. So we need to have high wages uh, and high um, outcomes. We, the Sustainable Development Goal 12, of course, says responsible consumption and production. And I guess that aligns exactly with what we are seeking to achieve with our roadmap, um, it, it's to say uh, it's ambitious. Um, we're moving uh, to a low carbon emission society. That's a decision we've made as a government. We want to restore the health of our water. Um, our systems have impacted on the water quality in some areas. Um, and we've also seen the decline in biodiversity. And we know that, that the consumers around the world are expecting us not to degrade the water or the biodiversity as we come up with the food, um, good quality food that they want. Um, we also have a, a concept of tatao, which, which is a Maori worldview, uh, which is, is a, it's a deep relationship and respect and reciprocity with the natural world. If we're good to it, it will be good to us. And I guess that underlies the sustainability objectives um, that are part of our Fit for a Better World. So it's a, a food systems thinking. Um, we'll be putting um, you know, some goals out there. We want to increase by 44 billion our export earnings. Uh, we want to employ 10% more people um, in high skilled jobs in, in our food systems. And we want to reduce biogenic methane emissions um, by up to 47% uh, by 2050. We, we have a target of 10% reduction by 2030. That's quite a challenge with biological systems, uh, with livestock um, and, and methane emissions that uh, can't be turned off overnight. But as was said by um, Volker, uh, we're working on a number of initiatives um, to try and reduce that with a different uh, feed, um, with, with additives where we can, uh, and just breeding better livestock. But uh, we, we are committed to um, the sustainable development goals and all of them, um, particularly in this area of, of sustainable and responsible production and consumption. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, committed to the goals, committed to solving the problem. Um, briefly, Eugene, tell me what is the most important thing that not only policymakers but corporations around the world must do to address the problem of the population swelling to 10 billion by 2050? The most important thing. 
The most important thing. Um, I think ultimately it's uh, addressing the, the challenges around climate change. And of course it is, I mean, you ask me, the most important thing, but, but of course everything is interrelated. Yeah? So if you look at the problem of climate change, I think it is a problem that we need to address across multiple uh, vectors. So one is uh, agriculture, and I think that is um, uh, working together to A, ensure that uh, we significantly reduce uh, waste. Uh, some of the earlier speakers also referenced the, uh, the percentage of waste. About one-third of the total production of both agricultural uh, crops as well as food today gets wasted. So, so that is something that we need to address. Second is we need to evolve agricultural practices and make sure that they become sustainable. Hence our commitment to uh, move to 100% uh, regenerative agricultural practices across the land that we're using. Uh, and then third, within agriculture also, there needs to be significant focus on reducing water consumption. Okay, thank you. Impossible to reduce it down to the most important thing, as you said, because everything is interconnected. Yeah. Um, Minister, we're tight on time. Uh, I wish we had more time. We could talk yeah. all day about this topic. But let me come to you in closing. Um, the same question. What's the most important thing for policymakers to address right now? And also, what can developed countries do for developing countries? What can emerging markets do to help the less mature ones? Minister. Uh, look, thank you. I mean, we have a responsibility as, as a developed country to, to assist those who are developing. Um, they need nutrition, and, and we like to say that we could be a country that is, is best for the world, that, that we share the technology that we have developed over the last century, um, share that with other countries, um, but we are facing new challenges. And, Eugene, the, the reference to waste is, is a very important one. One third of all our efforts are wasted when it comes to feeding uh, the 10 billion people into the future. We cannot afford to have that continue and so we must share um, you know our production systems our technology to reduce waste at the production the processing the distribution and, and finally at the consumption level that way we will help them as well as learning uh, and at, at how better to production uh, produce food ourselves as, as first world nations Thank you so much, Minister. Absolutely, one third uh, of food uh, wasted is unconscionable when we consider the problems that we all have to face. And there, unfortunately, we must leave our panel discussion for today. But please join me, members of the audience, in thanking my guests, the Honourable Damien O'Connor from New Zealand and Eugene Williamson of PepsiCo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I kindly uh, ask you all to remain seated um, before Eugene and I leave the stage because we have some special remarks from New Zealand's Minister of Agriculture, Trade and Export Growth. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Damien O'Connor. Eugene, please. Thank you. Kia and tēnā koutou katoa. Um, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honour to speak with you here today. I'd like to thank Your Excellency Reen Al Hashimi, uh, Hashim, Hashmi, sorry, my apologies, and the Dubai Chamber of Commerce, and New Zealand's honoured to be a co curator for this business forum. Uh, the overarching theme, as we've heard, of how do we sustainably grow food uh, to meet future demand and how do we feed 10 billion people into the future. In recent decades, we've made enormous progress and lifted millions of people out of poverty and food insecurity. But we still have a long way to go. Um, insecurity, malnutrition remain at unacceptable levels. And with COVID-19 and other shocks, it is harder for some countries to provide safe and nutritious food. There is also a growing recognition that our food systems must do better uh, to support our environment. How we produce and consume uh, is affecting the climate. We know that biodiversity, water quality and water availability. And as I say, as our planet is, it, it is estimated one third of our food is lost uh, that both Eugene and I referred to earlier on. I'm excited that food systems uh, can have a critical role in solving all of these challenges into the future. Today's forum is the latest uh, in a series of international gatherings examining how food systems can better support people, prosperity, and of course the planet, uh, including the United Nations Food Systems Summit and the recent Global Forum uh, for Food and Agriculture. Um, I've tried to get to a few of these as I can. Um, travel is somewhat limited um, with COVID. Uh, this 
uh, opportunity here at the Food, Agriculture and Livelihoods Business Forum is very, very important. It grows on the ambition uh, to enable us to focus on technology, innovation, digitization and collaboration in creating positive food systems. Um, as I say, we, we have fit for a better world, which is our 10 year vision uh, and a roadmap for our primary sector. Uh, it's, so it sets out goals and targets for productivity, better sustainability and inclusiveness of the primary sector um, to deliver more value for all New Zealanders. As I said before, we want sustainable and resilient food systems that deliver safe and nutritious food that is accessible for all. And our challenge as a nation to, in trying to lift the value of all our exports is to ensure that food that we provide our, our people is affordable for them as well. We need to generate social and economic prosperity while minimising waste and protecting, of course, the integrity of our natural resources. Um, first and foremost, uh, in terms of outcomes that we're focusing on, we must remain focused uh, on a food system that can improve well-being uh, and to provide sufficient nutrition, as I said, at an affordable price. There is no one size fits all approach um, to food systems around the world and each country's system is unique and therefore we need to be pragmatic, holistic and evidence based in our solutions. There are many different ways to meet our food system objectives and advances in digitization and innovation are unlocking more opportunities. Um, these approaches must be adaptable uh, to varying circumstances in different geographical and cultural context. We can achieve, of course, also collaboration, more in collaboration than we can in isolation. Um, and we have come together here today to have meaningful conversations that will ultimately foster uh, the, the transfer of knowledge that we need. Um, our ongoing participation and partnership on food safety with Gulf countries is a classic example. Uh, New Zealand and Saudi Arabia have signed a sanitary arrangement on, food, on trade and food in 2020, and we brought about cooperation between our respective food safety authorities, so we have confidence in one another's systems. New Zealand values the recognition from the Gulf countries uh, as a trusted and reliable source of safe, consistent and high quality food. And we're committed to an enduring, mutually beneficial relationship to provide that into the future. Another challenge, of course, facing the global food system right now is how we address greenhouse gas emissions, as I, I mentioned before, um, for, from agriculture, of course, while ensuring that we continue to have food security. We, we would like to think we're at the forefront of this work. Uh, agriculture makes up 48% of our national emissions and therefore our international obligations to reduce emissions must mean that we reduce emissions in our agricultural sectors. Uh, as I say, Hewaka Ekanoa is a process that we've undertaken a partnership between government, industry and Māori, our indigenous peoples of New Zealand, we're working together with the farmers and growers on practical solutions to reduce our emissions and to build resilience to climate change. And it, it includes developing a pricing system for agricultural emissions. Uh, I think the first in the world uh, once we get it through. And we will share our pioneering experience with the world uh, as this progresses. It's not easy, but we think it's worth the effort. We know that international collaboration on research and technology is critical to that success. And we're committed to progressing international partnerships uh, through such things as the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. And I'd like to acknowledge the, the countries and the individuals who might be there today who are part of that. Thank you for your cooperation and collaboration. We've also joined um, the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate, and we look forward to working together to increase international investment in innovation, research and development so that we can get um, climate smart agricultural and food systems. And I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of the United Arab Emirates uh, through this work. Certainly, of course, we need to remain connected, and this is why this forum here is so important. Open rules-based trade in food uh, and, and food and products that make up our food production systems uh, is absolutely essential. Uh, essential. Uh, we cannot solve, solve the global food security and environmental challenges through isolationism. And we must grow food where the environment best supports it and where emissions efficiency is greatest 
while minimising the barriers to trade and efficient distribution. New Zealand's committed to demonstrating how trade agreements can be used to support sustainability. Just as uh, with the distribution of vaccines, trade is the solution, not the problem, so too when it comes to food security. So finally, I'd like to, um, you know, we, we'd like to build food systems that deliver for future generations. We all have a responsibility to do that. And through our chairing of APEC last year, uh, we ensured a food security roadmap towards 2030. Um, ministers noted that inclusion of small business, women, youth, indigenous communities, and the elderly in the sector is integral to maximizing our resources, to improving our rural and remote and coastal livelihoods, and unlocking the full potential of the APEC region. That applies around the rest of the world. So New Zealand commits to work with all of you um, to ensure that um, our indigenous people, our people of the land, um, contribute to a more sustainable and more secure future uh, for food and all the people who live in our planet. Kia ora. Thank you so much indeed to uh, Minister O'Connor joining us from the Beehive, a hive of activity in Wellington. We thank him. Time now for a TEDx talk, and we are asking what metropoles around the globe can learn from the Netherlands as the first food-producing city. Here to deliver the talk is a lady who has devoted most of her life to sustainability and innovation. She's incredibly sought after, so we're delighted that she's with us today. Please give her a very warm expo welcome. She is Mini Prins, the CEO and co-owner of Priva in the Netherlands. Yes, good. Um, so, CEO of Briva, and I'm very honored to be able to speak here. Um, next to my CEO, I'm also ambassador for the Netherlands for Water and Food for the Dubai uh, Expo. First of all, I'd like to share very briefly about my company. Priva is a technology company that develops hardware, software, data services. And with 600 colleagues, we, uh, about 600 colleagues, 18 local offices. I think the sound is not good. Wait. This is better, maybe. So with 16 local offices, our 450 installation partners in the world, the, the um, service center that we have in the Netherlands, uh, we're active in climate controls, energy savings, and water reuse. For our customers all over the world in their field, of expertise and we like to connect we like to connect with our build people in the build I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to do something about the mic if that is okay excuse me for a second Okay. 
Okay, sorry about that. I hope this is better. Yeah. Um, okay, so we are active in climate controls, energy savings, and water reuse. Uh, in, in the field of horticulture, building automation and indoor growing. And we want to get connected. We want to get connected to our built environment uh, customers who want to increase the comfort in the building using less energy. We want to be connected to our growers in the horticulture world who want to increase their yields using less energy and reusing as much water as possible, growing a high quality, healthy crop. We want to get connected to our customers in the indoor growing world, where nature and technique comes and meets as most, being able to grow in harsh climate like here. So, Priva once started her mission, realizing that it can help our growers to increase the yields using less natural resources. That is sustainability in its heart, and we want to grow this value. Priva also says that making profit is not a goal in itself. It is a meaning for continuity, for creating a climate for people to grow. And we need to. So Priva wants to be active in the world where all those solutions finally will become more integrated. And more integrated means that our ambition is to play a role in the circular economies based on green tech and smart buildings for the cities of the future. And we need to. We need to change so many things. Because the way it is today is not good. While we are subsidizing growing tomatoes, meaning that growers are overproducing, they dump their food in Africa, while the local farmer there has no right to, to build a basic existence. And then the amount of waste. So we need to change our tax systems, the subsidies, the way we do it, uh, about labor, water, about energy sources, about so many things. The way we produce food today is influencing and having impact on our climate. And the, the climate change is impacting the way we do the food production today. At first I thought, okay, we, were, we are warned, huh? so we are warned by the IPCC and by the UN, it will take probably 2040, 2050. But say it's 2040, then we only have 20 more years to make a serious change in our existing system. And that is not easy, because we also subsidize this system. So we spend about $7,000 billion a year on subsidizing fossil fuel industry, on subsidizing agriculture in the world, to keep a system alive that is destroying our own planet, only for maybe the profit of the, I don't know, 500 largest companies in the world who are influencing our policy makers. So as long as we are facing the fact that making profit and growing economies is still more important than anything else in the world, it's very difficult to change. So what's the plan? What's the plan? There's only one way out. If something is difficult to change, you could put a lot of energy in that, but maybe it's better to start something new next to it. And we can. We can if we look at the cities. We can if we look at the entrepreneurs and the people of the city. 
they will be the drivers of sustainable and disruptive solutions. Let's have a look at those cities. Everyone knows its green belts, has been talking about. All those small farmers in the green belts producing the food, most of the food still goes to the cities. But this is disappearing because they have no successors. There is no next generation who wants to do the same work far away in the field. Hard work, no living. So there's no next generation there. It is disappearing. And then those same cities have brown fields, mostly undeveloped land, as we call it. Very interesting to have a look at. But how can you imagine to bring that closer together? It's not only more sustainable, it's not only more resilient, because the cities need to become more resilient, but it's also for the next generation, because for them, they want to stay within their urban area, close to the friends in the university and the schools they studied with. So imagine the food potential. And I just took London as an example. You need some figures to find it out. And you see that green belt around London, and there's the same. There's no farmers, no high production. So also London has to import about 80% of her food. And then in London itself, in and around, you have still those undeveloped land. About 2,700 hectares, same size as Westland in the Netherlands. If you do the food potential on that, so if you do the math, how much food is needed for the city of, New of London, and how much undeveloped land is still in and around London, then London can be self-sufficient for more than 60%. It needs, it's needed that city government, city planners and architects really start to rethink how the cities are designed. They can produce a major part of their own food. And I'm talking food. I'm talking nutrients. And I'm not talking calories. Huh? So I'm talking vegetables most of the time. So to rethink the way, there's another point to it. Because if you have undeveloped land, it is, of course, obvious that maybe some real estate developer will be interested in to develop it. And there is also the, the idea from the city or the vision or the, the vision that they really have on their own cities is take on the long term. It's not like a short term investment in real estate. It will be like a longer term developing of the new economics because there's so many things around food and there are so many entrepreneurs needed. And, and you can stable your business models, there is social coherence, there is so much more when you finally start producing food in your own cities. And I took a city with me to show. And the city is called the Netherlands. And if you look at the Netherlands, it is urban, rural, urban, rural. It's the same. The same like New York, the same like many other largest cities in the world. And it's the first food producing city in the world. Only looking at the vegetables for now. I can take the rest too, but that for me was important. Because the vegetables that are grown in the Netherlands have a wide circle of about 600, 700 kilometers, what we still call local, eh? one day transport. And in the Netherlands, it started with an ambition once. And it was after the World War II because there was hunger. And there was a minister and he said, no more, never hunger again in the Netherlands. So they created a law, and that law made it easier for farmers to, to grow their farms with buying land next. And they made another law. And then there was one important law, and that was this one. And that is where the horticulture really started to develop in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands, the, the government had a vision, an ambition, and they made a law. And that was it. 
and it started. And the law was then to prohibit the usage of metal bromide, meaning lots of innovation, because the growers had to get out of the soil into the gutters. And from the gutters, they started to recycle the water. And with recycling water, they also built these greenhouses or plastic houses to cover, to protect, to have the little animals in there, to climate controls, water management, energy solutions, management information, many, many, many businesses around it. And more integrated solutions were coming there when the greenhouse was really heating up a whole urban area, or wastewater from the city of Delft was reused for wastewater, or we have geothermal now being connected to the greenhouses. We have Kipster, what is, by the way, the most sustainable chicken farm in the world, and it's marvelous to see those chickens there. Kingfish, wonderful, really innovative, producing quite some fish and then the floating farm. And it's not because, I mean, it looks f funny. I mean, who puts cows on a floating farm? But it does something with the environment. It is iconic. And it reconnects to the people in the neighborhood. And it even does something with the value of the houses in the neighborhood. And it attracts other entrepreneurs. So sometimes you have to look behind what is really the impact from something that you do in a city. Integrating those green belts, developing brown fields. It's obvious. But I was also asked to say and to tell and share, what lessons have we learned in the Netherlands? Well, there is a drive to overproduce, not in the Netherlands only but in many, many other countries too, because the cost price needs to go down, go down, go down, go down. And the banks are also investing in you as an entrepreneur when you scale and scale and scale because the cost price needs to go down. This is not what it was meant to be. It is crazy that the pizza today is cheaper than broccoli. So we corrupted the system price-wise by subsidizing one part and thinking that entrepreneurs in a local situation can compete and build up their living or their business when they're constantly disrupted by the existing food production system. So there we need help. If you build up something new next to something existing, then there is help needed to really build up and go for your food producing cities. True price. This is the challenge. You will have a challenge. But it will be a vision and the vision that I hear here from the UIE too, that is an example for so many other places in the world where will they face the same difficulties in, in dealing with harsh climate. And it starts with this ambition and a local government that facilitates. And it can be so many ways that you can help out. There is a country in Africa that increases its input duties again to make sure that the local farmers could build up the business. A country like Switzerland did not want to join the AU to protect their own farmers, and look what it is today. And large farmers, you can go there as a customer and buy the meat from the farm that you sure and know where, where the cow has been walking. So there are many ways to um, stimulate or to look or to talk with the local entrepreneurs. And this is a nice example I found in Norway a couple of weeks ago. The only thing that they did was to put the amount of CO2 emission on red meat in the supermarket, and the sales dropped down with half. So also consumers are more aware, and it is good to inform them so they can make their own choices. It's not only about the technology. 
I mean, it will attract the younger generation to be part of the agriculture business again. It's about the people, the entrepreneurs, the cities, to make it all resilient for the long term. 10 years we need to start finding entrepreneurs, develop ecosystems, create the infrastructure, find the right ways to support them as a government. 10 years then we need to really scale up the food producing part in the cities. So we are the change together. They are livable and they are our future. Thank you very much. into Africa, when you go into Asia, when you go to Latin America, you will find that a farmer in an Arab land, he or she are doing well. But in marginal environment, they don't have solutions. We do have four types of forages that can take 70% of seawater. And that's very important. What we are saying is that you could do agriculture with non-fresh water. You extract the groundwater and you desalinate it, leaving salt water behind and fresh water for the greenhouse crops. The salt water, in this case, we can put that on a crop and grow some food. But we want that to be sustainable. What we don't want to do then is overwater so that you start to increase the contamination in the groundwater. It's about minimising the impact and maximising the economic returns of that salty water making that waste water into a resource stream. Fascinating insights so far this morning. Um, we've heard quite a lot already about PPPs, public-private partnerships, and I'd like to invite my panelists from three very different countries right now to share their examples of how they are helping make PPPs work um, and what we think we can do more in the future with collaboration. So if I could welcome on stage, and you guys need to wake yourselves up a little bit, I promise a coffee break after this session, but I am going to hear the fact that you are a little bit more enthusiastic. As I welcome on stage um, Pedro Beruti from Costa Rica, Dr. Mayafa from Zambia, and also Alpha Kennedy from New Zealand. Wake up, audience. Thank you very much. Gentlemen at the back gets the best applause for, uh, from there. They're going to come on. It's a long walk, you see, so we're getting our steps in coming on this stage this morning. Thanks, Alpha. Superb. Doctor. Fantastic. Thanks, Pedro. Superb. So we were having fascinating conversations about these three different countries. And thank you, first of all, for all being here in person. Yay, um, for that travel. And, and really, how can we use public-private uh, partnerships? What's the impact when you're working in a smaller country, maybe with a smaller population, a sport, smaller uh, square kilometers? And what about a country like Zambia, which is a little bit bigger? Um, and what are some real life examples of where they've been successful with PPPs? Before we go into that, I'm going to ask each of you to shortly introduce why do you think you were invited to be on this um, panel in your area of expertise? And I'm going to go with ladies first. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mayafa, for being here with us. Thank you very much. Um, as introduced, my name is Rhoda Mofia Mukuka. So sometimes you see Mukuka there, she might be saying Mofia. 
So I'm an agricultural economist by training. Uh, in the last 10 years, I've been working as a senior research fellow with the Indawa Agriculture Police Research Institute in Zambia, uh, with um, extended work in Southern Africa. And then uh, recently I moved to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, as food security and nutrition coordinator. My training background has been on um, agriculture trade, focusing on food and uh, consumption. Thank you, Heza. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Alpha, furthest away from me, like New Zealand, but a local here, I believe, for the last 16 years. Kia ora koutou katoa. Salamu alaikum. My name is Alpha Kennedy. Ngāti Ruanui Te Ate Awa, my tribes. Um, you know, I think uh, my story started off really within the military, and I was deployed to Afghanistan. And uh, as part of our work, we saw, uh, you know, I saw the challenges of implementing uh, foreign policy in particular, but also international development. And so I came away from that thinking, you know, I've got to do something more. There's a better way to do it. So I, I left the military and started a company there. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> Big jump. <laughs> a massive jump. And uh, international development, uh, agriculture, livelihoods uh, has then become, I guess, my passion for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, and then, you know, more recently that's transitioned into the corporate sector uh, and investments and, uh, you know, PPPs itself are a great mechanism. Um, for, for, for achieving some of those goals. Fantastic. Thank you. Pedro. Thank you. Happy to be here. Congratulations for a great expo. Yes, I come from a little country, Costa Rica. <laughs> it's the smallest out of the three of us we worked That's at. That's right. Yeah. Even smaller than uh, the UAE, smaller in terms of population, in terms of uh, land size. Country better known for our rainforests, our biodiversity, our volcanoes, our rivers, our beaches. Uh, and so on. Also a country with no army at all, with social stability. But as a small country, we have managed to export more than 4,000 different products to the world. Wow. So I'm here to explain how we've done that through public partner, private partnerships. Fantastic, thanks Pedro. I'm gonna kick start. I'm gonna start with the smaller uh, countries if I can. We were talking about how scale might give you advantages to do PPPs, you know, so the smaller scale, maybe it's easier to do those PPPs. Um, I'd like to explore that. Um, Alpha, would you kick start? What do you think some of the advantages have been for New Zealand and in creating these public-private partnerships? Yeah, well, I think uh, being a small country gives, gives a couple of really important advantages. One of those is um, the ability to be agile, you know, as a government, um, but also in the private sector as well. You know, we, we pride ourselves on being able to solve challenges quickly. Mm -hmm. And so being small, uh, being responsive, you know, it's, it's a short step to go from uh, being uh, the CEO having a conversation to an MP for that then to being able to translate itself into, into policy. And so by virtue of being small, you're able to shorten that time frame of making those decisions to be agile and uh, to, to create the, the necessary mechanisms for those uh, PPPs to, to, be, um, to be established and to be successful. Is that the same in Costa Rica? <laughs> yes, it's easier to move a uh, canoe than to move a uh, transatlantic, <laughs> right? And uh, being small helps us be more agile, helps us with uh, communication, helps us with building uh, the right framework to collaborate. And that's what our PPPs are all about. Uh, collaboration between the public and the private uh, sector to achieve common goals. Common goals that are also linked to SDG goals, right? At the end of the day, we're trying to reduce poverty, we try to reduce inequality, we're trying to uh, increase access to uh, resources and, and so on. And uh, we have noticed that uh, these PPPs are key vehicles to achieve those goals. I'm gonna come back for some examples in a moment. But let's turn to Zambia. We were included as three small countries, but then we actually did the maths and realized you're significantly larger. And so, you know, maybe don't have the same level of agility um, that the other countries have talked about. What are some of the things that you believe PPPs can do to help you? And, you know, how are you seeking to grow more public-private partnerships? Um, thank you very much. So. Um in addition, I think, to what um, my colleagues have mentioned, 
being relatively small. <laughs> For Zambia, we are talking of about 18 million uh, people. I mean, compared to Kenya, Nigeria, that is uh, still relatively small. So the advantages, um, in addition to what they've said, would be the increased um, investment outcomes per capita. Right. Uh, if you look at, um, and outcomes include economic, um, uh, social, and uh, environmental. And if you look at a smaller population, then you expect the income per capita to be higher. But now that depends on the distribution. In the previous uh, session, we heard more about how the um, distribution of returns uh, is a significant um, aspect to look at. So as, as long as the PPP is providing opportunities like employment, which are equitably distributed, that would help with the distribution of the returns to investment for the PPPs. So for Zambia, we are looking at investments that will lead to employment right. in order for the PPPs to be realized per capita as a country. Okay, Thank fantastic, you. really clear. Let's go to some examples. What's worked? Okay, we're talking about the theory of PPPs, and these are great. You all have examples of where it's worked in each of your countries in different parts of the, uh, the supply chain um, process. Let's start, Pedro, with you. What's a good example of a PPP for Costa Rica? Yeah, so I think the first step in a PPP is to have a shared vision of success. That's what we have had as a country. We realize we're small and we don't have the economies of scales of larger countries, but we also realize that as a small country, we can become a global leader in something. Costa Rica has become a global leader in sustainability. And sustainability understood not just as the environmental part, which, you, which we kind of achieved a long time ago. By now, all our electricity comes from renewable sources, but sustainability in terms of the, the people uh, the planet and the profit or the prosperity we want to achieve. So that's our shared vision of success as a society, right? Position Costa Rica as a different country, uh, which it's a good citizen to the world and it's aligned to SDGs. With that vision of success, we then build the vehicles or the uh, teams to make that happen. Of course, we, want, we need to have a clear, transparent, uh, uh, institutionality from the public sector to provide the private sector with clear uh, rules. We have recently, two years ago, launched a new program called the Descubre, means, means discovery in Spanish, which basically connects the different government agencies that are connected to the agricultural uh, uh, area with the private sector to what? Discover new products, new technologies, uh, to increase productivity, to close the gaps between the rural and the uh, uh, urban areas of Costa Rica, and in general, increase the value of agriculture to our country. This is as part of this strategy to again keep our keep diverse, diversifying our economy, which is what we have accomplished in the last uh, years, in which none of our products represents more than six or seven percent of wow. our total exports. Wow, okay. W what about in, in Zambia, uh, Dr. Moifa? You have a couple of examples for me, I think, of public-private partnerships that have worked. Can you share the specifics? Thank you very much. Um, so before I give the examples, I just want to mention that the PPPs in agriculture generally, globally, is, is relatively new compared to other sectors. I think we've had more successive PPPs in, um, in the health sector, infrastructure, uh, but for agriculture, it's, it's really relatively new. Uh, so for Zambia, I'll give two examples. The first one is the seed industry. And as you know, most uh, uh, countries in Africa consume maize. Mm -hmm. Zambia is currently one of the, let me just say, the largest exporter of maize in the eastern and southern um, Africa. And uh, this has worked through the government providing an enabling environment for most of the companies to invest in the seed industry. And also, we are lucky to have the 
favorable climatic uh, conditions to grow the maize seed. So for maize and uh, soya beans, we are currently the largest exporter in the region. Uh, we've attracted huge, uh, large companies like uh, Syngenta, Monsanto, Pana, Sidco, to mention all these. They are currently exporting quite a huge amount. And uh, for the partnerships, what the government did was to create a seed control and certification institute, which um, mainly provides the services to these, uh, to these companies. And through the certification institute, um, an act was an act of parliament. Um, a seed law was also introduced to ensure that the, the, there is harmonisation in terms of the services um, that the, the seed control, and the certification um, uh, institute is providing. So that is one of the success examples I can give. The other one is the sugar industry. Um, I'm sure most of you have been to Zambia. Uh, I have seen the Nakambala sugar as you drive going to, to Livingston, to the Victoria <laughs> Falls. So it's, it, they're huge plantations. And uh, one thing about the Nakambala sugar is that uh, it has attracted the smaller producers, the smaller growers of seed um, in the form of outgrower initiatives where the smaller producers feed into the main company, which is like an anchor um, um, a company around uh, 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 in the country. And uh, sugar currently is also hugely exported, even as far as West Africa. So those are the two examples Samples. of the PPP, clear PPP that I can say, in the agricultural sector. Fantastic. Alpha, to build on that, you've also, you've, you're now passionate about creating these PPPs and supporting um, that. What are some examples of where it's worked? I think in New Zealand, we are very lucky to have a lot of research capability uh, within the Crown Research Institutes. You know, these government facilities, uh, a huge wealth of expertise and research capability. And PPPs offer a unique opportunity to leverage that research capability for the private sector. So it can be very expensive for the private sector companies to hold that research capability, that R&D capability inside 24-7, 365. Yeah. And, and forming these PPPs with a Crown Research Institute allows you to leverage the knowledge that they have, but also provide that, that market pool, that knowledge of what the market, what the consumer is, is demanding from that product and then wrapping that around the research to ensure a better, uh, a better outcome. You know, examples like plant and food research, we have some uh, representatives here today uh, and here this week as well. Their collaborations with Zespri, uh, New Zealand's large kiwi fruit marketing company, uh, and that, that R&D, that research, allows that to reach a much broader, you know, as that product is, is developed and improved mm -hmm. and comes onto market, it can be leveraged out across the wider growing community very fast. Yeah. Uh, in Afghanistan, I've also seen it work quite well in terms of creating market linkages. You know, you've got all these disparate smallholders um, who, who struggle to get produce to market. And PPPs can offer incentives to, uh, to, to private sector companies to formulate their aggregation component. And that allows potentially those smaller holders, if it's done in the right way, to, to, to achieve a better value for their product. Um, and to sell more into the market. Uh, and in Afghanistan, you know, we've seen recently the international community withdrawal. Uh, those relationships have endured. That private sector is still there. So even though that PPP may not necessarily be still active, mm -hmm. that relationship connected is still working and still working to the benefit of them. And in this case, it's allowing aid and distribution um, to get out and also allowing that small vehicle for, for those, those farmers, that small lifeline for them to reach the outside world in terms of trade. We heard in an earlier panel that actually food production is not the problem, it's distribution. So what are you seeing out there for PPPs in that important supply chain experience? So it's not just about supporting technology and innovations and, and more sustainability with the farmers and with the smallholders, but it's actually getting that product to market, are you seeing PPPs solving that problem? 
<laughs> and yes. if not, where are those people? <laughs> we, we, we aim, we aim to, to solve that problem. Yes, you are totally right. It's not a production problem. It's mostly a distribution problem. There is a challenge, I would say, uh, mainly in low-income, mid-income countries, which is connectivity. Mm -hmm. How we can help connect the dots, that's a role of uh, PPPs. And when I mean connectivity, it's both in terms of technology, meaning uh, the right access internet yeah. infrastructure to give access to the farmers on new uh, technology developments, training, access to finance, uh, information in general, so that they make the right decisions at the right time. But also the connectivity in terms of logistics. Right now, these days, the world is uh, facing lots of challenges in terms of uh, logistics and distribution. Mm -hmm. And PPPs somehow can help connect these dots and help keep a, a a fair trade or a balance among the different uh, players of the, of the value chain, which are many. Um, you had an example um, of a PPP through COVID Alpha that actually really did that. Can you explain that from a connectivity perspective? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, COVID borders closed uh, and New Zealand is a long way away, <laughs> right? Very long way away. And we export most of our produce uh, out by, uh, by sea. Right? But ships were no longer coming um, to New Zealand. So the government acted very, very quickly and secured PPP arrangements with leading airlines, including Emirates and, uh, and others in the region, to create essentially a corridor to allow that produce still to move. Yeah? Because we needed to feed the world, but also we're an exporting country. Mm -hmm. you know, it was very important for our own economy to be able to export. And how do we achieve that in this COVID time? And, and this mechanism was set up very, very quickly. The government was able to offer uh, the financial or fiscal security and incentives to allow those airlines to continue um, to provide such a service and create, ensure that connectivity for, for New Zealand's producers and, and exporting com companies. Fantastic. Other examples from, from Zambia on the supply chain? You're, you're, what did you say? It's not landlocked, it's land leaked. Is that right? Is the positive uh, sense. And obviously you've got certain countries around you that you need to go through. How, how do we get that connectivity for a country like Zambia? Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to say landlocked to look at it from the positive side. So I'd say land linked, yeah. So for countries like ours, also not having a seaport, um, that is already a, a, a huge challenge in terms of connectivity and um, supplying to the, or connecting to the global markets. Uh, for, for Zambia, we have to export through South Africa and um, sometimes through um, Botswana, uh, not Botswana, Tanzania. Uh, it's mostly South Africa and Tanzania, even if um, the Mozambique port would be nearer, but I think because of logistics, infrastructure, South Africa and Tanzania is more ideal. So you can imagine even uh, if you talk of exporting fresh uh, goods, that is already a major challenge. But we want to say um, we are land linked so that we look at the opportunities of supplying all the eight countries that are bordering our country. Mm -hmm. So we've come up, like I mentioned, the seed industry, we are already taking advantage of that market. The Congo Diara market is quite huge. So we are trying to take advantage of exporting to those um, eight around countries. You. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's, let's turn our attention to the small um, holdings, to the, to, we talked about a little bit earlier on, you know, um, ultimately we need to try and create a bit of balance between what they're earning out of these PPPs. And we were saying um, in the speaker area that often the PPPs tend to favor the big organizations or the, the larger producers tend to get the immediate be benefit. How do we create some balance? How do we create not only jobs for people further down the, the food chain with these PPPs, but actually also a balance of income from there. Pedro, it was a, a comment from you. I'd, I'd love for you to build on it a little bit. Yes, for, that, for us, that is uh, fundamental, fair trade. And, and it's not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's also our strategy to achieve our commercial goals, right? We compete with other countries uh, to uh, position our products 
everywhere around the world. So the way we compete is by differentiating from other countries because we are a country that does business with purpose, not just from a sustainability standpoint in which, again, all our electricity comes from rivers, sun, water, but also from a social perspective. Every mango, papaya, uh, banana, or pineapple you buy from Costa Rica, you're also buying a model of society which uh, is connected with the SDGs and has also social, environmental, and of course financial uh, objectives behind that. So the PPP acts as a moderator in that uh, process. In our case, Procomer, we are the trade promotion uh, agency of, of Costa Rica, and we are a PPP ourselves. So we are always looking to keep these balances of uh, fair trade, uh, and also the, the balance between the three Ps. Again, I insist on that because that's kind of our, our vision, right? People, profit, and planet. So keeping the balances among these three, it's also fundamental, not just to contribute to uh, SDGs, but really to compete to differentiate and to be perceived as different and as a country that brings value through our values as well. Smaller organized, smaller country, sounds like you've been working on this for a while. So much harder in a country like Zambia to create perhaps that complete connection. What do you need? We've got a global forum. It's not just the people in this room. There's a lot of people that are watching. We need public-private partnerships to come together to help solve and to really connect the dots in Africa. What are some of the things you'd like to see happen? Here's a mandate for you to actually ask for help um, as what's needed right now in countries in Africa. Thank you, Heza. Um, so what we need to see is more and more of the smaller producers connected to the larger um, um, uh, local markets, but as well as to the, to the outside uh, global markets. And what, what would work for these um, smallholders to get connected is where they are brought together, of course through cooperatives which have been there for a long time, but they need to be more um, active and more recognized and also where we have larger um, uh, companies acting as aggregators. Uh, the smaller ones, um, for the smaller ones to be consistent suppliers of food, uh, which of course is what is needed for the buyers, for the global buyers, they, sh they need to have aggregators. The aggregators that will bring together the products from the smaller ones and um, uh, supply to the larger market. But also I think what is critical for countries like mine is to have clear guidelines or clear roles from both government and the private sector. What is the role of government? Of course we know PPs, the government's main role is creating an enabling environment, but also ensuring that the, there is enforcement of the agreements that are made um, uh, within the, the, the private sector, the agreements between the larger companies and the smaller ones to ensure that there is harmonization of um, all the agreements um, uh, that are made um, on the particular uh, value chains. And on the private sector side, there are huge opportunities for investment. Uh, <laughs> Zambia, talking of 18 million people, where uh, the country sits on uh, 750 square thousand square meters, that is already huge. So land is available. What we need to see from the government side is to ensure that there is um, easy access to land by the investors, which, which there is. <laughs> there's so your, we there's are your looking, pitch opportunity. Yeah, exactly. So we are looking to more and more investment in agriculture for increased PPPs in this field. We've had successive PPPs in other sectors, but for agriculture, we still need more and more. There are huge opportunities. Thank you. Fantastic. I always thought there's a great opportunity here, right? Global audience, big space of land, good quality soil. Um, we just need some PPP involvement to be able to make that work. Alpha, what do you think the critical success factors are? Can we boil it down to a few things that make a good 
PPP. Um, and, and then I am going to say to the audience out there, I, don't, I can't quite see if there's microphones, but I presume there is going to be. If you have questions for the panel, please feel free to get involved. You guys are also experts, and I'd love you to put some of those questions forward. But Alfred, what are the critical success factors? Well, I think firstly is, is to understand the end state that you want to achieve from the PPP. You know, is it, is it to increase production? Or is it to uh, reduce inequality? Or is it to remove a bottleneck? And they're quite different problems. And so the PPP should be structured differently uh, accordingly. Yeah? So I think, firstly, until we were to boil it down to some key success factors, you know, having a really clear alignment on goals between each of the parties. You know, if there's that misalignment, it's not going to work. Um, ensuring that there is transparent allocation of responsibilities um, and also benefits. You know, what is the ROI expected to be for the government, uh, the public sector, also the ROI for the, for the private company, and also the ROI for if it's going to impact producers, what's their ROIs? And having that up front so that people understand why we're getting into it, and, and you get that buy-in um, buy from the start. And then I think it's really important that there is a, there is a mechanism for the governance of that PPP. And sometimes, and I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush here, but um, in some countries, the Ministry of Agriculture is not always going to have the capacity uh, to implement and provide that, that, that governance structure for, for a PPP. You know, a lot of that knowledge might sit with the Ministry of Economy or mm -hmm. the Ministry of uh, Water and Energy, which typically have a much, a much longer um, past track record. Uh, with PPPs. So ensuring there's that capacity building and that, 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 that governance structure is set up properly from the start um, will go a long way to ensuring the success of it um, in whatever uh, sector you're going to, to implement it in and whatever, that, whatever ultimate objective you're trying to achieve. We had a conversation about bottlenecks. I mean, it sounds in theory like PPPs, oh, we'll just figure those out. I understand we need to have better governance structure. We need to set the goals up front. What's getting in the way of really being ready to feed 10 billion people, which I hear is not an issue from a point of view of production, but an issue of distribution? How do countries like yours help guide the rest of the world, Pedro, so that, that, that we solve this problem, not in... 10 years or 20 or 30 years time, but faster. Yeah, Alpha did a great summary. I think uh, as any program, we need governance, we need clear roles and responsibilities, we need communication, we need trust, we need uh, measurable outcomes, we need uh, common agenda and so on. However, <laughs> there are always obstacles. There are always challenges, many times because of things that we don't control, like the containers crisis recently or, or COVID and, and so on. But if the foundations are there, which are the ones I just uh, mentioned, uh, I think as a team, PPPs can address the challenges, right? Every country will have different challenges. Every PPP will have different challenges depending on the, on the, on the industry. But, there's, but if there's trust and if there is uh, the right transparency and communication, those challenges can be uh, okay. addressed. Okay. Doctor? Um, he has summarized quite well, <laughs> actually. But um, I think for countries like mine, we still have huge challenge, logistical challenges, infrastructure, uh, which I think the government is, is, invest, is investing a lot in infrastructure development to reach out to the rural uh, producers. Um, but also I think what we need are more stable po uh, trade policies, um, not one day the, the borders are closed, the next day <laughs> the borders are open because there's uh, food insecurity at a particular time. And um, I think that is needed, and not just um, for the producing or the exporting um, country, but also the, the, the importing country. But I think, like he has said, every PPP has, has its, its own challenges. But generally, I think the issue of, uh, for low-income country like, countries like mine, I think um, infrastructure, logistics challenges um, as turned out the most, yeah. 
Okay. Let's, let's close out with your top tips. We're connecting minds here. Um, everybody's here to explore, to discover. I love the fact that we're going to a, a coffee break shortly and people might want to come and have a specific conversation with you one-on-one -on -one about what's happening in Zambia or what's happening in Costa Rica or in New Zealand. But what would be your takeaway? How can we stimulate some change do something different, move something forward with PPPs? What would be the one thing you would want people to go away and maybe do as a result of this session? Alpha, I'll go to you first. Yeah, well, I think I'll, I'll aim this at the, the sort of international development mm -hmm. space. Um, you know, I'd like to see PPPs take up more of that profile uh, and, and that transition away from grant-led or, or donor aid. You know, it, there's a place, there's a time and space for that, but the quicker you can transition to the private sector um, working with the local government in order to implement some of these development objectives, some of these economic objectives, some of these trade objectives, uh, the faster you're going to put that country in a position of being able to stand on its own two feet and, and to grow organically. Yeah, it's not just, not just being pushed. And, and so that would be really, I think, if there was one thing I, I'd encourage anyone in that space um, to think about is what are the opportunities for us to do this? And it can be on a small scale or, or a large scale. It doesn't have to be a $50 million project. It can be a $50,000 project. Right. Yeah, there's this space for any of them. Con connecting those two things. Um, Dr. Maifa? Yeah, technology transfer. Okay. I think this is one of the, the advantages of, of PPPs where the, the smaller producers have an opportunity to have the technology transferred to them through that um, uh, trade integration with the bigger ones. And uh, when we talk about um, uh, risks, um, the government also tends to transfer the risks to the, to the private <laughs> sector. So we, we're looking more to uh, the, the smaller ones being more efficient in production through the, 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 the technology and the, the, the lessons that they pick up from the uh, larger um, partners. Fantastic. Share of technology. Pedro, final word. What's our takeaway? Uh, my takeaway is that PPPs are an instrument not only to feed 10 billion people, but to me it is really an instrument to create a better world. A world with more jobs, with more opportunities, with uh, less poverty, with less inequality and with more prosperity. Yes, of course, there are challenges, but uh, it's proven to be a good vehicle, a good instrument to create that better world. Fantastic. So, in charge of feeding 10 billion people, but also creating a better world in the process, I feel very safe in the hands of our panelists today and what they're managing to do. And really, we, it's quite clear, public-private partnerships Everyone has a role to play in bringing this all together. So thank you very much for being with us here today. If you put your hands together for our panelists, thank you. And you have earned the... It was a little bit of an unenergized clap, but I'll still allow you to earn the right to a coffee break um, from that perspective. I believe coffee's out the back there. Please m meet people and mingle. The worst thing you can do is go out there and spend your life on your phone. It is a chance to meet some new people. To our speakers, thank you very much. I hope you get to have conversations with everybody. And they will give an announcement when they're bringing everyone back. I was told not to tell you how long the coffee break was. Okay, so take your 10 minutes or so. Fantastic, thank you. Hello everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed uh, the coffee, the Emirati hospitality. Fantastic date cake. If I haven't eaten it all, you must try. It's really delicious. Welcome back. Um, plenty of networking still to come this afternoon over lunch and another coffee break. But in the meantime, we have a fantastic lineup of more panel discussions and more speaker presentations. We also have now a fireside chat for which I will be your moderator. The topic is the UAE's commitment to food security, something that is well documented and something they're firmly aligned and committed to. We're going to delve into, my guest and I, the National Food Security Strategy, the UAE's system for sustainable agriculture, the new and exciting innovations and technologies helping us get to where we need to go. And we'll also, of course, uh, in light of our co-partner, New Zealand, we will look at the partnership with New Zealand uh, between 
between the UAE and the country, not least when it comes to sustainable water use for crops. I have an esteemed guest to help me drill down into the topic, so please let me invite from the audience, please welcome him on stage, His Excellency Issa Al-Hashmi, the head of the UAE Food and Water Security Office in the Emirates. Please welcome him. Thank you again for being with us today, Your Excellency. It's wonderful to see you. Um, we have a lot to talk about today, uh, very important issues when it comes to uh, the UAE and their food security strategy. Um, as we've been discussing this morning, the, the UAE has really demonstrated its leadership in this field. It wants to be considered and taken seriously on the global stage, as it should be. The question is, how do we balance domestic food production and security with the international efforts and endeavors of the Emirates. Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca, and uh, allow me to welcome our esteemed guests, and uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, it's well documented that the UAE has taken uh, many steps toward enhancing the food security strategy and the food security landscape of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, in the UAE, it's very critical to know that uh, we rely intensively on importing food. Mm -hmm. uh, today, food import uh, constitutes about 90% of what we consume. And uh, this is dominated by the fact that we are in a very harsh environment where it is very difficult to grow food sustainably. Uh, we have uh, a very arid environment. Uh, we have uh, low uh, water uh, and rainfall precipitation and uh, very limited arable land. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other note, we have a lot of environmental uh, constraints and we do not want to further degrade our soil. So uh, the UAE has taken a very uh, active, uh, I would say, step into putting the food security as one of the most priority items in the governmental agenda. Um, during the course of three years that we have, or a journey that we have uh, that we have witnessed over the last three years, um, we found out that uh, by adopting technology and innovation, we can balance the way that we manage our food security uh, uh, um, landscape here in the UAE. So uh, we had uh, a very uh, robust strategy formulated in 2017. Now this strategy addresses specifically the point that you have just said. Uh, it looks at foods that we consume a lot, foods that are very critical from the nutritional aspect, foods that we could grow sustainably here in the UAE, resilient to climate, and that has been demonstrated commercial viability as well as environmental soundness. So uh, from that uh, aspect, now we have a basket of 24 food items. Within that basket, we have three subgroups, a group of food items that we would like to grow here in the UAE, expand growing them here in the UAE, and produce them in a very sustainable uh, uh, fashion. So looking at all aspects of social, environmental, and economical. The second basket looks at foods that we will most probably have to reserve here in the UAE. And those are uh, components of our strategic stockpile in the UAE at specific um, throughout the year, we need to make sure that we have those commodities to combat uh, any price hikes, commodity price hikes, and, uh, and God, God forbid, uh, any, uh, I will say, lack of supply during the, the course of the year. Our third pillar is, is uh, targeting diversifying sources of import. So those are usually available in different markets, and uh, the UAE focuses on having multiple partners in this regard. Uh, so in a nutshell, this is how we are looking at uh, uh, balancing our food import needs and growing foods in the UAE. And we have a target for enhancing self-sufficiency, but it focuses on certain items. So we are not looking at growing things that has 
yet to uh, to to demonstrate uh, commercial viability and technology readiness on the platforms of of different scientific and uh, commercial uh, tools i would say so in this regard uh, as you can see uh, the, our uh, self sufficiency targets is moving steadily and uh, in a ambition yet realistic manner the ambitions need to be realistic, don't they? Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, because the problem is big. We need to get to where we need to go. Um, and you have set out many strategic milestones along the way. I will come on to that in a second. But in terms of the, the basket of foods, for those who might not be living or working in the Emirates, for those watching in New Zealand and Estonia and around the world, just give us some examples of those foods that are being developed. Uh, so in our national food basket, we uh, have, uh, as we stated, 24 items divided into, uh, I think, about four or five subgroups. We have a protein subgroup, which we are looking at dairy products, meat, uh, poultry, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, the ma main component is uh, fish mm -hmm. and seafoods. Uh, our second basket constitutes the uh, fruits and vegetables, so we are looking at uh, subgroup that looks after uh, things that are very uh, highly consumed in the UAE, such as bananas, oranges, and uh, uh, apples. Of course, also dates constitutes the majority of that, that basket, since we uh, produce a lot in here, and also it's a very nutritious uh, fruit. Uh, our third sub, uh, uh, I would say subgroup is uh, relevant to plant-based uh, oil uh, products, so we have uh, across uh, that specific groups, many uh, sources of uh, edible oil. Uh, the UAE uh, enjoys being a center and a hub for re-exporting many of those items mm. uh, by establishing a very robust and uh, comprehensive uh, milling industry here in the UAE. So uh, just giving you a landscape of what we are doing in here, uh, we export roughly uh, more than five times what we consume in edible oil and we are a, a hub to join uh, the, 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 the Far East with the Far, uh, far West. So we, we, we import many seeds from the US and from Canada and we mill those specific products here in the UAE and then uh, uh, process them and uh, export them to, to other markets such as India, China and so on, where it is used as edible oil or even uh, as a source of fuel. Um, our fourth subgroup uh, item also looks at grains, so we have many grains in that group, and this is where the majority of our stock piles components are are uh, are defined in that uh, that uh, group. Most, most certainly rice as well, which is being grown in Abu Dhabi and Sharjah, and you're developing your own soil. It's, it's fantastic on the innovative front. And speaking of innovation, we've touched a bit upon tech. Um, the UAE is very much carving its, its own niche as a tech and innovation hub. What area of this sector, agriculture, livelihoods, and even livestock, when we come on to that, is underserved. Where do you need more investment, more innovation, more innovative technology? So I would say that the UAE, uh, through, through this journey of, uh, of forming, I think in 1968, we had the first greenhouse established here in the UAE. Mm. At that stage, it was not even the UAE, it was in Abu Dhabi. And uh, that was in uh, that that was in I think um, uh, among the in, in one of the islands, remote islands. And I, I do I still remember this because we had some um, some uh, elaborations on this with uh, our colleagues from from the uh, University of Arizona, Arizona State University. Uh, at that stage, we were the technology demonstrated that it is possible to grow many food items that were seen extremely difficult to produce in the UAE. So starting in, from that stage till today, the UAE, I think, uh, is focusing clearly on controlled environment applications and the technologies that are associated with those, uh, the, that, that concept, mm -hmm. where we control humidity, we control temperature, we control uh, the production environment to enhance yield while maintaining uh, basically, uh, very um, uh, uh, well maintaining very efficient production in terms of water usage, uh, producing a lot of clean food using bio uh, 
security measures to to combat any insects or any I say uh, pests that could that could that could harm the the, uh, the production. And within the controlled environment applications, there are a variety of applications. So we are seeing a lot of indoor farms where they stack the production. And we see now things that are going up to 11 meters high. And with the, uh, with the UAE uh, and the Fly Emirates project, we are looking at building the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, vertical farm uh, globally to be located here nearby this uh, wonderful site and uh, i think it's it's it will be functioning very soon it will produce many uh, of the essential food items that we need such as tomatoes uh, leafy greens and so on uh, on another note we also have a lot of indoor, uh, indoor farms that we we are seeing where uh, people have uh, transformed it, just a traditional building or a traditional floor yeah. in a uh, in a uh, in, in a landscape in a skyscraper or even in a in just a home and yeah. they started to produce food in them uh, containers are being shifted now with a lot of containers being available in here uh, in, in Jebel Ali port we are seeing many people who are taking those uh, containers and transforming them into into farms uh, as for our uh, farmers, the farmers are also adopting those low-tech controlled environment applications, such as net houses. Now, a very fascinating information in here is that when we looked at high-tech and low-tech, we found out that the low-tech greenhouses, very simple net houses, just covering um, the, the production from excess heat mm -hmm. and humidity, it is very active in production, and it's very efficient when it comes to using natural uh, resources, specifically water. So we found out that the net house is even more efficient than the very high uh, tech greenhouses. And that was among the, the, the applied sciences that we have uh, conducted with our colleagues from uh, different universities and so on. So I would say that looking at technologies, controlled environment is a very big theme here in the UAE, and yeah. we want to expand on it. On another note, the UAE also looks at being an early investor and entrant into the, in, into the novel food production. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, the UAE is among the pioneering countries to have established a standard for novel foods. So we acknowledge those approaches, the way that we grow food using non-conventional ways, mm -hmm. soilless, without um, uh, food grown in, in labs, food grown use, uh, using alternative nutrients, all those aspects are being acknowledged here in the UAE as a growing and a farming approaches. And this basically enables the products that are grown in this environment to be acknowledged that as safe foods and foods that could be traded in our market. It's an interesting point that you make and non-conventional, be it production or, or non-conventional food, seems to be a direction that the UAE is uh, looking increasingly towards. Can we learn anything from New Zealand in that regard, or can we impart knowledge? Can we knowledge share? I think uh, opportunities of collaboration with our partners from the, from the New Zealand is, uh, is enormous. Uh, yeah, New Zealand is already a very active partner with the UAE when it comes to food supplies mm -hmm. and uh, the supply chain is well connected, yeah. even though it's very far away, but we see many products that are coming from the New Zealand of high quality and of even, uh, I, I would say, uh, very competitive products that are flying to, to the UAE. So on our journey with, uh, with New Zealand, I think we are looking into how to attract entrepreneurs, innovators, and even uh, uh, technology, uh, actic, uh, agricultural technology companies to address the challenges of food security here in the UAE. We are in collaboration with many institutes such as the football and many universities. And uh, in the UAE, we are planning to have the Food Tech Challenge announced uh, hopefully in the upcoming few days. Explain what that means, forgive me for interrupting, but for those unfamiliar, what is the Food Tech Challenge? So the Food, Check, the food Tech Challenge is a global initiative so that the UAE, a global challenge that the UAE, uh, that the UAE launches in order to attract uh, solutions 
to enable technology-based solutions to grow food in very arid, uh, in an arid and uh, marginal environments. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a total uh, price uh, award of $1 million. It's given to four winners. Yeah. And uh, we plan to have those, product, uh, those winners set base here in the UAE. Uh, we are in a very in, in uh, very close coordinations with leading uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship management uh, firms and uh, innovation uh, incubators mm -hmm. across the globe in order to disseminate this idea and attract the uh, early startups uh, uh, entrepreneurs to apply to this specific challenge uh, and move their ideas from basically ideation phase to uh, uh, to basically commercial viability. This is good. It could prove very fruitful for the winner. Um, what a cash prize. Um, let's talk about distribution. It keeps coming up in our conversations. It's not just about producing the food because we know we have enough to feed the whole world. It's about distribution. This seems to be floating to the top as an issue, but that raises questions about net um, carbon emissions. Um, the UAE wants to be net zero by 2050, but are there any strategic milestones along the way to keep you on track, to let you know that you're going in the right direction? Because you want to export the food that you're producing as well as, you know, have it domestically. So there's a challenge there. Yes. Uh, actually, this is right on spot because the, U the, the UAE, since announcing the strategic 2050 net zero strategy, wants to take a, 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 a tangible step toward uh, transforming this from an ambition and, the, and a plan to uh, an actual achievement that we foresee in the upcoming uh, future. Uh, recently, we have uh, kicked launched the uh, Net Zero uh, national team. Uh, this is a team that comprises uh, of many uh, federal and uh, local entities and is supported by a, an advisory group from the private sector. Uh, we are looking at developing uh, a strategy that uh, foresees a, uh, four specific uh, uh, main milestones across the journey to reaching net zero. So we want to have, uh, uh, I would say, a phased approach into having uh, targets of emission reduction uh, and also uh, in enabling the natural-based solutions to sequestrate and carbon uh, capture and store this uh, uh, GHG emissions in, in, different, uh, in different environments. Uh, with that being said, we are looking at a milestone at 2035 and 2040, 2045 and 50. And uh, I think this would be a very uh, remarkable achievement where uh, we can even uh, uh, recommend that such approach is also being developed by our partners. Uh, of course, all those things are being formulated here this year, the UAE uh, plans to be very uh, agile and fast in actioning those, uh, this specific strategy and to use this as a contribution toward COP28, which the UAE will be hosting next year. And uh, this is part of our climate ambition. Uh, hopefully, we can also create a global coalition around this and uh, invite many, many countries to join this, uh, this very a robust initiative. There you have it, an open invitation to join the UAE in its yeah. endeavors. You mentioned COP, of course, we will be the proud hosts. Should we meet again there, what do you hope will have been achieved by then? Or will the conversation have moved on to a different challenge? Um, of course, I think the UAE and the global community will be very eager to find out the stock taking results on that year. And I hope that we will be seeing very positive news at that stage. Um, it, it requires that we set up uh, a very comprehensive and I would say ambitious uh, efforts in order to make sure that we retain the global target at 1.5 Celsius degree. And this means that everybody, this, this is basically the responsibility of everybody to pitch in this, to also look into how they could, on their, uh, even, even consumers and uh, societies, into how they reduce their carbon footprint 
being more efficient in using natural resources, that's mm -hmm. very critical. Energy conservation, that's, I think, among the key initiatives in order to enable us to move into this, uh, uh, to achieve this target. And basically understanding that we are going through a journey of energy transition. This will definitely happen, but we need to basically push as hard as possible in this journey. Yes, the two are interconnected, and food transformation and energy transition. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us here today. Please join me in thanking His Excellency for being here. Thank you. And just before we leave the stage, uh, allow me to tell you that we have a fascinating panel discussion coming up next, uh, moderated by Hazel Jackson again. The topic is food safety systems and how countries can best reduce their risk and their waste. Stay tuned, it's worth watching. Thank you very much, Thank Issa. You. Thank you. so much today and um, just before we bring our panel up and to go to a slight change we're going to have a short video now with the Honourable Dr Aisha Varal, Minister of Food Safety for the New Zealand Government and who's going to kick off this really important subject of made with care a modern food safety system. Uh, we'll hear from Dr Aisha and then I'll, we'll talk to a panel all virtual this time. Tēnā koutou katoa. I would like to thank the Chair for the opportunity to address this forum on the topics of food safety and food security. Today, I want to talk about New Zealand's food safety system and why food safety is critical to meeting future demand. We are living in an increasingly complex world. COVID-19 is causing uncertainty and disrupting supply chains. Climate change is affecting the way we produce food and consumers have higher expectations that the food they eat is sustainably and ethically produced. Countries with robust food safety systems will be better placed to meet these new challenges. In doing so, they'll be able to better ensure food security at home and trade opportunities abroad. New technologies are causing us to rethink what is possible in areas like alternatives to animal proteins, Regulators must be agile in recognising their risks and opportunities to ensure new products are safe for consumers. We are a small island nation at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean with a favourable environment with favourable environmental conditions for producing high quality food. With a population of 5 million people, we produce enough food for 40 million people and export to 140 countries. We've built a reputation for doing so for well over 100 years, founded on the safety and quality of our food. Of course, none of that has happened by accident. New Zealand has developed a world-class regulatory system that is based on best available science and aligned with international standards organisations, such as Codex and Food Standards Australia New Zealand. For more than 20 years, we've worked closely alongside our Australian neighbours to align food safety requirements. This has resulted in consistent structures and systems which produce, promote best practice in food safety. Our food exports meet all the global standards for food safety, and we could not achieve this without a robust, integrated, practical food safety system. New Zealand's food safety regulatory system operates in a context of manaakitanga, which means supporting and caring for each other. We care for the land, the people, is genuine and trust builds lasting partnerships. New Zealanders are also known for our ingenuity and our ability to find practical solutions that flow through to our food safety systems. Consumer safety will always be at the heart of what we do. To achieve this, we have to have a flexible risk and outcome based system. Our system recognises that we can't take a one size fits all approach <clears throat> to food safety. 
businesses identify and manage risks through our structured risk management framework, which is consistent with international best practice. These are checked and verified to ensure compliance. Businesses producing higher risks foods are subject to more rules and checked more often than businesses producing low risk foods. People that demonstrate good knowledge and management of food safety risks when being checked are checked less frequently than those that don't. Focusing on outcomes that manage risks ensures that the system and the businesses within it have the flexibility to adapt to challenges of the day. Food safety is managed in the context of other important food system considerations, such as minimising food waste, ethical sorting, sourcing and animal welfare. Food safety is everyone's responsibility and collaboration is key. A successful integrated system involves collaboration from government and private sector. Collaboration with international agencies responsible for food safety and ensuring fair practices in food trade, such as Codex, is a high priority for us. This is increasingly important as globalisation of the food supply continues, with ever-evolving new food sources and production systems and significant investment and innovation globally. While food-related issues around the world may vary, sharing data and information on methodologies, best practices and analysis of emerging scientific issues can promote consistent approaches to assessing and managing those issues and to harmonising food standards internationally. New Zealand values the relationships we have built with our international partners and we want to continue to build and nurture them. There are many global challenges, including food security concerns brought on by the pandemic. We think the best approach is to work together to solve the problems that are creating and exacerbating these concerns, as well as supporting our international trade partners across the Middle East to achieve their food safety aspirations. We do this by providing consistently safe and suitable food, backed up by our world-class regulatory regime and legislation. These tools enable New Zealand to be a credible and trusted partner in food safety because our systems are transparent, forward-looking, streamlined and fit for purpose. New Zealand welcomes opportunities to work together to respond to these challenges that I have spoken about today. I am reminded of a whakatoki or Māori proverb that inspires us all to confront the challenges we are facing now and in the future. E tu ki te ke o te waka, ki pai ki ko, koe e na naru o te wā. Stand at the stern of the canoe and feel the spray of the future biting at your face. Kia ora rāwu atua, noho ora mai. continue this important conversation on modern food safety, I want us to explore now with three experts how countries can organise their effective and more robust systems to reduce risk and waste, look at policy, regulation and operational systems and ensure domestic and international consumers eat safe food. So I'm very delighted to welcome virtually this time um, three uh, experts from around the world. Um, Vincent Arbuckle is the di Deputy Director General of New Zealand Food Safety Ministry and Primary Industries. Dr. Sue Bidrose is the CEO of Ag Research in New Zealand. And Katia Onal is the Policy Lead for IFC Food Safety Advisory coming to us from Ukraine. Are you all with me? Fantastic. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, we're here. And we really, really appreciate the time it is in New Zealand, Vincent and Dr. Sue. Um, so nearly time for bed. Thank you very much for being with us late. And Katia, thank you for coming to us right now from Ukraine. Our thoughts are with you right now. Let's start by you giving us a little bit of uh, an introduction. Why would you be experts on today's panel around food safety? And Vincent, do you want to kick us off? Um, Atamari, I call Vince Toko Ingawa. Um, what I just said was um, good morning, uh, and my name is Vincent Arbuckle. Um, delighted to be here today. Um, I lead uh, the New Zealand Food Safety, uh, Food Safety New Zealand, 
which is responsible for food safety systems for uh, all food produced in New Zealand for export and domestic consumption uh, and in all imported foods into New Zealand. Um, as our minister said, we're, uh, we're in the corner of the world, a long way away from uh, most of our markets. Um, so uh, having a robust health, uh, food safety system as a cornerstone uh, for what is essentially an exporting country. Fantastic. Thanks, Vincent. Dr. Sue, I'm loving the necklace as well, sharing a little bit more of New Zealand in the picture there. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, Sue Bidrose tōku ingoa. So uh, I just said hello everybody, uh, I'm Sue Bidrose. Um, I'm the Chief Executive of Ag Research. So the New Zealand Government has seven Crown Research Institutions, in addition to our universities and so on. We specifically focus, all the, the, the scientists and the technicians and the staff that work at Ag Research specifically focus on science for impact. So um, we have about six or seven hundred staff who are working to to uh, develop our thinking and our understanding for the most impactful science that we can lead, that we can come up with, uh, that makes improvements in, in the case of ag research in the agricultural sector. So uh, I have a whole group of people working specifically in the area of food safety, um, of food safety, food provenance, uh, a raft of um, other issues. Um, on that side of the farm gate. And then I have another group, a larger group actually, working on the on-farm area of science around things like water quality and methane reduction and, uh, and animal welfare and so on. So uh, I'm here today on behalf of all of them. I've been the, the chief executive here for 18 months. Um, prior to that though, I began my working career at what was the forerunner of Ag Research as a laboratory technician, working in metabolic diseases of dairy cattle. So. My whole life I've kind of been interested in the role that science can play to help the world address some of the pressing challenges that we're facing. Fantastic, addressing some of the biggest challenges in the world. Um, Katia, um, you have a slightly different role than both Dr. Sue and Vincent. Share a little bit more about your background and why you're with us today, please. Uh, well, I'm a policy lead in AFC Global Food Safety Platform, where we support the private and public sector on improving food safety worldwide by providing advisory and financial support for the benefits of consumers, food industry and national economies. I'm with this organization since 2006 and what I can say that only in cases where all players are collaborating, collaborating intense, intensively and constantly, then success is possible. And also to compare food safety with sport, I would say that food safety is a team game where each team player has its own critical role. And today I'm connecting from Ukraine, uh, from Kyiv, and I appreciate this opportunity to share a vision of IFC on what is required for successful transformation of national food safety system, regardless where the, in which part of the globe the country is. And also just a minor uh, comment to mention, uh, I really want to support um, the minister who said that a New Zealand food safety system it's really robust, and this is and the experience of New Zealand is worth to be learned, to be known, and replicated where it is possible. And I'll share more about that later. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I love that. It's a team game. Um, we can actually only do this if we're working together. Let's actually just stop, start. And Vincent, I'm going to come to you with this question. Um, Global challenges around nutritional quality, quantity, they've often been the focus, but a well-functioning food system is an essential part for the production and sale of food. Um, what role does food safety play in achieving a, a country's food security goals? That's, um, that's a terrific question to start with. Um, <laughs> I, I guess... It, I guess we're now dealing with a, such a networked global um, food supply and consumption. Uh, none of us live in isolation anymore. And um, we, uh, perhaps the COVID pandemic has really highlighted just how connected the world is and dependent on each other. Um, a food safety system is uh, essential really to smooth and ensure the sort of um, international supply of food, one that is um, uh, science-based, risk-based, and one that's networked internationally across um, the best possible 
um, international standards. So uh, countries operating together in harmony um, across common standards, uh, that, that assists and supports uh, free trade uh, and supports overall um, a sustainable supply of food across the world. It's a big challenge, and, and I understand, Katia, that actually there's sophisticated incidents of food fraud um, and the rise of e-commerce and some of the external factors that are putting pressure on how we produce and export our food. How can we organize and regulate food systems to ensure that consumers can perhaps, A, trust that their food is safe, and B, continue to make informed choices? Uh, well, first of all, um, again, it's about their responsibility. And again, food safety is a common responsibility. That's also uh, based on our experience in countries where food safety reforms are in the agenda now. Um, we see cases that, for instance, food business thinks that um, food safety is something that the government is responsible for. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, and uh, even if uh, there are uh, provisions in legislation that no food safety is a responsibility of food business. There is no implementation tools and procedures, you know, to um, implement these new requirements. And this is what I would like to focus now is uh, again to stress that the common, common issue that we noticed in countries where food safety is under development is lack of knowledge both about food safety in general and also on how to implement best practices considering country context. And um, today I would like to focus on the importance of knowledge sharing and also on the importance of learning from the best when reforming national food safety system and when identifying right incentives for business to improve food safety in the country and when identifying incentives for consumers to learn more about the food they buy and also on how to push food business uh, to produce safer food. Um, also, mm -hmm. go ahead, over to um, you. I, I think we're hearing, you know, through all of the panels this morning, we're hearing the answers are out there in the world. Countries like New Zealand have solved a lot of these things or are ahead of the curve. So, Katia, what do you think stops that knowledge sharing? Is it access to getting the knowledge? Are people keeping the knowledge to themselves? So we just, what's stopping that actually already happening? Uh, well, um, the first thing is that when adopting any new requirements on national level, um, government should understand that adoption of even best world practices doesn't mean that these practices are implemented. So. There should be um, more, um, more focus from the governmental side and from international organizations uh, on implementation of uh, different uh, practices or approaches to food safety. It's, they need to explain how to do this. They need uh, to ensure that there is uh, enough infrastructure and uh, the country context is considered. And in this regard, I want um, to make a link to a recently developed uh, e-learning course that is based on food safety, on New Zealand food safety system, and why we decided to do that, and why it is worse for all those who are somehow involved in transformation of national food safety system to look at this um, course. Uh, as I said, uh, in our work, we believe that learning from the best is a must mm -hmm. when food safety reform is on the agenda. Yes, there is no need to invent a bicycle. And also, once I read one experience, uh, one, one expression that experience is similar to mind detector that helps to take the safe path. And I can't agree but more with that. So knowing experience of others, of uh, best countries, really could help countries a lot. However, despite the demand uh, uh, in finding, con finding consolidated data full of uh, examples, detailed examples, updated infor information presented in a clear and simple way is still a challenge. Right. And that actually, yeah, that is why we decided to develop this e-learning course. And then we thought, okay, this, uh, since there is no resources on uh, one country, on different elements um, of food safety system in one country, this should be developed, but which country to uh, choose? 
And at that time, we had a discussion with New Zealand G2G, and from them we learned that approximately 80% of the food crops grown in New Zealand are exported, which is made wow. possible by past, yeah, yeah, 80% in a small country <laughs> exported. So it's it made possible by a robust and well-graded food safety system. And it became clear for us that this story should be shared with public sector, with all stakeholders who are working on uh, reforms of national food safety systems. And uh, this course was developed. It is uh, available on our website. It is for free, available in English. So all those who are interested and would like to learn more about New Zealand food safety system, they are welcome to take the course. And also, an important thing, that this document is like an encyclopedia. We developed that in such a way because in our practice, we face challenges to find the specific data, for instance, on public partner, uh, public private partnerships in um, improving food safety, on uh, um, incentives uh, that um, for the improvement of national legislation on incentives of business to be involved in public management of food safety. And this, all, this information is really, um, this is worse to know, worse to learn. So just wow. take it, read it. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I really encourage everybody. <laughs> I think uh, that's a good bit right now uh, from that perspective. In fact, Katia, are you sure you're not from New Zealand as well? Um, this is the other question from our panelists. In fact, at the, the coffee break, somebody came and said, this is why I came. I want to hear from a speaker, then I want to meet the speaker or connect with the speaker and tap into their knowledge. So let me move Dr. Sue to you right now. Um, how are emerging technologies improving New Zealand's ability to manage its food safety system? Give us some insights as to, to what you're doing now and what's maybe coming in the near future around new technology. Thanks for the invitation. And, and I really do wish I was with you. It's very hard to be uh, seeing these <laughs> screenshots of you all and not be able to come and chat uh, and, and uh, learn from what other countries are doing. And here I am. Uh, stuck here in New Zealand, but anyway, um, nice to be here with you virtually. I thought I'd talk to you about three areas uh, where science is really making some pretty fast advances in New Zealand, um, and in, in science more generally in the food safety uh, field. The first is a whole genome sequencing. Then I'll talk a bit about digital imaging technology, and then I thought I'd talk about non-chemical forms of disinfection. In terms of precision food safety, so you all have seen with COVID, where we've been using the international science community using whole genome sequencing to work out which COVID variant is, is infecting and to be able to trace back sources of infection in communities. Uh, similarly, whole genome sequencing is revol revolutionising food safety and source tracking of, um, of, of food safety issues. Overseas regulators are using whole genome sequencing of foodborne pathogens that have been identified during product testing and also during outbreaks. And so they can uh, trace the source and the spread of illness and identify them. It's been challenging for our, uh, for our importers to come to terms with because we've had sequences from their own countries deposited into scientific databases. But that's made it very easy for us to identify potential sources of outbreaks even back to the home country. New Zealand, um, in New Zealand, different food industries are at really different places with using um, with using whole genome sequencing, and the dairy industry is undeniably leading the charge. Uh, um, the New Zealand, in New Zealand, we set up the New Zealand Food Science Safety and Research Centre, um, <laughs> and Ag Research is part of that. Gail Brightwell works uh, with, with them, and uh, we're working with a number of dairy companies to whole genome sequence different foodborne pathogens that they've identified in their food processing plants like Listeria, for example. They create 3D models of the processing plant, kind of like the kind you see architects for when, you, when you're redesigning your house. And they add metadata like cleaning and various other protocols like that, staffing, ventilation data. And from that, they can track the source, the length of spread of contamination around a food processing plant. And we've developed, or they've developed, um, user-friendly interfaces of this to use as training tools for staff so that they can understand the risks associated with pathogens being spread around the plant. And more recently, um, the Centre in New Zealand working with industry has been looking at using small portable genome sequencing devices that can be used by staff 
not having to bring their samples to our laboratory, but they can use it there in the processing plant. Company can perform its own sequencing and analysis. In fact, there's one device called Minion, uh, and that's in use in meat plants in Ireland, for example. Wow. So, uh, other um, the US... sorry, carry on, Dr. Oh, Sue. Other innovations, so I was going to talk about digital imaging technology like near infrared and hyperspectral imaging. So in combination with machine learning and artificial intelligence, that's much more sensitive than conventional digital imaging. And, and they can add in um, chemical and physical information about a food product. We've been using hyperspectral imaging to identify pathogens and, and spoilage in, or, in uh, spoilage organisms and food products in real time and without actually having to destroy the product. So you can see these technologies will let users separate, for example, dead from live bacteria or toxigenic bacteria from their more harmless relatives. I mean, in future processing plants, we'll be able to use these sort of devices to monitor processes and identify subtle changes in their foodstuffs that they can uh, and analyze what that might mean in terms of food quality or a safety risk. I mean, and in the long run, you could even imagine a day when users might or consumers might use these sort of implements themselves. And finally, I'm um, talking about light disinfection, so non-chemical forms of disinfecting. Many countries facing challenges of climate change and scarcity of resources like clean water, and consumers are increasingly pushing for products that are really natural with no additional chemicals like chlorine or chlorate. And to this end, there's been a call for sanitising technologies that don't use chemicals. And we've been using, or we've said uh, in the COVID pandemic, we've been looking at using UVC light technology technologies as light disinfection. So using safer wavelengths such as blue and far UVC. We've been exploring use of cold plasma, so that's the gas that's produced when lightning hits water and microwaves, as forms of food disinfection that don't involve chemi adding chemicals to our food. But I think one of the key messages from my scientists, and it really gels with what you said earlier, Katja, is that collaboration is the key here. So government, industry, science in New Zealand, the indigenous population, who, who are big landowners and big industry owners working together um, to, to address these issues together. Uh, and the key isn't so much the tech, but it's being willing to work together and share data to improve safety. Okay. Have I lost everybody or just Sue? Okay, you came to, 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 to uh, brilliant technology. Sorry, I just lost you just towards the end, only in the final part of your sentence. You're fine, don't worry, you're good, we can see you now. Um, so, huge strides in science and technology in food. We've already talked a little bit about the disparity around the world of everybody having access to the same kind of technology or innovations. Just talk to me a little bit, um, Vincent, from a point of view of how does New Zealand help the rest of the world with some of these technologies? And if it's a team game and if it's all about collaboration, then how do we spread that information? What are you planning to do around there or how can you assist? Thank you. Um, a team game it certainly is. And food safety should never be something we compete against each other on. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a global resource. Um, and the technology should be should be shared. Um, we have to think about you know, global responsibility. We have to feed the world, um, and sharing the best science and the best systems is at the core of being you know responsible global citizens. So I think you find that New Zealand is a cornerstone of our system and processes that we believe strongly in sharing uh, our regulations, our systems. Our scientists um, and our science institutes put a lot of care into being um, open uh, to publishing their research, to making it available globally, um, as we rely on others too. So we, we, we share what we know um, and we rely on, uh, on others. Um, New Zealand's a country where, as I think um, Katarina said, um, we, we export actually close to 90% of the food that we produce. Uh, so, you know, we, we've had to learn, and when, especially when you're, you're at, the, you know, the, at the corner of the world and your markets are, you know, are a long way away, you need to find technological solutions to get that food from your country to another country Thanks. safely and well uh, and of a maximum quality. So 
New Zealand's had a long history of uh, science and innovation. Um, so I think the cornerstone thinking really is about how can you share what you know um, and by sharing what you know, others become more open than what they know. Um, mm -hmm. And the New Zealand government um, has a sort of, uh, what I call a G2G um, as part of our trade um, function. So we are sort of openly sharing information between governments um, and encouraging that free flow of knowledge and technology, um, making sure that our, our regulatory systems are as open as possible and, and making sure that we, we are on the global, global um, platform and integrated into things like codex and world standards, the more harmonised we can be, uh, the more open that we end up. Uh, Minister Beryl at the beginning mentioned that New Zealand um, has had 20 years worth of history working with Australia on common food standards. So we don't try and operate our standards independently, although they're two so sovereign nations. Um, we have a long history of sharing and collaboration on food standards. So it's in the sort of DNA of the of the country, um, you know, a small, very small country, tucked away in the corner of the world. <laughs> Doing a lot um, of good. <laughs> you, 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 can't, uh, you can't operate other than in partnership with the rest of the world. Um, we're too small uh, to go it alone. Um, and it pays back, you know, what, what we share, we get back uh, tenfold. Fantastic. Katia, I know you spend a lot of time working around the, the world. I know that you've already done your, your promotion for New Zealand's online program that you've done. What else are you seeing around the world? What other pockets of, you know, uh, great food safety capabilities or things that you're seeing in your global view um, that you think you could share back best practices now with, uh, with our audience? <clears throat> well, I want to share a few figures. Mm -hmm. The Safe Food Imperative, it's a World Bank report, estimates that food safety issues cause developing countries uh, in a staggering 110 billion in lost productivity and medical treatment. And the good news is that most of food safety issues are preventable, especially if they address systematically and in collaboration. So based on our surveys, and this information is important for business, our clients, AFC clients, attributed $709 million in increased sales and $607 million in investment to better food safety practices. So that's why, again, we are focusing on development of food safety tools and uh, another thing that proved to be very efficient around the globe in every country where we are present is AFC Food Safety Handbook. Uh, which could be used by any food business, regardless its type, its size, its um, geographical location, just the first day when it is upload, uploaded and uh, business has access to that. So this is also available on our website, sorry for this promotion, but all this for free. And this is actually for improving food safety all over the world. So the website is www.ifc.org slash food safety. <laughs> and uh, another thing that uh, also I'd like to share is about uh, how important collaboration is. This, is, this uh, example is from Ukraine. Um, in order to export food of, origin, uh, food of animal origin to the EU, any third country should be authorized to do that. And in order to be authorized, it means that third country should have national food safety system that is in line with um, European Union requirements. And even if food business has the best, the most advanced food safety management system in the world, but the country is not authorized, then this food business can't export to the EU. And the EU market means um, maybe a window could be compared a window to the world. So what we did, we um, created a program that was later replicated in Moldova and in Georgia, and we are now replicating in other countries where uh, we helped um, public agencies, we help government to develop uh, the required advanced food safety legislation. We also provided support to food business and raised awareness among uh, consumers. And then we um, facilitated this um, triple um, discussions and that helped 
to open the EU market for Ukraine, and now Ukraine is the fifth exporter of poultry in the world. Wow. So this is, I think, a, yes, impressive story. And uh, again, speaking about New Zealand, uh, <laughs> come on even in. At that time, no, no, even at <laughs> that time when you uh, the approaches uh, that are followed in New Zealand in relation to public partner uh, partnership. Uh, uh, in relation to uh, business and uh, public dialogue when developing national legislation, of course, it's it, uh, the whole process maybe would be smoother and faster. So this is all from my side now. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. And I love that you're putting all those resources out there. That is the purpose of Expo, connecting minds, providing insight, allowing people to see people they would never normally have a conversation with in these kind of business forums. I'm going to go to our last one minute from each of you. If you are going to give a piece of advice, a takeaway, something that perhaps would be useful for this team, one takeaway or piece of advice um, to consider for food safety, food security, what would it be? And I'm going to go to Vincent first and leave the ladies for the, for the end. So, Vincent, what's your one takeaway for everybody that you want them to recall from today? Um, probably the one thing I would leave uh, the conference with is don't forget the consumer. Um, don't forget that actually food safety uh, happens at home. So, um, you know, the, the, the consumer's got a key role within food safety and, and the practices at home, hygiene and cooking practices, actually at the end of the day, uh, they, they have the biggest impact as well as industry and government. So I would leave this idea that part of what a good food safety system is about is about public education uh, and public promotion of food safety because what happens at home really matters. Fantastic. Uh, Katia, what would be your one takeaway? Well, first, I think that it is important to say that food safety is connecting people. Look at the whole, well, you know, this event, the brightest example of that. And knowledge sharing, learning from the best, collaboration in implementation of new knowledge are critical when improving food safety in any country. So just work together, work in close collaboration, and I think then, then we succeed. Thank you. Fantastic. Dr. Sue, final word from yourself. Look, uh, as a country that feeds over 40 million people and exports to 120 countries, we certainly know how critical it is to export food that's safe. I guess my take home message would be food safety is far more than just preventing spoilage or contamination. It's about the health of farmers, including their mental health. It's about the well-being of their livestock. It's about animal welfare and animal happiness. It's about working with the knowledge of New Zealand's indigenous Māori. And it's about dealing with environmental challenges like climate change. So we take this wide view where we're looking at all of those risks, those early warning systems to improve our food safety. And as I said before, collaboration is the key, sharing information and data, all partners working to deal with those risks before you have a food safety issue and to develop the healthiest, most forward-looking food ecosystem. And that is about reassuring our consumers worldwide. Fantastic. Thank you for your expertise, your time, for the lateness of the hour in New Zealand and still coming to join us today, Katia, with everything that's going on around you. Really appreciate your insights. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will be hitting your website, Katia, um, to get access to those free resources. Um, thank you so much for joining us and for keeping the world safe and for giving us safe food and helping make sure that we can feed the world safely. Thank you very much. Good night and good day. Round of applause. Fantastic. Um, and thank you, New Zealand, for all of that uh, learning from that perspective. Uh, now I'm actually going to stay with the same theme and introduce Dr. Susie Newman, Head International Development and Aid, Plant and Food Research from New Zealand, to come in and start with a TED Talk and then to run our next panel. So nice warm round of applause, a little bit more energy from the back of the room. The front are doing really well, but the back needs to wait up. Thank you. Dr. Susie.
today's food systems will not be able to support our world's future needs. By 2050, we need to feed more than 10 billion people, requiring us to produce 70% more food. One-tenth of the planet, some 811 million people, are currently undernourished. Climate events, escalating conflicts, and the COVID-19 pandemic have resulted in food insecurity trending in the wrong direction. Indeed, our food systems face many headwinds. Climate change. Producing food and distributing food uses 70% of globally fresh water, a third generates a third of greenhouse gas emissions, and is responsible for 80% of biodiversity loss. Food waste. In 2019, 931 million tonnes of food was wasted. If we think about that as part of the whole, in terms of how much food was produced, that equates to 17% um, of global food production. That is food that farmers invested scarce resources into to produce, but was actually wasted. Aotearoa, oh, sorry, renewable energy demands, escalating conflicts, and climate change are indeed making greater challenges for our food systems into the future. Aotearoa, New Zealand, is a small island state. Uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, is a small island state at the far ends of the earth. We too are facing growing challenges in order to be able to sustainably produce and get our agricultural products to um, market. Our, our $6 billion horticultural industry is highly productive, utilizes resources really efficiently, and produces products that are in high demand. Zespri Sun Gold, Jazz, Envy, um, Rocket are all internationally renowned brands and in high demand. But the bar has been raised and we too need to look at more sustainable practices to produce and to get our products to the medium and long haul markets in which we supply them to. So Plant and Food Research is a government owned science company, and these are some of the challenges that we are working on as well as others. And I'd just like to have a video now, thanks. Our smart green future starts here. We believe science can create a better future. By finding smarter, greener options today, we're helping secure the world we want to live in tomorrow. With our partners, we use world-leading science to improve the way they fish, grow, harvest and share food. Every day, we have 1,000 people working across Aotearoa New Zealand and the world to help deliver healthy foods from the world's most sustainable systems. Working together, we can create new fruits, better grains, exciting foods and great nutrition in a world with fewer chemicals, greater biodiversity, reduced waste and a resilient food supply. We answer complex biological questions, design innovative products and technologies, and look over the horizon for new ways to grow a smart, green future. A smart green future together extends beyond New Zealand to the world. Plant and food research scientists are engaged in agricultural development projects 
across the globe, bringing New Zealand expertise and know-how, working collaboratively in partnerships so that together we can create um, solutions that are more sustainable and give lasting outcomes to people and planet. So today, I would like to share one example of a project, an agricultural development project in Vietnam. And this is the Vietnam Dragon Fruit Project. The program is supported by the New Zealand Aid Program. And Plant and Food partnered with two research institutes, the Southern Horticultural Research Institute, or SOFRE, and the Sub-Institute of Agricultural Engineering and Post-Harvest Technology, SEAP. So let me just paint a picture for you about what it is like in Vietnam. So if we think about dragon fruit, it is the iconic fruit of Vietnam. So it is much like to us kiwi as the kiwi fruit is. So it is really one of those flagship commodities. It, the industry itself is US $1 billion, and it relies on, and it is a strong export focus. But underpinning all of this is the smallholder producers who are producing this dragon's fruit on small parcels of land of 0.5 hectares. Today, the dragon fruit industry is facing a number of headwinds. They are highly reliant on the Chinese market, and so with border closures through COVID-19, that has resulted in oversupply in the domestic market and a real impetus to look for new international markets. So innovation will be key to successfully navigating these and other headwinds. Plant and food research is renowned for creating and commercialising plant varieties. Together with SOFRI, our Southern Horticultural um, Research Institute in Vietnam, we are looking to um, develop proprietary dragon fruit varieties. The key kind of breeding criteria we're looking at are that they have distinct and unique flavour, that they're canker resistant, that they have a different, different flesh and skin colours, and that they're able to store longer so that we can get them into more distant markets. Now, Plant and Food Research, together with our Vietnamese partner, is commercialising the first three varieties from this programme. In the future, we hope that our partner, Sofri, will be able to generate royalty income from these varieties, and that those varieties will also have a premium in the market. High productivity is also key to success. Those of you that are familiar with dragon fruit will know that in Vietnam it is grown as a mop top, so, for those of you unfamiliar, imagine an upended balloon, uh, broom. So, to increase productivity and to reduce disease incidents, we designed and piloted a new production system in a, the form of a tea bar. Just introducing this production system resulted in a doubling of yields. Bacteria, sorry, canker in dragon fruit has been a really major problem. And right at the start of the project, the disease started to emerge in Vietnam. And so, um, together with our Vietnamese partners, we quickly pivoted in order to address that. Sorry, apologies. We pivoted in order to address that. And so, our New Zealand and Vietnamese scientists worked on looking at how to um, control the disease and then to develop effective methods for that. Once we had those effective methods in the bag, then we were able to then 
roll that out um, into the field and um, we're able to roll that out into the field and so that we were able to take that to other districts um, and it was just a really great success, a real example of a successful story. The dragon fruit industry is highly reliant, as I said earlier, on the Chinese market. And, um, and so this has always been kind of a bit of a weight on our Vietnamese partners. And so the project has, already, has always looked at how do we then um, open up new market opportunities. But there were two things that stood in the way for that. The first one was that we really needed to get, be able to get the product into those markets. And so needed a better understanding of the post-harvest and how to, the correct temperature and to ship and store it at. We also needed to meet that market's phytosanitary, phytosanitary requirements. And so as part of that, um, we developed a washing machine. Um, now, you would have seen in, in some of the earlier photographs the very delicate bracts that dragon fruit have. And as part of that, it's actually quite hard to design a system that effectively cleans dragon fruit. Um, but thankfully, our engineers were up to the task, and so we were successful in being able to do that. Capacity building has really been um, central to this program. And as our New Zealand and Vietnamese um, scientists have worked alongside together, they've really developed strong relationships. The project is finished now, but those relationships still endure. And of course, we are still working together to develop our dragon fruit varieties together. Throughout this initiative, farmers are really at the centre, and it's been great to see new dragon fruit farmers embracing new technologies and practices, and then extending those to their communities. Likewise, it's been great to see existing farmers modifying the technologies and practices that we've introduced so that they are more um, suitable for their needs. It's always emotion is what I would like to say. Nothing is, is kind of standing still. So that's been a real um, standout for the program. So we started talking about the big picture and the challenges facing our food system. Innovation is central to meeting these challenges head on. Agricultural development programs, such as our dragon fruit project, provide a way for us to co-develop these innovations. And ultimately, it's really about genuine partnerships that really make the difference. So thank you. I would now like to introduce our next speaker. Um, She's a very uh, good friend of mine and a long collaborator, um, Ms. Quai Nguyen uh, from Vietnam. And so I'd like to welcome her onto the stage for a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Quai. So, Ms. Huai, welcome to the stage. It's great to have you here. And um, I was just wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susie Newman. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to, he uh, to be here to share my story. And um, uh, I'm CEO of, uh, I come from Vietnam, and I'm CEO of uh, Vietnam National Zeran Export Import, the stock company number one in Vietnam. And my company have a 40 years experience in international trading. And now we uh, uh, develop uh, 
agriculture project in the center of Vietnam for avocado and black pepper. Thank you, and I can assure you that she is an extremely busy woman, so we're very lucky to have her here today to um, share with us. I have had the, the um, privilege of being able to work with Ms. Huai and Sam Agritech for the last five years. Uh, we've been partnering together in a project in the central highlands of Vietnam in Dak Nong, looking at introducing um, Hass avocado and other varieties into the region. So, Ms. Swai, when development collaboration works, it's very satisfying and has a great impact. Can you describe an example of where international collaboration with Plan of Food Research and others really lived up to your hopes and dreams? Uh, doing in agriculture business a long time, so I see many, is many issues uh, in agriculture of Vietnam. Uh, for example, we uh, have a problem with seasonal price, and the farmer, they work very hard but can earn a little money. So I always think about how to have a solution to improve Vietnam agriculture and to improve the farmer livelihood. Uh, so uh, as you know that Vietnam, we have a number, number one uh, black pepper, number two uh, coffee exporter, and number two uh, rice exporter. So we should find another products. And avocado is a new opportunities for Vietnam. Avocado is a king of fruit, and uh, in 2017, at that time, I do the research. The revenue, global revenue of avocado export is a nearly 15 billion US dollar. So I think that is a very big uh, opportunities for Vietnam. And I do the research, and I heard story about the avocado in Kenya with plant and food research. It's very successful. Kenya become the number five avocado exporter in the world now. So I know that uh, with the large support from plant and food research. So it gave me passion to do avocado project in Vietnam. Uh, in the past, avocado is not popular in Vietnam. The farmer only use avocado as a wind block for coffee, for other plant. Uh, and we don't have a has avocado. Uh, meanwhile, the has avocado is 80% uh, uh, avocado export, uh, export in the world. So it's, um, we uh, approach with the New Zealand embassy and uh, we meet the plant and food research. And then we work like a team with the uh, Vietnam, <laughs> New, Zealand, New Zealand embassy in Vietnam Z2Z and Planet Food, and now we reach collaboration to develop Haas Avocado in Vietnam. And I'm very excited, and I dream that one day Vietnamese avocado, uh, maybe in the supermarket of many countries, like I see dragon fruit of Vietnam now, yeah, in supermarket in Dubai, in Europe, yeah, very good quality. It's great to see you so passionate about your business. Perhaps you could share with us a top tip, a major learning from your collaboration um, between Sam Agritech and Plant and Food Research that could be picked up and applied by others around the world. Uh, when we do the project the, from the beginning, it's very difficult for a uh, company, private company like my company, how to start, what we will start. So Planet Food with international experience, with many professional experts, help me, guide me what to do step by step and so on. And um, human research, human research is very important in the project. And Planet Food uh, do training for my team, so I think that it's helped me a lot to develop avocado, especially has avocado in Vietnam. So how can we ensure the benefits of horticultural collaboration reach everyone? 
how do we how do lives change substantially through our work and how can we ensure this happens uh, in uh, in Vietnam we don't have a variety has variety we we just only have uh, some local variety of um, avocado and um, it's very very difficult for a farmer they most of them as a, a smallholder farmer so I think that my company uh, correct, correct, uh, correct with the plant and food. We will have the way to do. We uh, join in the value chain of global avocado and can help the farmer from step by step to join the avocado international market. Yeah. So we know that development is not always easy. So what are the top couple of challenges that you face in transforming the horticultural performance of your region? And yeah. how did you overcome these? Yeah, of course, it's not easy. Many challenges, many challenges. So, for example, in Vietnam, uh, we don't have uh, many, uh, much infrastructure for fresh food. Yeah, especially for avoc avocado, it's very new in Vietnam. So, um, and the farmer, they rely on the traditional <coughs> farming, so it's, it's not easy to convince the farmer to follow the new technologies, the new way to do. Yeah, so, um, and the human resource too. Human resource is very important in develop a new project, so many challenges, yeah. But you've certainly managed to overcome those and look at how to move things forward, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, we, uh, we signed the contract with Planet Food Research with the 10 model, yeah, 10 model from the uh, variety, uh, the confirmed pest and disease, uh, water management, and many. So I think that I will apply this first for my company. I will have a, a presentation plot, and then the farmer will follow and I, I had to convince them uh, to, uh, with, uh, I, can, I can supply them with variety, fertilizer, and, um, and commit to buy the output. So I think that I, I, maybe I, I, I can overcome the challenge. Yeah. So across the world, the top percentile of farmers generally perform significantly better than the median or the bottom. So how can sharing of knowledge and capability be better facilitated to close the gap? Uh, first of all, I think that I will choose some very active uh, farmer, very active uh, cooperative, and then they will uh, follow what we do, and we will do presentation plot, and then the uh, other farmer will follow. So in Vietnam, like the when the farmer, when you see the neighbor, they grow something is good, they will follow. Yeah, for example, now the coffee, we, uh, maybe the farmer only have uh, uh, 2,000, 3,000 per hectare per year. Uh, but durian now, they can earn 50,000 US dollar per year per hectare. And so they will cut the coffee and grow the durian. So it's very difficult for, to, to, for the policy maker. Yeah. So what are the opportunities for countries with high performing food production systems to engage with and support countries with underdeveloped systems? Uh, it's very important it's, uh, because uh, developed country like New Zealand, like plant and food, you have uh, innovation continuously. So I think that it, uh, you should transform the technology, the knowledge to developed country and I think if to focus on the private sector, yeah, private sectors now to play the important role in the economy, like in Vietnam, and they are very active, flexible, and they can front runner, and farmer can follow. Yeah, yeah I think so. All right, we've only got a few minutes left now, but if there's one kind of takeaway message that you would like to leave the audience with today, what would that be? Uh, I hope that um, 
My project for avocado, for Haas Avocado Development will be successful in Vietnam and uh, many countries will be interested, especially the Asia country is near Vietnam, We're interested in my avocado and in the future I can export avocado to many countries in the world and if uh, someone uh, is interested with Vietnamese avocado, please contact me and plan and food, yeah. Thank All you. All right, can everyone thank me, uh, um, join me in thanking Ms. Huy um, for this one-on-one -on -one session today. I think it's been great to get to know a little bit more about her business and her insights as she looks to really um, pioneer um, in the central highlands of Vietnam with some new crops. So please join with me, a loud, Applause for Ms. Swai. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suzini Mel. Thank you, everyone. And we are going to go to a video right now before our next speakers. Thank you. Living in UAE is always meant a living in very harsh environment. Water is an absolutely scarce resource everywhere in the world and becoming scarcer. In the UAE, they produce enough food in their own country to feed 10% of their population. They've got an ambition to get that to 30%. It's very difficult to move to an agricultural country unless they have a huge source of water. The groundwater is getting saltier and saltier. But how, at what rates, why, how could you stop it? All these are the big questions that we don't have answer to. you're enjoying this session today and really learning about the effective use of resources for farmers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a series of three case studies, which is how we will round out this session. And our first speaker today is the Honourable Dr. Owusu Akoto, Minister of Food and Agriculture. Can you warmly welcome him to the stage? Thank you. Good morning to you all. I'm here to do a presentation on the case study for Ghana where in the last five years, there's been a very consistent, unprecedented attempt to transform the agricultural economy of the country. And we are doing this by giving a title to the group of policies government has adopted in the five years in this transformational ag agenda. And that is called planting for food and jobs. Planting for food and jobs basically has, is an attempt to increase the productivity on smallholder farms, in particular because smallholder farms produce almost 90% of Ghana's agricultural output, and their yields are so low, even compared to the regional average in West Africa. So the idea is to try and improve productivity, increase the yields by providing more resources in terms of improved seed and improved fertilizer. And this we have done 
uh, in terms of the, fo the food crop model of, of, of planting for food and jobs. There are five modules. The food crop component, which I'm talking about now, we have the tree crop, co uh, the tree crop component, the, the, uh, where we've selected six catch crops that we are targeting to bring to the level of cocoa, which has been Ghana's major export crop for the last 130 years. We want to diversify by selecting a group of six tree crops, including oil palm, rubber, coconut, coffee, cashew, and mango. So that is the second component. The third component is to do with greenhouse technology to try and improve the production of vegetables, uh, especially tomatoes and the other basic vegetables targeted at the youth because we have a huge youth unemployment in Ghana, and we are trying to engage them in modern farm technology through this uh, very innovative way of doing it. Fourth is the livestock uh, module, where especially to do with poultry. Ghana is importing something like $350 million worth of poultry meat every year. 30 years ago, we used to be a major export, exporter of poultry to the region. But because of things to do with the lack of soya and so on, the industry collapsed. We are trying to bring it back. Then finally, to introduce farm machinery into Ghanaian agriculture in pursuit of the productivity uh, increases that I'm talking about. So these are the five modules. Um, I'll go on and, and, and talk about the, tree, the, the, the farm, the food crops module, which has uh, the target to increase uh, uh, improve seed and, 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 and fertilizer. Fertilizer application before uh, we came into office 2017 was on average only eight kilograms per, per hectare. The world average is 130 kilograms per hectare. And if you go to China, you, it's common to see 300 kilograms per hectare. But Ghana, before we came in, was only eight kilograms per hectare. Uh, the same for the improved seed. Uh, very little improved seed into Ghanaian agriculture. Now we have succeeded in the five years to Im improve, to increase the supply of fertilizers and certified seed from 4,400 seeds that uh, we did in 2017 to 31,870 metric tons in 2021. This year we are hoping 2022 to hit over 400,000. So a phenomenal jump in the distribution of improved seed. Of course, the smallholders are, the, they are very poor farmers, so we are encouraging them to adopt the improved seed technology by a substantial uh, 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 subsidy on the price. In some cases, as high as 90% just to in, induce them to try the new seeds technology. And they're really taking it on, and we'll show you later on what it is. The same thing for fertilizers. From 121,000 metric tons of fertilizer distributed uh, under subsidy, it went as, uh, three times to four, 423,000 metric tons in 2021. And uh, that is also growing very rapidly. There's all, apart from the subsidy on fertilizer, there's op an open market uh, for the fertilizers, and uh, we see rapid increases. The extension officers, who are the link between science and the farmer, um, we had very few of them uh, when uh, we took over five years ago, 1,586 only. We have more than doubled, uh, trebled that to 4,286 supply them with motorbikes and their supervisors with pickups to supervise to make sure that they are in the field working with the farmers, teaching them the right way of uh, uh, applying the technology of seed and fertilizer. As a result, we've had substantial increase in yields. The average yields have gone up in the case of maize by 111, 000, uh, 111 percentage points from 2017 to 2021. Rice has increased by 56% in yield, and so has uh, sorghum, which has increased by 64%. The number of beneficiaries under this program has gone from 202,000 farmers, smallholder farmers, to nearly 1.7 million farmers as of last year, and it's growing very rapidly. So we have 
a very uh, healthy situation where we are beginning to have surpluses of food items, uh, grains in particular, as I've indicated. And whilst the other regions, other countries in the West African region are suffering from a drought and other unstable, unstable, unstable situations, which is affecting production. So uh, we become the island of surplus, where all these countries are now coming to Ghana to pick their grains and so on. So it's a very positive development. We have um, a demand, there's an, a lot of opportunities uh, which this has brought about, unprecedented opportunities for investment. That in Ghana, the demand for rice is one point, nearly 1.5 million. We've managed to bring it up to 622. There's a gap of 820,000 uh, metric tons, which gives a lot of uh, opportunity for farming companies and individuals who want to come to Ghana, especially in the northern savannah where there's a lot of land and there's a lot of water uh, for irrigation and, for, and so on, that can be used to uh, f uh, fill the gap, uh, making Ghana self-sufficient. So is soya. Soya production five years ago was less than 50,000 metric tons. Now we managed to get it up to 200,000 uh, metric tons, and it's going to go up uh, we, we think that in the next three, four years, we could be hitting a, a, a million metric tons. The demand there is 616,000 metric tons. So there's a shortfall there to 407,000. That can be used. Uh, um, that can be uh, um, an opportunity for investment. The demand for uh, uh, tomatoes uh, is, is very, very high because our basic food is tomato-based when it comes to soups and, and stews and other things like that. That we do nearly a, uh, over a million metric tons of demand. Our production is even less than uh, half of that demand and the opportunity for uh, uh, using greenhouse technology and other technologies to, to uh, improve our production uh, to meet the demand is very, very high. So in all these, we have the opportunity for processing. That, for instance, we are doing paddy rice uh, in the field. The milling uh, capacity machinery is very short. We have only 450,000 metric tons of milling capacity for, for rice. So we need to have investment in rice milling in Ghana. The opportunity is very, very great and for packaging and so on, not only to Ghana, but to the region, the whole West Africa region of nearly 360 million uh, uh, population is, 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 is out there waiting for such opportunities to be taken advantage of. And it's, so is uh, soya. Soya, soya milk, soya oil, soya, uh, soya uh, cake, and all of that is also a huge opportunity for investment in, in, in milling and processing. So generally, agro-processing is great. Tomatoes, the same. I mean, for production, processing, and, and, and greenhouse uh, technology uh, should do the trick for us. When it comes to poultry, it's equally great. I told you that uh, we are spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars importing uh, poultry meat. We, we, the demand is about 375,000 metric tons. We are doing uh, barely 65,000 metric tons, and there's a huge uh, gap for poultry production, uh, for poultry processing, and uh, all those things like packaging, storage, and uh, investments in vaccines and, and drugs and uh, other laboratory facilities. These are all waiting to be exploited, and I would invite the international investment community uh, to take advantage of these new opportunities which have come on into into uh, the poultry industry. And so is dairy. Dairy, with the demand, is huge. We're only meeting about 10% of our demand. Nearly five, uh, 470,000 metric tons of these products. Uh, production is only 56,000. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, vast lands of savanna, which is basically grasslands, which come, uh, come as a feed for, for, for cows and, 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 and milk production. Uh, the, the production, the opportunity for investment is so huge. The processing into cheese and uh, yogurt and other cre uh, uh, butter and others are uh, very, very high. So that is another area that we are uh, uh, getting um, 
need any investment. In addition to that, we have, um, Ghana has huge potential. As I said, land is not a problem. It's full of water, rivers running throughout the uh, north, south, east, west. Um, a lot of, uh, we have rainy season, two rainy seasons in the south, uh, in which period you don't have to apply irrigated water, but uh, use um, uh, rainwater. And then, of course, the, the, the dry season around this time, January, February, March, April, when there's no rain, that's when the irrigation kicks in. In the north, we have six months of dry season that requires irrigation during, during that, uh, that period. So, in general, the opportunities for investment in Ghana uh, are very great, and you have been invited, the international community, to take advantage. Today, I've been to visit the site of uh, Del Monte, uh, the food processors, and I was very impressed with their systems where they are taking fruits from other, West Africa, uh, other African countries, Eastern Africa, South Africa, uh, uh, um, South America, Asia, and we want to be part of that uh, global uh, system. So here we are, Ghana for you. Please come and join us in, in, in transforming the agricultural economy. Thank you. We now move on to the second case study of this session, and I would like to introduce Dr. Suleiman Al-Khatib, who is Director General, Plant Resources, Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture. Welcome to the stage. And uh, thanks, Susie, for this introduction. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank you all. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, for this invitation from New Zealand to this forum. Um, in the beginning, I just would like to imagine myself waking up in the morning, taking my coffee with two slices of bread with omelette egg and think that it is provided by the cooker or the restaurants while there are somebody else we forget about him behind this delicious breakfast that you are uh, taking in uh, your mor uh, in the morning and this guy is a farmer in rural areas waking before you to provide you by all these products and to uh, secure your hunger. This is the way it's work, but we forget about it. Then when we talk about these people, I think they desire to provide them by innovative technology, which provide them by ease of production. Unfortunately, what is available now is a very high cost innovative technologies. So we need to think about the rural areas as a source of our food. 80% of our global food come from this area. And most of the producers of our food come from these areas. They are small holders, small farmers, who providing us by our food every day and 24 hours. In this case, what they desired from us is innovative technology which have four uh, criteria. It should be uh, affordable for them. It should be efficient uh, for them and it should be cost effective and ease of access to this technology. In that case, we will 
really contribute to our global food security. I will just talk about the uh, effective use of resources for rural development. We are talking about Saudi Arabia, what, one of the driest country in the world. It is among the 10 uh, countries in the world which are categorized by the, the uh, uh, water scarcity, high temperature with a very poor uh, soil fertility. So what we can do to secure our food in, in Saudi Arabia or in area like United Arab Emirates or the, 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 the areas in the, 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 the Gulf country. So uh, when I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, it's a big area, yes, it is two million kilometer, but with uh, minimum rainfall, not, exceed, not exceeding much more than 100 mil uh, a year. So, but still we have a high production system and uh, in, in our, our uh, uh, kingdom. We have self-sufficiency in, in some of strategic commodities like milk, dates, uh, uh, egg, and there are uh, much more than 80% of, uh, of vegetables. There are 65% uh, of poultry. So we are now uh, a secure part of our and contribute in our food security in the country. Uh, uh, what we have, we have a strategic pillars. We totally depend upon these seven pillars to our uh, crop system or to our agriculture sector. I will just talk about the sustainable rural development. I will not talk about all these pillars because it will take uh, uh, much more time. And I think the, the limited time for me is just seven, uh, seven minutes. So when we are talking about sustainable use of natural resources, this includes irrigation system, we, we shift to the drip irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, a very smart technology for irrigation. We are using our non-renewable groundwater in, in, in uh, a manner uh, to uh, make it much more sustainable. We are uh, dependent on water harvesting and uh, going to develop the, the uh, terracing farming in the southwest of Saudi Arabia. And uh, the purpose of all these to contribute to our food security and provide our farmers with an access to the market. In that case, we will go further for our sustainable rural development, taking in consideration protection of plant and animal health and providing our farmers and our agriculture sector by all the needs, the tools, the measures that enable them to still stable in their productive system and going to the agriculture productivity enhancement, enhancement by providing the farmers with the innovative uh, technologies that enable them to produce high quality and high productive with economic uh, uh, base of their uh, uh, production. And in the end, we reshape our sector accordingly to provide them and make them stable in their area. Uh, when we are talking about overview of rural areas of the kingdom, we have more than uh, uh, almost 70% of our uh, holders is in the, uh, the rural area in Saudi Arabia. But they are representing just 16% of the, 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 uh, the country uh, settlement of, of the, the, the population. And there are available con uh, a cooperative uh, advantage of, of the region and most of the region in Saudi Arabia. There are uh, uh, infrastructure enable them to provide their uh, commodities to the market uh, 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 by uh, providing a number of dams. There are more than 550 dams 
providing them by, by the available water there in their uh, areas. There are available water, electricity, and uh, uh, basic services there in, in their area, available paved roads to uh, transfer and their, their products to the market. And the, in the end, I, we have the availability of major development projects, uh, which one of them is the rural development program. Uh, I will talk about it shortly. There are 35% of our agriculture holder hold a high school or a, a university degree. So they are educated, know about uh, the, the agriculture sector in a, a good manner. Uh, when we go to the uh, background of our uh, agriculture or development program, there are uh, uh, program strategic uh, uh, goals to uh, preserving environment and natural resources, improving the income and the standard of uh, living, and there are the uh, uh, diversifying the uh, productive base, providing job, uh, social stability, and settlement, and contribute to the uh, our food uh, security. And. The, the, the background of, of these strategic uh, uh, goals is the small producer represent 80% of total number of the uh, agriculture holding. They are uh, only 6% of total area of the, the, the uh, holding in the kingdom. So the number is very high, but they are contributing a lot to the, uh, to the, the uh, community and the society in rural areas in, in the kingdom. Where more than 165 small rural agriculture producer are in region like Asir, Mecca, Al-Mukarrama, and Al-Madina, and Jizan, and Al-Baha, and Eastern Province as well. Miwa is in uh, cooperative with FAO now uh, managing these uh, uh, this program and the programs uh, sub programs under this main uh, program and the, the the ultimate goals to strengthen the capacity of smallholder family farmers to enable them to access productive resources and services and market. Uh, uh, there are uh, seven uh, uh, sub program under the, uh, the uh, uh, rural development program, one of them is the fruit production. So we are tar targeting figs, grapes, we add lemon and Arabian, moringa and uh, pomegranate as, uh, as well. This is a targeting fruit. We enable the, the farmer to contribute to our need for these products uh, particularly. So what we are doing in this program, we are providing them by the, the plant resources that uh, enable them to produce uh, high quality and high productive uh, of these uh, specific uh, fruit in, under this sub uh, program. Rain feed crops, while we are targeting uh, the rain feed uh, crop particularly interesting farming in southwest of, of Saudi Arabia, where the rainfall there around 100 to 170 uh, yearly. And we are targeting sorghum system and milk and also wheat as well. So this to secure their need there, there is no, they are producing for sorghum. There are more than 60,000 uh, hectare have been planted depending upon the uh, uh, rainfall or supplement irrigation from the dams. So it is uh, renewable uh, water and water harvesting. Uh, fisheries, there are uh, more around 940, uh, 400 or 500 uh, fishermen who are uh, uh, owned about 10,000 small fishing boats. And we are uh, accessing to these fishermen to provide them the, the capability of continuous 
uh, production there and sustainable management of uh, uh, cost and ecosystem, especially mangrove, to keep the uh, capturing of uh, their uh, uh, fish in, in a stable status. There are the uh, livestock, and we are targeting a small uh, farmer in that concept. We are choosing the, 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 the breeders have less than 500 uh, head in, in, in uh, uh, sheep and goats, uh, and around uh, uh, less than that in, in, in uh, cow and camels. But what we are providing, providing them vaccination, knowledge, and uh, access to the, the, the uh, forages so, so they will continue to produce uh, uh, and uh, contribute to our food security uh, of red meat. And uh, uh, also the uh, fifth uh, sub-program is beekeeping and honey uh, production. And this is a very uh, promising uh, sector now. We have some collaboration with our colleagues from New Zealand to develop the sector accordingly and raise the quality of the, the, the honey produced from these mountainous uh, uh, region. And there are the Arabian coffee in, in uh, regions like Jezan, Asir, and Al Baha. And still there are 600 farmers. We are targeting these farmers to build their capability to increase their production and to provide them by the uh, genetic resources uh, with high productive uh, ability. There are the rose production. We have more than 1,200 1, farmers and with uh, producing one million tree, with one million tree producing five million rose every year. And uh, the barbers is for, for uh, perfume and uh, et cetera. And the, the last one is the value addition, providing packaging and uh, access to the market. This is what we are doing in our rural uh, agriculture rural development uh, program. Uh, I hope that I, I just provide some uh, uh, information about the program and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salomon, for a stimulating um, presentation. I realize that today we have not given you the opportunity to talk, to ask questions of the speakers. So I would encourage you at the lunch break coming up shortly to really approach them with your questions. We have one more speaker between you and lunch, but it is, um, it is going to be virtual. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Path Manathan Umaharan, Professor, University of West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you, moderators, and thank you, organizers of the Dubai 2022 Expo and giving me the opportunity to speak at this very esteemed forum. I am going to talk to you today about mainstreaming innovations to nurture the chocolate industry in Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is a small island developing state and being small means that you have limited resources, you have limited administrative capacity you have a very flat administrative and innovation system. And that is why you need to prioritize what you are going to be doing. So one of the industries that uh, Trinidad and Tobago has prioritized is the cocoa industry. And the reason for this is because of the comparative advantage that this industry enjoys. Firstly, Trinidad and Tobago has a reputation for the fine or flavor cocoa that it produces. It is the country of origin of the Trinitario cocoa, 
which is synonymous to high quality. And the cocoa fetches a premium in the global market. It is also the custodian of the International Cocoa Gene Bank, the largest cocoa collection in the world. And it therefore provides support to breeding programs throughout the world, as well as in Trinidad and Tobago. Thirdly, it also has the International Cocoa Research Center, which is known for its work in the cocoa industry for over 90 years. Trinidad and Tobago also has a very long history in cocoa production, starting in the 1500s and continuing to this day. However, the industry has gone into some troubles over the years. Uh, the production levels have decreased from 40,000 tons it used to produce at its peak to 500 tons. The productivity levels have dropped to 200 kilograms per hectare, far cry from the 3,000 kilograms per hectare that it can produce. And as a result, a lot of farmers are leaving the industry. Uh, Trey and Tobago also primarily exports cocoa beans, which is a primary product, and it only fetches about 68% of the value chain. So that again has been one of the deterrents for the development of this industry. Uh, innovations have been developed, but they have not been clearly mainstreamed to support the industry. And, uh, and when you talk about innovations, we normally talk about technological innovations, but there are innovations that are systemic in nature with, or in, in terms of social innovations, environmental innovations, market innovations, and so on. So I think uh, that has been, again, a problem. And, and the lack of targeted marketing into the niche markets has also been a problem. So if you're trying to re-engineer an industry, then you need to first look at the future markets. And if you look at the market trend, um, the cocoa industry has been moving into the bean to bar um, industry, has been actually burgeoning. And uh, the novelty chocolates, and as you see on the right, has actually been in the rise. Um, tourism, experiential tourism, has been also in the rise. Um, chocolates are not only being consumed as a confectionery, they are more and more being consumed as a pharmaceutical product, as they are considered to be a superfood. And there has also been market trends towards changing the industry into a climate uh, resilient industry um, with ESG compliance. So if these are the market trends, then we need to engineer the industry um, to be able to meet those market needs. And these are some of the things that we are trying to look at. We are trying to bring innovations at the farm level, innovations at the end of the value added products in terms of diversifying the product range, creating novelty in the product range and increasing the value added component to 80% of the total production. We are also looking at bringing private sector investment, uh, which is a re-engineered private sector that meets the needs of the mar new market that is evolving. Now, if you have to do this, then we need to build a new model. And what would the new model look like? And um, so on one hand, we want innovations um, in, in the system itself, uh, not only in, in technologies, but in terms of market innovations, innovations in the, in the way we produce different various kinds of products and so on. We are also very much interested in um, nurturing a business sector. So I'm going to, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about some of the things that we are doing in Trinidad and Tobago to remodel the industry so it becomes a very profitable and attractive industry for investment. The first thing that we did was to set up what we call an International Fine Cocoa Innovation Center. Uh, this center seeks to be the engine for innovation, to produce new innovations, um, not only in terms of production in the farm level, but also in, in terms of product development, value addition, as well as business and technology incubation for companies and so on. So this is sort of the engine that we are looking for to create innovations. We have also at this site developed models so that people can look, learn, 
and understand and emulate in the industry. Um, parallelly, we are also interested in building a private sector that will create the demand for these innovations. So creating innovations themselves do not really lead to the development of an industry. And in this regard, you need to really, again, have a triple helix model where you have the governmental interventions, the research and innovation interventions, and the private sector innovations. So at the le government level, there's a lot of efforts being take taken into building a business environment that will attract SMEs, as well as also foreign direct investment into this industry by providing a, a number of different kinds of incentives, tax holidays, tax credits, rebates, grants and financial instruments to develop new innovations in the market and also support services. In addition to that, at the research and technology level, I think we are building innovations in the farming communities. We are building precision maps um, that are focused on cost of production, focused on risks that are in various parts of the country, focused on productivity um, challenges in different parts of the countries and so on. And as a result, I think we are we are trying to create a very nuanced approach to supporting investment in different parts of the countries. And I think this is very important so that because the investors have to go into those locations for investment with their eyes wide open. That's what we think is important. And finally, you need to also have the private sector innovating. So you need to have grants and uh, funds to support private sector to develop innovations, to get into the market, reduce their carbon footprints, creating novel flavors and new branding mechanisms to really enter into the market space. So um, this is what we call the private sector innovation that is needed. And so in, in total, we have an innovation center, which is the engine that produces innovations. It, it's what we call the push strategy. And then we have innovations in the market space in terms of private sector, government, and technology institutions to create the sort of pull for innovations, investments and pull into those innovations, and therefore creating a partnership model that can lead to development. So in summary, I would like to say that, you know, that uh, in small countries, prioritization is very important. Market focused innovations are very important. And you need to have an innovation center that brings about the innovations in the entire value chain. Then you need to create an innovative investment environment. And finally, it's very important is that you need to have this triple helix approach. You have your government, private sector, and the universities partner together. And it's very important to monitor and evaluate every step so that we know that we are actually improving as we go along the developmental pathway. But thank you very much for listening. So that brings to a close our session on effective use of resources for farmers. I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Again, I would encourage you to reach out to the speakers that are here and to discuss with them over lunch. So we are now going to break for lunch and I'm allowed to tell you how long for. So it's for one hour. So we expect you back here in an hour. So thank you everyone and enjoy lunch. Hello again, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful lunch and enjoyed speaking to your fellow attendees and delegates. 
Thank you for rejoining us this afternoon. We have a packed lineup of presentations and panel discussions and inspiring speakers for you to hear from. We're going to start with some case studies. And the topic is tech of tomorrow. And this is part one of two of these sessions. And it's dedicated to a very important matter, not least how disruptive technology will really bolster the global food system and what technologies are shaping the future of this industry, not only today, but will be in the next five to 10 years. Let's find out with the first of three inspiring presentations. I'd like to call to the stage Alanoud Al-Hashmi. She is the CEO of The Futurist Company here in the United Arab Emirates. Please give her a warm welcome. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Do you guys love these cams? It's amazing, right? It's all around Expo. Love them. Love them. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for this opportunity and being here and listening to talk about what tech we need for tomorrow. And when we talk about tomorrow, we're talking about the future. Um, the Futurist Company is a company that started in the toughest time in 2020. Before that, we were working on some projects that helped us come to what's today the Futurist Company. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about some technology and innovation that we came to and developed the last couple of years. And why I'm sharing this, because I think we, we found some interesting learnings and key points that I would like to share with you. And I hope that people can learn from our mistakes and, and our learnings so they can avoid the time we have wasted developing some of the aspects and uh, there is a shortcut and I hope and I wish that um, others can actually do things faster because we do need fast action and fast results with the challenges we're going to face in the future. First of all, I'm going to talk about what inspires us at the Futurist Company and what do we do briefly. The Futures Company, we work on future-facing projects, and what does that mean? It means that we look into a lot of numbers, a lot of data, we do a lot of R&D, but that's not it. That's not the only thing that we do. We bring all the information, we digest it, we understand it, we analyze it, and then we can actually project what's gonna happen in the future. We were to take the future, we're talking about five, up to 25 years. Most of the companies work on their strategies, three, five, 10 years, maybe. But what we're trying to do here is trying to avoid catastrophe that might come in the future if we don't find the solutions and develop them now. One of them is climate change. The whole increase of temperature, the loss of arable land. It's a serious problem because the population is increasing. It's never going to decrease or anytime soon. But the food demand and requirement is increasing with it as well. And we're losing arable land for every one Cecilius that we are increasing in the temperature. So what, what inspires us is not only being able to imagine, because imagination is a very important role when you're trying to focus on solutions that doesn't exist. So you're trying to combine technologies, you're trying to combine research and data and try to find algorithms and you work with, we work with scientists and technologists and we develop things. If we don't have imagination, that solution will never be able to be seen because we can't imagine it. So imagination is a very key aspect into what we do at the Futurist Company. And Sheikh Mohammed, ruler of Dubai, is, is, is an, an, an inspiration himself. And he says the future belongs to those who can imagine it. So imagination is really important for us. We design and execute, and I'll come to that part about what we do. And it isn't something you wait, but you rather create. You can all say this is going to happen in the future, but if you don't do anything about it, it doesn't matter if you know what's going to happen in the future. The actions that actually makes a difference to you, to me, to everyone uh, in our society and on this planet. So what we do after we develop these data and, and analyze them and, and develop the reports, we see a problem and we try to find a solution. And when we, when we say find a solution, we integrate technologies. We never look at, at a technology in silo. And this is where I'm going to talk about some of the technologies that we worked on. And that is, I think, something interesting to share with you all. So it's an international problem. And when I, why I like to say it's an international problem, because it's not only for this region, 
It's not because we live in a desert or because someone else lives in Europe so they have greenery. It's literally an international problem. Even places that had no food, no food problems and they had food security, they're facing issues now with the increase of level uh, of water, the increase of rain or the increase of temperature. There is no stability and therefore farmers are actually struggling. So by year 2050, more than half of the world population will rely on food uh, sourced from other countries. In the UAE, we import 80% of our fresh produce. And that is a huge percentage. And the government have put a strategy and have put in a task force to work on food security. Cost is another aspect when it comes to this international problem. The situation is not about only finding sustainable ways, but it's, it's just not sustainable. It exposes the population to increased cost and supply crisis because when you look into organic, you can see the difference of the price, and that is not affordable for everyone. That means good quality food is not affordable for everyone. Therefore, you're going to go to the next option, which can actually harm you health-wise, and that's another problem that we will need to challenge and face in the future. Technology and innovation is another aspect of how important is what, what we try to create because we try to integrate it. So we look into a holistic system. And climate, with the increases I mentioned of every one Cecilius in temperature, we're losing 10% of arable land. That scares me. I don't know how you feel about it. So what solutions, how we can develop a solution that is sustainable, actually profitable, so you want to ensure it's consistent and it exists and it's sustainable. And we looked into how we integrate different AI was an important aspect in this because it helped us not only to monetize and manage but also to reduce some aspects in farming that are actually crucial and it affects the prices of the products as well as the operations. So I'm giving you an example here because I don't want to talk about only theories, I want to give an example. And that's the best way for you to be able to visualize what a solution can be. We looked into different reports and we used uh, actually NASA's, NASA Space Center and the Russian Space Center reports. And based on some of the technologies they're working on, we developed some algorithms that help us to develop Gaia. Gaia is an AI scalable farming system. It allows you to farm anything, anytime, all year long without pollution. 60% less water, and we're using renewable energy because electricity is not helping with carbon offset and the emissions. And we found out after we have tested the prototype in below zero and above 45, the result was the same, which was 30% better yield in both cases. What does that mean and why it's important? I believe in traditional farming. I actually love traditional agriculture. I do it myself at home. I enjoy it. I love it. But I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about that 10% arable land that we're losing for every one degree. Until we find a solution for that, we need to have a solution for food security. And only when we integrated different technologies, we were able to find that solution. And this is why I we're working on any solution that is tackling a problem to look into technologies from a holistic point of view instead of silos. This is the only way that we can work in the future and develop something a technology for the future, not one, technologies for the future. So one of the aspects that is very important about what Gaia allowed us to do is the AI by not only allowing us to measure the, foot, uh, the, the carbon footprint for every produce, let's say every lettuce inside Gaia, but also it allowed us to understand what the plant needs, not what we think it needs, and that allowed it to thrive. Thinking about using sustainable and renewable energy in agri-tech solutions is very crucial. Think of it this way, we're trying to feed us, but in the process of feeding us, every agri-tech project out there, if it's not using renewable energy, they're using electricity, and it's high-intensity electricity. That means we're feeding us, but we're harming the planet. We need to coexist with the planet. We are into this together with the planet. We need the planet to help us and support us. We are launching Gaia this year, and I really would love all of you to go read about it, ask us questions, because we would like to share our learnings with everyone. 
We won't be able to feed the planet. We need tens of thousands of other agri-tech solutions that consider sustainability, the environment, and other aspects so we can coexist with our planet. This is it for me. Uh, my time is out now. I hope you all enjoyed it, and thank you for being here and listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Alan Oud, an inspiring presentation. Technology for a better future, and we are all in this together. Now I would like to call to the stage our second presenter. He is Jason Shreer, the Market Solution Manager at LIC in New Zealand. He's flown in to be with us. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, First, let me say what a privilege it is to be here at such an extraordinary event to be able to present at Expo 2020 and discuss disruptive tech and tech for the future. Um, as you can see from my, my presentation here, I wanted to cover efficiency, productivity and sustainability um, moving into the future. So by way of introduction, whoops. Um, my name's Jason Schreer. I'm the Market Solutions Manager at Livestock Improvement Corporation in New Zealand, or LIC as we're affectionately known. Um, a commercially focused farmer-owned cooperative. Um, we're owned by about 12,000 farmer shareholders. And we've got head offices in Hamilton, Ireland, the UK and Australia. And innovation and R&D is one of the focuses of, of our business and for the sector, the dairy sector in New Zealand, with 15% of our revenue being reinvested into that R&D on an annual basis. Three out of four dairy cows is from an LIC farm or an LIC bull. And we run diagnostics on approximately 10.7 million litres of milk samples annually to ensure the, the, the quality of the produce that comes out of New Zealand. Exporting our product to 20 countries internationally with an animal management system that enjoys a 92% market share in New Zealand. So as a brief overview of LIC. So in, in thinking about this, this presentation and the questions that were posed to me, I was uh, looking at the technology landscape that is becoming increasingly busy. We have satellites, drones on animal devices, in the ground devices, machinery that will tell us where the, what the provenance of our product is and where it's come from. And it's becoming a very, very busy environment for our farmers and our consumers to, to keep their eye on. Um, and it made me think of a project that I've recently been working on in East Africa where the goal was to aggregate disaggregated databases so that decisions could be made from these multiple previous disruptive technologies being created in the environment. And ultimately for me, what this comes down to is that it's about the user, it's about the consumer, it's about the person that's going to utilize the product, utilize this disruptive technology at the very forefront or at the, at the coal face of where they're operating. And that's where I'm going to talk about the product that, or the, the disruptive tech that LIC is working from. Um, so the key drivers in the livestock sector are one, genetics. I can't, I can't let an opportunity to talk about dairy genetics slip aside. Um, health, keeping the, the, those good genetics healthy and feeding them well. These three things um, create a, a total picture, which is production. So there's that, that efficiency, driving those efficiencies and, and productivity on farm. Good genetics, um, when kept healthy, will get in calf and, and breed the next generation of, of animals. When animals are healthy, um, they eat well and produce well. When they're fed well, they maintain good levels of health. 
And if you feed those good genetics well, they come back up onto the rising plane so they can get into calf and produce more genetics, more genetic offspring and progeny for you in the future. So all of these things together are drivers of production. <coughs> and I'm going to take you into space now and focus on the feed component of it. So what we did was try to understand those real drivers on farm for managing feed and putting good food into our animals to ensure that we were getting good production out of them and maintaining the land as we needed to. So we've come up with a product called SPACE, or Satellite Pasture and Cover Evaluation. SPACE in and of itself is something relatively new and, and creative in the New Zealand environment, but we needed to understand why we were going to put this into market. So we set about deeply understanding what our customers were looking for and interviewing and, and finding out why they managed the soil and why they managed the, the pasture the way they did and why they were doing certain things on farm and how they were measuring this, this information so they knew whether they had a surplus or a deficit coming along. Um, once we understood that, it made the process a little bit easier because we were trying to create a solution for an existing problem not a problem that we could find a product for. And I think that's one of the key things that uh, we need to be aware of when we're looking at disruptive tech. So space will provide a regular pasture evaluation provided to those farmers digitally. You're about to see an image of that pop up on the screen. So this is the LIC farm that we trialled this on initially. And you can see the variance in colours on, uh, on the map there that show me how much pasture is in a specific location. Visually, I get an image of it. I can understand what's there. The light yellow is um, an area that's low or recently been grazed, and the darker green shows me uh, a higher growth rate of grass. Coupled with that, we wanted to be able to provide an accurate provision of a feed wedge or information for the rotational grazing systems that we utilise in New Zealand. Um, and that, that's distributed to our customers digitally like this. Now you'll notice that on here there's um, two different colours. We've got a blue and a pink, and that's an individual reference of each, each paddock or each field on farm. New Zealand's not called the land of the long white cloud for no reason. Uh, satellites go over the country and we have a lot of cloud cover, so we've had to advance and work with this algorithm to ensure that we're able to create a system that will estimate when there's uh, no availability to actually take an image of the farm as such. So the pink is an estimated reading, the blue is an actual reading of the, of the farm. In discussing this with our farmers, what did they want to do? They wanted to save time because they've got more jobs on farm that they wanted to perform than walking around a pasture with a plate meter doing this. And in some cases that can take up to eight hours on a farm in New Zealand. Um, and it, it's performed in the, in the peak of the season three times a week. Um, they wanted it to be convenient. I don't want to have to do anything for it, just bring it to me as I need it. Feed me the information and show me what it looks like. Tell me what my situation is. Can we make it objective? Absolutely. Machines don't care what your pasture cover looks like. And we didn't need it to. So. Um, taking away that subjectivity and taking away the, the people that measure differently, the one farmer that measured it on the height of his boots when we talked to him, how he was measuring the pasture, and another guy that was riding a motorbike at 50 kilometres an hour, estimating it as he drove past. So this takes away those, those inaccuracies in the system and provides an objective measure. It's integrated to our animal um, solutions. And it's accessible to everyone. If you can get an image of your farm from a satellite, we can provide the, the insights. Now, transitioning this into different locations is obviously something that's a capability of, of this system as well. So this fitted a specific need for the New Zealand farmer. Uh, it's one of my, one of my statements that Disruption without purpose is distraction. So we need to be solving for something is one of the key points that I'd like to leave with today. 
Oh, sorry, I forgot my environmental considerations. You can see how you're managing the land and see which are your more performant paddocks. So um, talking to that sustainability and management of the soil as guardians of the land. I will move on to my next slide. So this feels like a bit of a recap on everyone else's presentation that I've heard today, um, in that efficiency, productivity, and sustainability, what we're all aiming for, requires a common goal. I think in the room, online, anyone that's working in the agriculture sector, be you vertical farming, dairy farming, or any other type of farming, we all have a common goal to drive for those three things. Secondly, connection, and events like this are great for connection, but we need to connect more and better to move forward and into the future. And thirdly, collaboration. Let's not try and do this independently. Let's collaborate as an industry and as a sector so we can actually provide um, integrated solutions to those that need it when they need it the most. That's, uh, that's all from me today. But as far as connection goes, thank you very much. And I'm more than happy to connect with any of you in the room later on. Thank you so much to Jason, even though he tried to steal the props. Up next, we have another brilliant presentation. I would like to ask to come to the stage. He is currently pacing in the wings. David Davies, the CEO of Ag Unity from Australia. Please welcome him. Sorry, <laughs> I'm David Davies, the CEO of AgUnity. Tool for the very low. All these farmers you see, they've increased their income. They've had. Okay, one. Alrighty, let's try that again. Let's, try, let's talk about one of the biggest problems facing the world today, which is how do we feed the world in the future? And at the same time, let's look at the number of people that live in poverty around the world. Sometimes some of the biggest challenges that we face, the answer is right there before you. There are half a billion smallholder farmers in the world and they support an ecosystem of 3.1 billion people. Most of those earn less than $2 a day. If you want to know how do you make more food in the world and at the same time lift millions of people out of poverty, well, the answer's right there. We work with these farmers across 12 countries. Most of them are operating somewhere between 20 and 50% efficiency. The problem is they're mostly too small for anyone to help. They don't get these great technology systems. They don't get assistance from age because they're very, very hard to reach. So if you want to solve the problem of world food shortage, firstly, you can increase their efficiency. You can help them earn more and grow more. And you can also solve a massive amount of wastage that occurs in these smallholder ecosystems. We see situations like in Port Moresby where there's no mangoes in the city, but you go 20 kilometers away and mangoes are falling off the trees. There's plenty of food around if we move it around and connect this massive resource of smallholder farmers that we have around the world. And that's what AgUnity does. And the first action to you have to do to this is create trust and cooperation between these farmers and give them a system that works for people that have very low literacy. Most of them have never had a phone before. And to do that, we take phones and we transform them. We replace the operating system. We make them, they transact online, so if the farmer hasn't got connectivity, it works. We create a really basic interface with 
primary colours and geometric symbols. So if they've got no literacy, they can still use it. We've been doing this now all over the world for five years. We've completed 12 projects around the world, all the way from Trinidad to Ethiopia to Papua New Guinea. And to achieve that, we've had to have a team that's very, very diverse. We've got people coming from banking technology. We've got a lot of people that have done multi-hundred million dollar agricultural projects and a lot of people from ground uh, development programs and NGOs. We have a total team now of 50 people across 19 countries. I'm very proud to say that during COVID, we went to hiring a lot of people locally in country rather than flying people around the world. We work with a lot of the big NGOs, commodity buyers and financial institutions who are really the customers that need to connect with those smallholder farmers because they're the ones trying to reach them and help them in other ways. There we go. Now let's just break down this half million farmers. There's 70 million relatively large farmers. To us, a large farmer is anyone that's got more than about 10 acres. They're essentially, they've got access to technology, they tend to be educated, and there's a ton of tools and systems and support programs for them. You've also got 250 million that fit in the, the middle, and you've got 250 million in this bottom level that have low literacy, low income, little connectivity in their areas. They've got no bank accounts, and really nobody supports those farmers. Why? It's really hard. You can't bring the system that you developed for an educated wealthy farmer and give it to a smallholder farmer in New Guinea who's never had a phone before and has no literacy. Papua New Guinea, we're very proud to say, we were sponsored for a project by the Expo Live program, and now we're running five different projects around the country. The first project was in Medang with cocoa farmers, and we've seen those farmers increase their income substantially since we've been running that project there. 82% of the nation of Papua New Guinea depends on agriculture, and most of those are very smallholder farmers that are exactly the ones we're addressing. The project, we first started off with 100 farmers, but we've now brought, brought that out to five different projects. The Expo Live had a $150,000 grant, and that gave us access to a market of 150,000 people. Some very, very happy farmers in that group. And as I said, there's five projects we're running now and another two starting in Papua New Guinea. There's another problem, though, that we've increased some of the farmers' incomes by up to three times in Kenya and Papua New Guinea and we get really good results from these economies everywhere. But there's a problem we couldn't solve until now, and that's a great new initiative we started this year. Let's take coffee as an example. On average around the world, you'd pay about $2.80 for a cup of coffee. The poor farmer gets about seven cents of that, and it didn't used to be that way. If we go back 30 years, the farmer was getting more like 10 to 15% of the value of the coffee that you pay for. What's happened is we've all become accustomed to paying a lot more for things like coffee and chocolate and tea, but the supply chains have kept those farmers oppressed. On the other side of things, we work with a lot of commodity buyers, and some of them really do want to be ethical, but they've got a problem. If they try to play more, they're not connected to the farmer. The middlemen take it all. These organisations, and I'm not going to name names because you probably know some of them, but some of them in the newspaper very regularly for problems like child slavery and, uh, in their supply chains. And it's a very difficult problem to address. Because we've got the solution at Unity, we've introduced a digital reward system for the farmers, and I'm pleased to say this is working extremely well. You can buy a dollar of aggregate and you can send it directly to the farmer and they receive a dollar of aggregate and they can use it to pay off their phone, buy farm supplies, all the other things that we're doing with those farmers already. Just a sec. There we go. So this system is live in two countries so far, and we could be rolling it out to others. We've got it live in Ethiopia with coffee farmers and with our Mandang um, coca farmers that we've already interested. All those farmers have already received agriate. 
This is a great way for a coffee company to say, hey, I will give something directly to the farmer. But most importantly, it also allows consumers to do it. What a nice idea that you can have your coffee in the morning, scan a QR code on your receipt, and send a tip directly to one of the farmers that grew that coffee that you are drinking today. And we're also working on the system where that farmer can say thank you in real time. So this is an incredible opportunity to produce food production. Those farmers, those half a billion smallholder farmers, produce $2.1 trillion of commodities that come into the developed world. But as I'm saying, we see this all the time. They're probably operating at about 30, 50% of efficiency. They could be growing better crops, they could be doing it. That 2.1 trillion is potentially a $5 trillion opportunity and it potentially solves the world's supply, food supply issue. They also currently buy about a trillion dollars worth of products and services from the developed market. They're a huge market for natural services, or at the moment they use none of it, and they're a big recipient of foreign aid. And all those things are done with mind-boggling inefficiency at the moment. So much money just falls through the gaps when someone like World Food Program tries to get money to farmers, or a commodity company tries to buy coffee from the farmers. It's disappearing in all sorts of ways. And our role, as we see it, is to create a mobile platform where those farmers can be connected to the commodity buyer or the bank or the thing through a very simple way that they understand and we plug that gap, saving millions, billions of dollars in the process. This gives benefits to all. I mean, we grow, but the reason we're growing is so we can help more farmers. It enables the commodity buyers and the products and service providers to actually reach a market that they previously really didn't, couldn't connect to. For retail consumers, it enables them to buy with trust that they know that they're buying ethically and the people at the other end that made their coffee or coca or tea actually got paid a fair price. But most importantly, we are lifting thousands at the moment and hopefully in the future millions of smallholder palmers out of poverty. We're currently doing a big expansion. We've had some great project, pilot projects around the world and we're now scaling up these and entering a whole lot of new markets. We're expanding the technology as well. So thank you very much for your time. I'm David Davies. If you'd like to try the Agri Awards system, if you see me in the audience, swing by, I'll let you scan a QR code and that will give you a small amount of agri aggregate and you can pick any of our farmers in Ethiopia or Papua New Guinea and send them a couple of dollars, which to you it's a couple of dollars, to them it's gonna feed their family for half a week. So if you do see me, please come and give it a try and hopefully we'll see more people using this system in the future. Thank you very much. much to Jason, David and Alan Nude for all of their presentations. Much food for thought. After a short video that you're about to see, we'll be switching things up somewhat with a fireside chat and a TEDx talk. The subject that we'll be tackling is how to promote greater productivity of local livestock. We're going to share best practices, also look at the challenges, see how we can pull together, focusing again on those PPPs and the partnerships, collaborations, and being stronger and better together. We need to overcome the challenges for the long term, and to help us steer the conversation is Hazel Jackson. She'll be up next after this short video. Thank you. The new normal defines a bold new coming of age, where connectivity redefines boundaries to markets, and information is the most tradable asset, where omni-channel commerce is a necessity, and the only differentiator is digital agility, where trade routes are continually reconfigured, where sustainable logistics are dramatically reimagined, and open competition is the most successful modus operandi. A community consciousness has grown to align with our responsibilities as a society, where human connection sparks dialogue and collaboration ignites open-mindedness. And as we take a step forward, it's time to say, join us, make your mark. 
Welcome to the city of spontaneity and consideration. Welcome to the city of limitless opportunities. Welcome to Dubai. afternoon. I hope everybody is still trucking along. You've had a couple of sessions after lunch ready to go. And Rebecca, thanks for the introduction to this session on how we promote greater productivity in local livestock. I'm fascinated to bring up two very diverse countries uh, to come and share their experiences on stage, comparing and how the collaboration has worked between Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and New Zealand. If you've been to both, very, very different landscapes. I am delighted to have two people for this fireside chat to join me. Mamdou Al-Shahari, who's the Deputy Director General of Animal Production, General Management, Saudi Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture. And also Charles Liberin, Consultant Abacus Bio from New Zealand. If you'd like to come on stage, I'm going to give you a little bit more of an introduction. Hands together, be a welcoming audience for these two gentlemen, Mamdu, um, as well as his new role in as the Deputy Director General, he's also responsible for the livestock research and development here in MIWA and has a PhD from the University of New England. And uh, Charles has been consulting internationally in agriculture, genetics, commercialization, and food for the past four years in Abacus Bio. And prior to that, he was heavily invested in New Zealand agriculture's industry. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Um, let's get oh, fascinating conversation backstage about the difference between your two countries and how you're collaborating and how that is going to help um, better productivity of local livestock. But uh, Mamdu, let me start with you, okay? Let's just share with us some of the challenges that perhaps you're facing in Saudi Arabia and maybe some of the changes that you're facing, um, you know, with innovations that you're creating in Saudi around livestock. Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, we're facing uh, many challenges like uh, climate change, water security, uh, food safety, and also we're facing a green feeder for our uh, livestock. So, so in this case, we're thinking in the future, how can we, we, we develop and solve this problem? And how can we increase our self-efficiency uh, according to the, the Saudi Fajian uh, 2030. And we're targeting to, to self-efficiency for red meat in 2030 about 65. Wow. So okay. <laughs> uh, in, the, in this is case, we, we try to have a partnership and collaboration locally and regionally and globally. and. Uh, we appreciate Charles here to, to, to progress this development. Great. Charles, you spent some time in the kingdom actually helping. Tell us a little bit about that. And I think there's a picture that we're yes. able to share of a bit of the scene here so we can all understand the, the farming environment. Yes. Um, uh, in 2019, uh, we spent about five or six months in the region uh, working with Miwa. And uh, as you can see on the screen up there, um, it is a desert environment, um, which is, and, and we do have some dry places in New Zealand, but not as dry <laughs> as that. Um, and, and the breeds of the sheep are, are also very different, um, but they are extremely well adapted to, to that environment. And, and I think come, with that comes a lot of opportunity. So. Uh, in collaboration with MIWA, we hope to sort of investigate the application of genetics um, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in, you know, 
in measured ways. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's um, important that uh, we, we don't just pick up technology from parts of the world and, mm -hmm. and take it to uh, different places in the world and expect it to work. That is naive. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's an element of, of working very closely not only with Miwa but also farmers and understanding uh, what's going to work and what's not. You've been spending quite a lot of time with Abacus Bio focusing on bridging that gap between science and business with livestock genetics. You've actually had some great results in New Zealand. Do you want to share a little bit about that and then actually how that might help as we move forward um, in Saudi Arabia? That's right. And I, and I think it's really, really important to point out that the, the successes in New Zealand are due to the farmers that we have. Um, I think the short story is that we had about 50 million sheep in 1990 and now we have only about 21 million sheep and yet the, the amount of lamb that we export to the world is roughly the same amount. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, are, we have developed a very uh, efficient uh, flock of, of sheep. Um, back in 1990 we were probably had reproduction rates of 100% so a ewe would have one good lamb and now we are we are pushing 130% uh, so that's how we sort of reach those levels of uh, efficiency fantastic Mamdi, that sounds like an exciting opportunity for you to learn yeah. from what opportunities do you see for the sheep breeders in Saudi Arabia and how do you think they will view genetics as a tool to improving production it's good question. As uh, you mentioned in the beginning, New Zealand is different from Saudi Arabia. And uh, picking up the technology or to transfer it to the Middle East or to the Saudi itself is not work. So we have to work in our local breed. And using advance of DNA technology, improvement, our local breed using the, 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 the softwares, uh, data, data collections, educate the farmer, if in we need to selecting the, the, the genetics uh, for the sheep or for livestock which have high producing like growth meat or body weight. So, so Saudi's demonstrating proactive leadership around this. Yep. I think we've got another picture here of, of some of the sheep. Um, proactive leadership in an area to improve domestic yeah. farm systems and food production. This in the behind of the mm -hmm. us is our breed is called Najdi with the white and black hair. Mm -hmm. And also we have uh, an Aimi with the, with the brown head and horn. Uh, uh, we have also Harri and Rufaidi, which is in south of Saudi Arabia. And we need to deform this breed for increasing our self-efficiency. Self-sufficiency. What did you learn about, obviously, very different breeds? Um, you mentioned you can't just take what you did in New Zealand and just take it to Saudi Arabia. So what, what are you changing? How are you helping them? moving forward yeah I, I think um, that it's it's we see challenges in, in, the, in, in the in the environment the climate and we we see uh, the sheep which are purebred which is a different way of farming in, to New Zealand where we do a lot of crossbreeding and we, we would not apply that uh, to mm -hmm. the Middle East mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the one of the biggest challenges is behavior change and, and that's the same in New Zealand as it is in, in many other parts of the world how do we encourage farmers who are very traditional people, they, they love their, their animals and they're very connected to the land and also very protective of the environment. How do we encourage them to adopt new practices like uh, data recording and using software um, and also coming to demonstration days where uh, Miwa has the opportunity to show them uh, in new practices. Um, that it's going to be, um, you know, a, a collaborative process uh, with farmers over time. And uh, but but having said that, you know, when we visited in 2019, uh, we were very encouraged by the interest that farmers from the north to the south uh, showed. They are very very keen, just like farmers are around the world, very keen to learn new practices and technologies uh, to improve their businesses and ultimately grow more food.
Saudi's very ambitious in its plans and its plans for growth. Do you see that trickling down all the way to the farmers? Are you seeing the farmers connecting and looking to learn this, wanting to take on these new practices, Mamdou? Yes, the farmer is interesting to, 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 to have the knowledge for new technology specialized for the data collections. Or even we try nowadays to, to, to establish our database for uh, genetic uh, improvement, development for our breed. Okay. Um, now, I have spent some time in New Zealand, I've spent some time in Saudi Arabia, yeah. but when I see my friends who are farmers in South Africa, they might be dairy farmers, but they say they're grass growers. So, um, what it says here is that livestock productivity is 10% breeding and 90% feeding. So, you know, that is, maybe that's exaggerated from a point of view of a statement, but how do you see the whole productivity, the nutrition, and particularly when maybe you can do that in New Zealand itself, whereas when we go to Saudi Arabia, we need to import all of that food. What have you experienced, Charles? And then I'll come to, to Mamdou. That's right. So I think it would, it, again, it's naive to think that farming uh, has only one pillar. <laughs> um, you know, and while at Abacus Bio we're um, very fond of the application of genetics in, in both um, plant and animal supply chains, it's, it's not the be, be all and end all. Um, animal health, um, farm management practices, but also feeding are absolutely essential uh, to be able to turn um, you know, a, a farming system into, into one that's uh, profitable and sustainable. Um, so I think that, um, that that's something that we we really want to emphasise if, if we uh, go to Saudi Arabia and, and work with farmers that it's it, there's not just one string to the bow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so getting the feed into Saudi Arabia is a stick. Is that part of your job as well, or have we got somebody else that's helping with the logistics that we've heard all day are a challenge? I think. Uh, we have Dr. Suleiman here. <laughs> it's his job. About, yeah, <laughs> he's talking about, and also we have a good practice in Saudi Gap in um, uh, animal welfare, human treatment, and water uh, safer resources. Okay. Um, with the big difference in advancement of genetics in some countries, there's mm -hmm. an opportunity to better utilize them. What's the future? What are you seeing? Abacus Bio, you're obviously is very focused on what they can do now, but they're, I'm sure they're spending most of their time, time thinking about the future. Great successes in New Zealand so far. What's the future hold for genetics and livestock and productivity? Yes. I think um, th there's one prerequisite that we always need, and that's data. Um, particularly around uh, new technologies like genomics, which is a type of DNA technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very exciting and it is very new, but there are prerequisites to, to many technologies, including you know, robotics and artificial intelligence and things like that. So um, as, as we work around the world, um, we know that uh, we, we have to support uh, our collaborators in collecting data. Uh, we've taken a bold step to provide software platforms uh, to be able to do that in very remote locations in multiple languages and it's our hope that uh, in terms of building that resource, that database, that in time uh, places like Saudi Arabia will be able to really leverage uh, things like genomics. I think genomics has been um, exceptionally powerful in industries like the dairy industry but they've had the benefit of decades of data recording right. and the um, changes that they've seen in, in productivity and efficiency and product are absolutely undeniable. But it takes time to get to those points. It comes back down to that, that old saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, and so getting to that point of measurement. Um, Mamdu, you're going to have the resources in Saudi Arabia to make sure that the farmers get the technology. So it's more of a... Of a um, knowledge share or a behavior change, as you say, to get them to use the technology, would you say? Yes. MIWA nowadays supporting the farmer to, to transfer the, the knowledge with the, doing many workshop or through the media. And uh, if in, uh, we have uh, uh, what is called uh, 
app and you can use the mobile, ask them, then you show them the situation of the livestock or something. Okay. And then after that, the, 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 the doctor behind of the phones, we will answer them what the situation and what the, the, the problem and Great. what the solution of this. Slightly off topic, but Charles, I'm going to ask you this curveball question. The rest of the world doesn't necessarily have the same resources and connectivity for farmers to have access. How far have we got to go to make sure that what you're doing in New Zealand and what you're greatly doing in, in um, Saudi Arabia can actually be worldwide? Um, that's a really good question, and, and I think that's why we're all here, is to figure out how we transfer this technology to, to more places than, than being homegrown in New Zealand, for example. I mean, there's lots of great technologies out there. Um, we're a relatively small organisation, but I, I know that we have the backing of many other organisations in New Zealand, and I, and I guess that's uh, why we're here. We're reaching out, uh, wanting to share our, our technologies and our ways of doing things uh, to you know, produce more food and, and make food more sustainable. Fantastic. It's a great... Uh, part of Expo, just being able to hear and learn from each other. It's been one of those things in each coffee break and lunch break that people are saying to me, okay, I need to go and speak to, to this person or I need to be able to get some time with this person to learn um, from them directly. What would be your biggest takeaway? Everybody's kind of like here because they're passionate about the topic. They're passionate about feeding 10 billion people by 2050 and figuring out how we do that sustainably in our own countries. Um, what would be your biggest takeaway now, Mamdu, to, to the audience, to everybody's here, to people that are listening, listening virtually? What do you think they should go away and do? Uh, I think which happened in 2020, lockdown by COVID-19, mm -hmm. It's make the, the country thinking about self-sufficiency. So we, we, we try to have a, a self-efficiency for the future. And we need to feed our people. We need to uh, save our resources. So in this case, we have to collaborate with the people to get them experience and mm -hmm. transfer them knowledge to our country to have the, 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 the security safety. I love your, when we were talking backstage as well, just your hunger for knowledge from other people that have been there already. Yeah. And all right, COVID-19 maybe gave us all a little bit of a wake up call yeah. that we needed to do it faster than maybe we had originally planned. Yeah. But as usual, real speed of uh, an agility to actually <laughs> go out there and find the right support and collaboration to help. What would be your final takeaway for everybody here, Charles? How, how can we all contribute? What do we need to do? What do we need to, to yeah. contribute? What do, we, what do people here need to do? What does the business need to do? What does science need to do? What does government need to do? Yeah, yeah. so uh, certainly collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, uh, as I said before, um, you know, there are a bunch of technologies out there which are, which are transforming um, food production around the world. Um, in some cases, you know, probably in the more sophisticated supply chains around the world and, and not necessarily in terms of, of feeding 10 billion people. Mm -hmm. So we have to find ways of uh, getting that technology, you know, out and down to, to the farmers, those who are actually growing the food, um, have conversations directly with them and understand what's going to work and what's not going to work. I think, I think that's a big takeaway uh, that we've experienced uh, at home and, and around the world. I, I think that's fantastic because uh, there's so many countries represented here and this is the great forum to go out and find out what's really happening in your country. But then I love it, actually go one step further and go out and meet the farmers <laughs> in those countries and understand what works yeah. for them and what doesn't. Yeah. Well, we've, order... we've, and we, we do practice what we preach. I mean, we, we have been in India and Tanzania and Ethiopia and we hope to work in Saudi Arabia also um, and you know we th there is differences being made and, and again I just emphasize the, Im the importance of, of data collection which which helps us identify um, animals or genetics that do perform differently to others mm -hmm. and then we need to exploit those animals how do we how do we increase the frequency of the uh, attributes that they have that meet a market um, and, and hopefully uh, sustainably provide food. 
And do in a way that helps you maintain the same levels of food output, perhaps, but without the same numbers of livestock. More um, with less. Yeah. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and insights this afternoon. I'm going to ask you, give them a round of applause for coming here and sharing their insights. Thank you very much, Ma'am Du. Thank you. I am going to stay on stage while you do that for me. Thank you so much. Well done. Brilliant. And I'm going to introduce you to another uh, keynote speaker. Uh, interesting fun fact. Just going to make sure I've got your attention now. Fun fact. So I'm going to invite in a moment Dr. Elizabeth Jacobs. She's the Global General Manager for Animal Management at Gallagher, um, which is a farm technology company. You probably all know that. I didn't know that. Fun fact, they were the first people that developed the electric fence in the world. So it started with their founder, um, who's in his 80s now. They discovered that. I'm sure many farmers have used that technology since. Um, she is the chief executive, drives the Gallagher business, which aims to deliver smarter solutions that make farm life easier, more sustainable, and more profitable. Um, I'm sure every farmer would like that. So if you could put your hands together now uh, and welcome her on stage, Dr. Elizabeth. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as Hazel mentioned, I'm Lisbeth Jacobs. I'm the Global General Manager for Gallagher Animal Management, and um, she already stole my thunder. Yes, indeed, we developed the first electric fence um, a long time ago, so we've been around for 84 years, years now. So um, over that time, uh, we have become global leaders in animal management uh, technology. And uh, we, we are now really recognized um, and used all over the world. So from the grasslands in Greenland, you can find our energizers to the prairies in North America, um, to the green pastures of Australia and New Zealand. Very proud to be present in all those different places. Um, as a farming innovation uh, company, we've transformed ourselves over those years through the many product and service innovations. Um, and I, I, I think I can say that we are now one of the more advanced uh, players in the field, advanced in animal grazing management, um, also on-farm productivity, as Hazel mentioned. Environmental integrity is very important for us, and also animal well-being. Let's not forget animal well-being. Um, so innovations in data-driven precision farming technology now make it possible to care for each of your animals individually. So knowing its health, um, knowing its well-being, but also knowing its whereabouts. And you can do all of that whilst um, allowing the animal to live in an almost free-range environment. And that's also what I'll be showing today. So we believe that um, precision farming will change the face of li livestock production in the world, um, because it will actually give the farmer the control, the fingertip control, um, to manage these individual animals in real time. First of all, I would like to have a look at some of the megatrends um, that are currently shaping our industry. And so we as a company, as a team, uh, we identified five key megatrends that we cannot influence directly ourselves, but we can actually choose how we respond to them. Um, and we wish to uh, respond to them in a way that improves lives, that protects the natural environment, and that also strengthens our agricultural industry. So the first one, we've called that um, digital data, omni-channel, and subscriptions. And so this trend is about the digitization of literally everything. 
So digitization gives people the insights um, that they need to make more data-driven decisions, which we ultimately believe will, um, will lead to uh, us to live and play and work uh, better. So just think about what you do when you see on your smartwatch, not that I have one, but if you see on your smartwatch in the evening that you haven't quite done your steps, your step goal for the day, you might actually go for a walk after dinner, which you might not have bothered doing if you didn't have that data at your, um, on your wrist. And so the same thing is happening in agriculture where data, the, the, the data that we're delivering to our farmers uh, is helping the, to make them, uh, for them to make better decisions. Digitization for us also means that our uh, consumers or customers um, they really expect products and services to be, to be available across multiple channels at the same time. So that's from physical stores to, to e-commerce to in-app purchases, and that's also something that is shaping our world. And then finally, we're also seeing that digitally enabled companies are more and more moving from asset ownership business models um, to more subscription-based business models. Um, and that is also, I mean, we all know Spotify, so why would you buy a CD if you can access the whole library of Spotify for the same monthly fee? This is also starting to play out in the, um, in the agricultural sector. So let's move to the, to the second um, megatrend. If I can bring it up. There we go. We've called that one uh, consumer connection and traceability. So increasingly, I think we all know that consumers care about provenance. They want natural food, they want sustainably um, manufactured food, they want responsibly sourced foods. And so to give consumers that confidence, farmers and producers will actually need to be able to offer traceability. And traceability right back to the source. It's clear that that will affect us uh, in the agricultural sector as well. The third environmental, um, the, th the third megatrend, and I already said it, as it's obviously the environment, uh, the environmental concerns that, that we all share. Um, so with each passing year, we see the impact of accelerating climate change. Um, becoming more evident. We have the greenhouse gases, we have the preservation of water, deforestation. And so all of these are very high on the agenda of the regulators, but also of the consumers. And all industry segments will need to respond, including uh, the agricultural sector. So we need to adjust, we need to respond. Fourth one, again, no surprise, we've been talking about it all day. I think it's the producing more for less. Um, the world's growing population, but also the increased strain um, that we're putting on our natural resources will see us, um, see us have to produce more for less. And this means we need innovation to drive that productivity, and we need more efficient use of all resources, actually. So that's land, that's water, that's energy, materials, um, nutrients, but also labor. And then the last one, uh, we've called that one geopolitical shifts. So I think we all know, uh, we've all lived um, through this world of the last years, there's been massive geopolitical shifts taking shape around us. So we've seen Brexit, we've seen the Trump presidency, we've seen increased tensions between the USA and China, and all of that is actually uh, leading to increased sentiments on nationalism and protectionism. Um, and that also then translates into increasing tariffs, into legislative challenges. We've seen supply chain disruptions, and that has been exacerbated by COVID. Um, so, and on top of that, we see, or maybe a result of that, we see this stronger buy local mindset appearing uh, with our consumers. So these are the five, um, the five trends that we work to, that we aim to respond to as, as a company. Um, but the question is, so how can the farming technology um, sector address some of these megatrends? And what does the future of farming actually look like, according to us? Well, firstly, um, we are convinced that the future is connected. So with an increasing number of internet-connected sensors, 
that are operating within a farming environment already today. There's this gluttony of data that's available to all of the farmers. And so how do we make it easy for farmers to make sense of that, what I would call a tidal wave of information? So turning that data into insights that drive better decisions. And for us, connecting all of these data points is actually key. And so Gallagher's new frontier is to bring all of that information together in a single dashboard easily accessible, as you can see, either on an iPhone or on a laptop, to give farmers the insights they need. So just imagine um, that we can integrate an animal's feed intake with its condition score, with its movement history, with its weight gain, and then predict when an individual animal is actually ready or when it's the optimal time for the animal uh, to be sent for processing. And then, then imagine that post-processing, we can retrospectively analyze the quality to ensure that right breeding decisions are made for future animal production and that we can cut out waste where we identified waste to, re to just produce more for less. So imagine all of this control enabled by an app available to every farmer. And now imagine at the other end, um, a shopper in the supermarket looking to purchase a quality cut of beef for dinner. Um, and on the packages, packaging, you can find a QR code with a link to the provenance of the animal, its breed, where it was farmed, that it was grass-fed, that it had no growth hormones or antibiotics uh, administered to it and trustworthy information that really will tell a shopper that the animal has lived a healthy life. And all of that is enabled by data and by digital technology. And so for us, the future is powered by that connected data. And the great thing is that for us, it's not the future. Um, the technology is actually available today and Gallery is working very hard, as are many others, uh, to pull all of this together. The future is also wearable. So for hundreds of years, uh, farmers have used on animal technology, and that goes back to the bells on goats and cattle, uh, to the more modern practice of visual and electronic ear tags and the health colors that we, that we see now. The difference now is that the on animal technology is becoming very smart. It is becoming connected, and, and that can add so much more value uh, to the farmers through the collection of that data and its real-time analysis that gets fed back to the farmer. And so eShepherd um, is a great example of that. It's like each of your animals is wearing a smartwatch. And um, so you can imagine not having any fences on your farms, but it's the smartwatch on your animal that is actually telling the animal exactly where the pasture boundaries are, where it can go, and where it cannot go. So it's like having a shepherd for each individual animal. And the, the shepherd monitors where the animal can graze, but it also monitors its health in real time. And it will alert you much faster than you can do now if anything is amiss. And so now I would like to show you um, a small video that will help put some context um, around that vision and around the eShepherd product. So eShepherd is a virtual fencing technology that the animal wears. So basically the animal walks towards a GPS drawn line, they'll receive a tone. If they don't respond to the tone, they'll move forward um, and they'll receive a pulse and the pulse will turn them around. As they track back to the inclusion zone, they will receive no stimuli. eShepherd helps farmers by allowing them a more strategic way to be able to graze their farm. So it allows them to basically not have internal fencing and to use a product that allows them to change their paddocks to suit them. It also is a product that allows them the ability to utilise their feed and change their grazing management program to suit them how they want it to work. There's also another great feature with the eShepherd neckband is the GPS tracking. It allows a farmer to go to their computer and be able to see where their cattle are at all times in their paddock. Now the neckband is fitted with a solar panel either side, a built-in compass, electrodes here on the bottom which will deliver the pulse and a built-in speaker which will give us our tone. Something else that the eShepherd system is really great for is riparian management. 
keeping those cattle out of those protected waterways at all times. We think the benefits of East Shepherd are particularly around the grazing of the animals, so increasing our grazing intensity, tracking where the animals, animal behaviour and where the animals are grazing at any one time, and also the potential to track a stray animal. The East Shepherd system is great for feed utilisation, grazing systems, time saving and water management. We see some exciting potential of East Shepherd in the wet season, which traditionally for us occurs in summer. Our grass begins to grow exponentially and it is really hard to keep the grazing intensity at a level and the frequency of moves at a level that will be of the most benefit for our grass and pasture growth. East Shepherd alleviates some of these problems and also the physical capability of us getting out into the paddocks in the wet season, it seems pretty exciting to be able to do this virtually. Another great feature of eShepherd is that it saves a farmer a lot of time. If a farmer is using a lot of electric fencing across their farm, uh, this takes away that time it takes to actually set up and pull down fencing all the time. They can do it all with a click of a button. So our, our purpose has always been to protect what matters most and we continue that uh, to today. So whether that's a, protecting a rancher's uh, cattle investment, providing healthy, nutritious food for the planet, um, or ensuring our land um, is protected for future generations. So we are actually very excited about the future that lies ahead of us and we invite you all to protect what matters most alongside us. Thank you. Again, everybody, if you could please kindly take your seats. We're about to begin. And this is the final part of our forum today, and it promises to be power packed, so you won't want to miss it. Please take a seat. We are about to begin. To start the final part of our forum today, we have a discussion spotlighting the role of smallholder farming across agricultural value chains. We will have a speaker, and that will be followed by a panel discussion for which you will need your headsets. So please make sure that you have one for a translation from French into English or to Arabic. In a moment, we're going to hear from experts in the field, and they're going to debate how best to empower indigenous women farmers who have traditional knowledge, but also want to integrate their practices with modern technology. So how do they best do this? We will also assess the importance of equipping women-led farms with strategic and sustainable resources, helping them support further their families and eliminating poverty wherever we can. To explore the issues at hand and really set the tone for our discussion this afternoon, please welcome to the stage your moderator and your keynote speaker. She is Hindu Ibrahim. She is the coordinator of the Association of Pearl Women in Chad. Please welcome her. Hi, hi, hi everyone. So I hope that you had a good coffee break because we are going to talk very soon here about the coffee produced by a small horde of farmers. So as she introduced me, my name is Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. I'm from Chad. I'm coming from a indigenous communities that call it Mbororo pastoralist communities. My people do not depend from the end of the month salary. They depend from the rainfall. They depend from the pastures. They move from one place to another one to found what and pasture for our cows. So imagine the agriculture for us, how it is so important. It's helped the community life and livelihood, but it's helped also the environment to be sustainable. Because in the Sahel, we all know how the climate change is impacting us and how the life of the people is becoming very complicated with the food insecurity. So, what we do to get adapt, mitigate, and have food as we are not going to the supermarket to buy any food there. We just rely on our traditional knowledge and we try to combine with the science knowledge 
to build a better strategy to get adapt and to have a food in our table every day. Like my grandmother, I used to say, she is the best application ever for me. She don't need any smartphone. Even if she need it, she don't have it at all because she don't have electricity, so she can't get access to the internet. But her best application is observing the nature. When she observes the birth migration, the cloud positions, the flowers of the trees, she can know if it's going to rain or not. And she can know if she has to move from one place to another one with her cows to get water and pastures. This is how our traditional knowledge can be the best application ever to produce a food for all of us. So in this note, we are going to have a fantastic panel who are going to join, to join us here. But please be sure to have your interpretations equipment. Get your headset, because the panel is going to be between French and English. Please help me to welcome my wonderful speakers here. I have Christine Chundu, who is the executive director of Sustainable Growers from Rwanda. Christine, you are welcome. My second speaker will be Mamadou Boy Ba, who is a president of Agro Pastoralist Cooperative for the Development of Guinea. Mamadou, welcome. And my final speaker will be Maria Del Pierre Alcarcon, who is the manager of Ella Esporta from Peru. Maria will be joining us virtually from Peru. And this is the beautiful of the technology who can help to see where are the smallholder farmers and what they are doing. As you just come back from your coffee break, let us hear from what the smallholder farmers are doing there. So, Mamadou, I'm going to start with you. Je suis très content de t'avoir avec moi ici, et ainsi que Christelle. Alors, du coup, je voudrais commencer par toi. Je sais que compte tenu de ton expertise dans ton organisation que tu as créée, est-ce que tu peux nous parler de l'agriculture paysanne Comment elle contribue à mitiger l'insécurité alimentaire et la faim dans la communauté euh, Merci. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi. Et je remercie d'abord euh, les organisateurs de ce grand événement. Et je suis Bama Madouboy, euh, président fondateur de la coopérative Kadeg, qui est une coopérative de production du café Arabica euh, en Guinée, et qui est créée depuis 2013. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, je suis très heureux de parler de cette coopérative à ce grand rendez-vous. Donc, euh, pour répondre à votre question, et les petits producteurs ont un grand rôle et un grand rôle, un rôle très 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 important. Surtout, et ces petits producteurs contribuent à l'employabilité des jeunes, contribuent à la lutte contre la pauvreté. Également, ils contribuent à la lutte contre, contre la famine et ils assurent la sécurité alimentaire. Quand je prends l'exemple de chez nous en Guinée, et les petits producteurs constituent et une valeur au niveau de la croissance de l'économie. Et surtout, il valorise, il valorise vraiment les produits agricoles. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Alors, comme il valorise les produits agricoles, vous avez une coopérative qui s'appelle CADEC. Oui. Alors, du coup, je voudrais bien savoir, et si vous pouvez parler à l'audience, quelle a été la motivation de créer une coopérative agricole et qui combine aussi les femmes, les hommes, pour améliorer leur exploitation. Et la motivation, elle est simple. Et avant tout, moi, je suis un jeune Guinéen motivé et, et passionné de l'agriculture. Donc, depuis 2013, j'ai fait un constat que toute la production de café en Guinée est presque vendue dans les autres pays de la sous-région. Et ceci rajoute une valeur ajoutée. Et j'ai eu l'idée de fonder cette coopérative dans le but de, de, de contribuer à l'employabilité et à lutter contre la migration irrégulière, irrégulière des jeunes. 
et notamment euh, surtout de maîtriser la chaîne de valeur de la plantation euh, jusqu'à la tasse du consommateur final. Et, et alors, si vous parlez des chaînes de valeur, pour moi, je trouve qu'il est très intéressant parce qu'on parle là de l'aspect économique et l'économie circulaire. Mais comment l'investissement dans l'air petite agriculture pourrait avoir l'éducation financière et pourrait aussi produire des financements pour cette communauté et au-delà Bon, ici, à ce niveau, eh, si je prends l'exemple au niveau de notre coopérative, Déjà, il y a la coopérative, elle est, elle est spécialisée en tout ce qui est production. Et après, j'ai eu l'idée de, de créer aussi une entreprise qu'on appelle Café du Fouta, qui est spécialisée dans la transformation, dans le but de maîtriser la chaîne de valeur. Donc, nous travaillons avec des, des femmes, avec 70% des femmes, des femmes paysannes. Donc, on, 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 on essaie de découler facilement leurs produits et en plus, on leur forme un retour. On les forme sur les différentes techniques de, 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 de plantation du café, sur les différentes techniques, sur les différentes techniques de torréfaction du café. Donc cela constitue un véritable, un, un, cela constitue, et voilà justement un, un, un véritable retour sur investissement. Mm -hmm. mm. En, en tout cas, merci beaucoup d'avoir nous partagé partager avec nous ça, mais ça, ça me renvoie tout de suite à, à Christine. Christine, tu as aussi une organisation, mais qui travaille avec les secteurs privés et qui travaille aussi avec les secteurs publics et qui aide les femmes à transformer leurs produits. Alors, peux-tu nous dire comment cette transformation peut se faire au niveau national et au niveau régional Euh, je m'appelle Christine, euh, je représente une organisation qui s'appelle Sustainable Growers. Euh, Sustainable Growers, c'est une organisation qui est basée au Rwanda, mais qui a sa présence euh, au Congo et en Tanzanie. Et voilà ce que nous faisons. Euh, nous formons les femmes et euh, leurs familles, euh, et nous sommes dans le secteur du café. Et ce que nous faisons euh, spécifiquement, c'est que nous formons les femmes... Euh, euh, comment est-ce que je vais dire ça Mais euh, à, à vraiment euh, exploiter les cafés euh, qu'elles produisent et à être présente dans toute la chaîne de valeur. Euh, comme vous le saviez, euh, les cafés en anglais, on dit toujours que c'est un, un cash crop. Donc c'est un produit qui apporte plus d'argent. Et c'est un produit euh, qui est toujours managé par euh, nos chefs de famille, nos hommes, nos frères. Euh, nos maris. Euh, alors, euh, nous, spécifiquement au Rwanda, euh, donc, euh, on a que 20 à 30 de femmes qui sont vraiment euh, dans ce qu'on appelle euh, le trading, comme euh, ils peuvent aller euh, donc, euh, sur euh, la chaîne de valeur et transformer leur café et vendre vraiment leur café en tant que la belle de femme. Euh, alors, voilà, donc, euh, voilà ce qu'on fait. Euh, To come up to your question, euh, je pense euh, 70% de la population rwandaise, hein, donc, euh, elle fait l'agriculture. Donc, et la plupart, euh, c'est les petits producteurs. Et avec ces petits producteurs, ce que nous faisons, donc, euh, et les, normalement, les femmes, et almost, presque toute la population, c'est les petits producteurs qui sont que les femmes. Et nous savons tous que les femmes sont au centre de la famille, de la communauté, euh, au centre du tout, je vais dire. Et en formant les femmes, donc en faisant participer la femme euh, dans tout ce qui est, euh, voilà, dans, dans tout ce qui est organisation, dans tout ce qui est euh, business, et spécialement dans les cafés, euh, puisque la femme, donc tous les travaux qui se font au champ, donc c'est fait par les femmes. Mais s'il s'agit qu'elle apporte son produit euh, dans le milieu commercial, elle est vraiment invisible. Hein? Mm -hmm. Et tout le monde dit mm -hmm. toujours, non, elle est marginalisée au franchise, bla bla bla, mais euh, elle est vraiment présente là. Euh, il suffit juste de lui donner euh, cette opportunité-là, mm -hmm. l'accès. Euh, Alors, euh, accès, est-ce que, est que juste tu peux nous donner un, un ou deux exemples Comment vous aidez les femmes à travailler avec les secteurs privés Avec quel secteur privé Comment ça s'est fait 
Voilà, merci pour la question. Donc, euh, les femmes qui travaillent avec nous, donc on travaille en partenariat avec les secteurs privés, avec les gouvernements, puisqu'on nous croit toujours que euh, seul on n'y perd rien. Il faut, faut qu'il y ait un partenariat là. Et les femmes, ils ont accès euh, à ce qu'on appelle dans les secteurs café, euh, euh, je ne sais pas comment je vais dire ça en français, mais on appelle ça processing plant. Donc, elles ont accès à ça aux stations de lavage. Et puis après, euh, donc, euh, ils arrivent aussi à voir, euh, euh, donc c'est leurs propres usines où ils peuvent euh, faire la procession du café et amener leur propre café au marché. Donc, on travaille avec les hôtels de luxe au Rwanda. Mm -hmm. euh, on travaille aussi avec euh, euh, les compagnies aériennes. Donc, euh, tout le monde qui est ici, si vous buvez le café euh, dans Rwanda, si vous voyagez avec Rwanda, le café qui est servi à Rwanda, c'est le café de femmes avec qui on travaille. Ah ouais, euh, si vous allez euh, dans les hôtels, je sais qu'il y a euh, Marriott, euh, Kigali, le Grand Brand à Kigali, donc tous avec les parcs. Euh, donc, euh, quand vous allez dans les hôtels, les, 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 les hôtels de luxe, euh, les restaurants, les grands restaurants et les compagnies aériennes, euh, vous allez trouver les cafés de nos femmes. Donc, mm -hmm. on a aussi un centre d'éducation que j'ai oublié de dire. Donc, euh, pour, faire, pour que la femme soit vraiment présente dans toute cette chaîne de valeur là, donc mm -hmm. elle est vraiment visible. On a une entreprise sociale où il y a un café que nous avons. Mm -hmm. Nous donnons aussi l'opportunité euh, à la fille. Euh, donc, euh, dans les langages du café, on les appelle euh, le barista. Donc, on a une académie où on forme euh, les jeunes femmes euh, pour pouvoir bien servir et, et connaître les cafés à fond. Donc, euh, on donne des formations sur euh, ce qu'on appelle la préparation brewing et puis euh, torréfier euh, et aussi euh, donc, euh, le testing. Comme ça, euh, puisqu'on croit toujours que euh, dans les cafés, derrière une, café de café, une tasse de café, il y a toujours toute une histoire. Exactement. Ah oui. Derrière une tasse de café, il y a toujours une histoire. Et c'est l'histoire d'une femme, une femme qui est dans les communautés très loin que vous ne connaissez pas. Et je pense que c'est ça qu qui est aussi important dans tout ce que vous êtes en train de dire. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Christine, for uh, the great work that you are doing with the women, especially the smallholders. But uh, let us move to the virtual speakers here, uh, Maria del Pilar. So Maria is joining us from Peru. And uh, Maria, may you just uh, tell us from your experience living and working with the smallholder uh, farmers there, how does investing in their agriculture, financial and educational needs help them to achieve their full potential? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation here. Well, uh, the gender uh, equality is on the public agenda of our country, and that is why uh, we have in Peru a national policy of gender equality. And uh, in the foreign trade sector, we are firmly committed to contributing to the economic and social development of, of women entrepreneurs. And uh, we also know that gender equity is a powerful tool to support the productivity and competitiveness of companies. From Peru, as uh, the government agency that promotes export, has a division that is focused on exporter development, which main objective is to build and strengthen the soft and technical capacities of uh, organizations and companies, you know, giving support on their way towards the internationalization. We work with different sectors. We work with associations and growers cooperative. As an example, I can mention the coffee value change. Uh, in former times, we did a diagnosis to identify the gaps and training needs. And based on the result of this diagnosis, we formulated a tailor May program providing uh, training to improve aspects such as quality, certifications, business management, risk and future markets, environmental footprints, negotiations, and others. And with this training package, uh, they are ready to participate in different specialized fairs where uh, they, especially uh, women, negotiate with important buyers. And uh, to participate in these trainings, we always ask organizations for a gender quota. 
it means uh, if, for example, the participant is a man, we also ask for the participation of a woman. And in that way, we ensure the empowerment of women within organizations. Thank you, uh, Maria. But uh, when you say uh, that you empower women for the participations, but may you tell us how opening this new opportunity of women small holders that can enable them to get a economic grow on their own communities? Well, um, we, I will talk from my experience now during uh, mm -hmm. my visits to the farms. Uh, I periodically make you know, the work of the women farmers uh, were always focused on taking care of the house, the children, and bringing food to workers into the farm. You no, know? mm -hmm. while it was the man who was in charge of the business without involving the wife. You no, know? so during our our trip, we always try to talk to to them and say why is in that way. You no, know? so why? you don't enter to the business. No? So we consider that now it is changing. No? We started to work on women uh, empowerment through the coaching in aspects of communications, leaderships and other. No? So our main purpose was that they both, men and women, can work together, now separately. So they need to learn how to discuss in benefit of the family, and on the other hand, uh, take advantage of women's criteria and their abilities oh, to have better incomes since they take care of mm -hmm. money, you know, prioritize expenses, uh, encourage savings, and also think of the common good. Mm -hmm. no, but also we have other type of women no, that they uh, wants to work by themselves and wants to contribute with income in their home uh, to give their children better nutrition and support them in their study. That uh, is why they started to associate with other women and started new ventures. You know? So today we have a lot of uh, women's organizations that, for example, make chocolates, make jam, make uh, roasted coffee. Um, in this point, it's important also uh, to mention that technology and innovation play a fundamental role in gender equity by allowing access and inclusion of, uh, of women. No? Um, we have uh, women in the coffee value chains, for example, that demonstrate their work by making promotion of reforestation. No? Uh, uh -huh. They are very strict with quality control maintaining the consistency in the caps, no? which is essential to stay in the market. So, and they promote also the use of uh, special coffee varieties and also a special process like this uh, honey coffee. No? And all of this has generated an increase in sales, no? as well as dealer relations with producers avoiding intermediaries and making the value change uh, short. Thank, thank you, Maria. I think you three have one on comment that you can produce a sustainable market without including the women, and this is really very important. Women in center in order to transform all the economy. I just wanted to give chance to the audience because I know all the sessions are very short, like there is no interaction, but if there is someone who wanted to give a questions or comment, I will be very happy to just to get you involved in this particular panel. So just to, if you wanted to say something, be ready to say. By the time, I just wanted to go back to my panelists for a quick questions and then be ready to come. If there is anyone, it will be really very important because this is also how the communities work. We work all together in circle. We are not just here to give information. Mamadou, je vais revenir à toi. Alors, tu nous as parlé de la coopérative qui 
à des produits non seulement au niveau local ou au niveau national. Oui. Vous les transportez aussi au niveau euh, régional, en dehors de la Guinée. Alors, comment ça se passe Parce qu'on sait très bien que les petits agriculteurs, ils n'ont pas cette capacité d'accéder à ces marchés en dehors de chez eux. Comment vous avez créé cette plateforme qui les aide à exporter et à fixer les prix et Justement, comme l'a dit Mme Christine, et derrière une tasse de café se cache une très bonne histoire. Et nous, notre café en Guinée a une très belle histoire. Ce café Arabica a permis à la consommation du café pendant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, ce que beaucoup de personnes ne savent pas. Et en Guinée, nous avons la chance d'avoir deux types de café et dans deux localités différentes. Le Arabica, qui est sur une altitude très élevée, et vous avez le café Robusta aussi qui est en basse altitude et en Guinée forestière. Donc c'est cette motivation qui m'a poussé à créer cette coopérative euh, du nom de Cadec. Donc euh, et toute la production a été vendue dans les autres pays sans aucun retour, avec un prix très, 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 très petit. Donc aujourd'hui l'idée c'est quoi C'est vraiment maîtriser la chaîne de valeur, concentrer la production pour qu'elle soit vraiment local et pour que les groupements de femmes soient euh, structurés afin d'avoir un bénéfice sur, sur leurs produits. Très bien, je ne savais pas que la Guinée hein, peut produire du café et surtout des jars de café à basse altitude et à haute altitude arabica. Donc l'audience sait très bien maintenant de quoi Merci. on est en train de parler et que c'est les communautés qui le font. Uh, Christine, you can also respond in English if you feel uh, better uh, in English as you wish. Uh, vous avez fait du label pour les femmes. Et ça, c'est très important parce que les labels pour les femmes permettent d'avoir la représentation de la femme dans toute la chaîne. La production, la transformation jusqu'à la consommation. Comment vous avez organisé ce marketing vu que les femmes sont d'abord au niveau local, au niveau communautaire Oh, merci pour la question. Oh, ce qu'on avait fait, donc on a formé la femme. Uh, we always say it's in English that uh, we mm -hmm. provide training C to C, uh, and just making sure that uh, women they understanding all the parts at the farm level. Uh, les techniques uh, au niveau uh, de la uh, de la plantation, mais aussi uh, nous donnons des formations à ce que. Uh, qu'elle ait une idée de tout ce, que, de tout ce qui est euh, dégustation, je vais dire. Mm -hmm. Et aussi, euh, donc, euh, quand elle est vraiment à mesure euh, de savoir ce qu'elle a dans la tasse, euh, quel genre de café, quel genre de profil euh, du café qu'elle produise. Et à la fin, ça l'aide euh, à, you know, uh, she always there to sit uh, the burning, the bargaining tables, so she can discuss, uh, you know, uh, price with buyers, because our 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 role, our big role, it's to see her really, you know, understanding the whole value chain in coffee. Uh, so at the end of the day, I can say, I can critically say today that, uh, you know. They understand all the stock exchange markets, mm -hmm. so uh, they know uh, how to set the price. Uh, they really understand what is in their contracts, and then they really understand when we are saying uh, we are selling single origin. Uh, so mm -hmm. the single origin has their own brand uh, and their own story. So you can do the traceability. Mm -hmm. of, you know the whole step yeah so that's what I can say thank you so I think we really need the traceability as we are talking also not just about the food but we are talking about the food that respecting the nature the food that we have the history putting the peoples in the center and this make completely sense and I understand what you are feeling as coming from a pastoral community who have the milk and the meat so uh, Maria uh, I know that from uh, Ella Exporters, you have the initiative that uh, aim to uh, enlightenment. So may you just uh, talk to us how it's helped you to reach the SDGs, especially the SDG 1 on no poverty and SDG 2, zero hunger. Well, uh, we realized that there was a small participation of women entrepreneurs from Peru's programs, and for this reason, we create a program only for women that is Ella Exporta. 
the program was created in uh, 2017. No, and well, today we had a benefit to 100 women. No? Uh, well, we are really convinced that the economic empowerment of women is a mechanism to reduce rate of violence, reduce poverty uh, rates, and achieve important contributions to the economy. No? So that this is the reason why we are following with the program. No? And uh, with this program, women in general obtain information of global markets and trends and both you know, information and knowledge are the most important assets that um, they can have to foster the value change without neglecting the home, food and nutrition of their, their children. So that's why we can say that um, we are contributing with the uh, objective, the goals, uh, uh, no? So mm -hmm. a success mm -hmm. history, I can tell in the coffee value change, no, has been our uh, participant, uh, Esperanza Dionisio. No, she's a woman who is the general manager of one uh, important company uh, cooperative in Peru, is Pangoa, Pangoa Coffee Farmers Cooperative. And she has won the sustainable champion no, in the, uh, this specialized uh, fair, maybe you know, the Specialty Coffee Association of America in the United States. No? And well, this award represents the efforts of the coffee growers of uh, her cooperative. No? So why is uh, uh, for us, for example, no, uh, is a success history? Because she led Pangoa to accomplish all their goals such as composting and recycling programs, rebuild of the processing plant, and most recently, uh, bird certifications and a massive reforestation project. No? So uh, she's an inspiration, not only for girls and women interested in coffee, no, but to the entire specialty coffee industry in Peru. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. We know that from a champion, we can really change uh, not only one community, but we can change also the consumptions of so many outside of the one community that producing it. So is it anyone that wanted to jump in our discussions from the audience? Just like take your hand up and then they pass you the mic. Anyone? who is interesting to jump in our discussions. At least I tried. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, if there's no one, I know that we are tight in time, but I want to just to give you the chance. What, Mamadou, qu'est-ce que toi tu veux que l'audience ici prend pour rentrer avec? Qu'est-ce qu'ils vont prendre de toi? Bon, moi, je pense que c'est attirer l'attention de, des différentes institutions qui sont impliquées dans euh, la réduction, dans, dans, dans le réchauffement climatique. Parce qu'en Guinée, on est affecté vraiment par, par le changement climatique. Donc aujourd'hui, c'est de lancer un appel aux institutions qui vont aider dans ce sens afin d'accompagner les petits producteurs à vraiment maîtriser l'eau et à maîtriser, à mettre en place tout ce qui est système d'irrigation goutte à goutte et à vraiment avoir de l'eau pour les différentes plantations. Et vraiment de, de renforcer aussi les petits producteurs tout en les outillant avec, euh, avec des équipements. Parce que sans les équipements, sans les moyens financiers, euh, nous les petits producteurs, on ne pourra pas, on pourra pas euh, subvenir à notre besoin. Merci beaucoup, Mamadou. Lutte contre le changement climatique, sans les réponses, on ne peut pas avoir l'agriculture durable. Merci. Merci. Uh, Christine, may you just take, uh, tell us what do you want to give the audience as takeaway from this panel? Oui, ce que je vais dire, c'est juste, donc, il faut toujours un partenariat. Donc, seul, comme personne, on ne paie rien. Donc, et nous, on croit toujours que donc, euh, comme moi, je travaille pour une ONG, une organisation non gouvernementale. Avec l'organisation non gouvernementale, c'est très difficile de scale les programmes. Mm -hmm. Mais quand vous engagez euh, le gouvernement, euh, euh, 
et aussi euh, la société publique et tout marche puisqu'on travaille ensemble euh, en équipe. Donc si je pense que c'est ce que j'aimerais euh, donner comme mon takeaway. Donc euh, quand il y a une collaboration d'ensemble et qu'on essaye euh, d'engager tout le monde et qu'on ne reste pas personne, euh, no one is left behind, mm -hmm. c'est toujours une bonne chose puisque euh, quand, euh, surtout avec le gouvernement, donc je tiens toujours à ce que tout ce qu'on fait dans un pays, il faut que le gouvernement euh, comprenne le projet. Mm -hmm accepte ça, puisque après, les projets ne sont pas là à durée indéterminée. Les projets sont toujours là à durée déterminée. Et quand le gouvernement, il comprend tout ce qui va se passer dans ces projets-là, les, euh, euh, les outcomes de ces projets-là, ils sont prêts à répliquer ça. Mm -hmm. Partenariat, et il est très important aussi de prendre le gouvernement dans tout ce qu'on est en train de faire et que le gouvernement prenne les responsabilités plutôt. Yes. Uh, Maria, what do you want as a takeaway? Uh, to this audience, please. Well, I think that we, we need to continue in women empowerment, not only to reduce the violence, no, but also to have better economies. I think it will be my message, my message for everybody and uh, most here in, in Peru to continue this important work. Thank you, thank you so much. Women empowerment is very important. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think in these panels, we really hear from all. I can't summarize, I can't give a keynote who can respect all what they said here. But I know that, and I learn also, in Guinea, they can produce two types of coffee. And in Guinea, they show us it is possible to come all together as cooperative and change the value. And we also hear that when you take a Rwanda air or you go to the Marriott in Rwanda, the coffee that you are drinking, be sure you know exactly it's coming from which part and which woman. She is there who is helping all the women to transform the coffee in all the partnership with this public and private sector. So it's really inspiring. And we know from Maria also in Peru how the women one champion can change the entire life of all the communities and how the company can work also to achieve the SDGs. We hear from all the 17 SDGs, partnership, uh, hunger or uh, poverty or also climate change and all about the land, etc. So it's very important to understand we can have a production for the billions of people that are coming without having any small holders that are producing a sustainable food to respect the nature and peoples in the centers. So thank you very much. Please join me to thank my panelists here and have a good next session. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, c'était très bien. The new normal, where we reimagined our offerings and reinvented our businesses, a world where change is the only constant and where speed and cooperation have accelerated exponential thinking, where the power to convene instantaneously and universally is reinforced by technology where collaboration is the foundation and where ease of access and seamless connectivity are the norm, where talent is recognized, achievement is celebrated, and business always has a seat at the table, where success lies in our ability to look at the bigger picture, where advancement is the only accepted mindset. And as we take a step forward, it's time to say, join us, make your mark. Welcome to the pioneers, the path definers and the game changers amongst us. Welcome to a place where business as usual is anything but. Welcome to Dubai. again and thank you, merci énormément to Hindu and her esteemed panel of guests for being with us this afternoon. 
To the excellencies and dignitaries who have just joined us, a very warm welcome. Thank you for being here with us at our forum today. We're delighted to see you. Speaking of which, it is my great pleasure to invite to the stage Her Excellency Mariam al Maheri. She is the UAE Minister of Climate Change and Environment, and she will deliver an important keynote address. Please give her a very warm Expo welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Wow, what a day it's been. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and really a pleasure to address you today. And I thank uh, Expo 2020 Dubai for organizing this food, agriculture, and livelihood business forum that highlights economic opportunities in the agri-food sector. The topic being discussed today is pressing in light of the challenges our food systems face particularly climate change that puts considerable pr pressure on our natural resources and aggravates extreme weather events that destroy crops. And everyone is experiencing this. We're looking, we're seeing more droughts, we're seeing more fires, it's, it's happening. So investing in the transformation of our food production systems into sustainable ones will make the sector resilient to climate change and ensure the world can feed its fast-growing population. Here in the UAE, a country that has limited water resources and an environment that doesn't exactly provide ideal conditions for agriculture, we need to turn to innovation and partnerships to help transform our food systems into more sustainable ones. A hot spot where you'll be able to find and see this in full swing is the Food Tech Valley. This is a groundbreaking agricultural project that is well under development in Dubai that aims to serve as a test bed for pioneering agricultural solutions. The Valley will be a global hub for startups, SMEs, and international companies with a wide range of expertise to exchange knowledge in the food industry and develop innovative ag tech solutions that will change the face of the sector. We encourage scientists, engineers, producers, investors, also youth and women from around the world to explore the immense potential our Food Tech Valley can offer to finding solutions to global challenges in our food systems. On the international front, we have teamed up with the United States of America, and I'm pleased that uh, Secretary Vilsack is here with us today, the US Secretary of Agriculture, to launch um, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, or known as aim for c or aim for climate in less than four months, so we uh, launched this in, at COP26, and in less than four months, we have worked together on this global coalition and movement, and we have been able to bring together 140 government and non-government partners so far. We all share a vision for making our food systems innovative, resilient, and ultimately sustainable through increasing investment in agriculture and R&D. We just came from the initiative's first ministerial meeting where government partners underscored their commitments to this noble mission and agreed on the priorities and plans for this year. We also announced an ambitious target to double the increased investments from 4 billion US dollars, which we have already uh, pledged in, at COP26, to 8 billion US dollars by the 27th UN Climate Change Conference in November this year. I take this opportunity to invite all of you who haven't joined this global movement to join Aim for Climate if you haven't already done so. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to being a known hub for food trade, the UAE seeks to also become a leading exporter of sustainable agricultural solutions for hot and arid climates. We are keen to share our experience with our partners and to work with other countries to address the critical challenges of our food systems. We see us basically as an open lab to innovate, discover, and put forward solutions. And to continue the conversation, I invite you to join us 
in the next few days for Food for Future Summit that will take place here at Expo on February 23rd and 24th. The event will bring together major players from across the food value chain. It is important we focus not only on food production, but we look at the entire food supply chain to discuss new solutions to our shared food security challenges. The transformation to sustainable food systems is an urgent task. We don't have a lot of time, and we each play an integral role in achieving the uh, aims that we have for transforming our food systems into more sustainable ones. So let's roll up our sleeves and help put the world back on track to meeting sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you. Perfectly setting the tone for our panel discussion. As Her Excellency outlined, we will be taking a deep dive into AIM, which is, of course, Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate. What exactly is it? What are we really trying to achieve and how quickly can we get there? Because as we just heard, time is against us. So let's roll up our sleeves and get the panel started. To steer the discussion, I'm delighted to be your moderator and I would like to invite to the stage Thomas he is the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Please give him a very warm welcome. Hello. It's lovely to meet you. And just to make sure that we get our step count back up today, Your Excellency, I'd like you to rejoin me as well, please. Please welcome her back. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Well, thank you also. Thank you also. Is there a in here? I think there might be. Uh, thank you for here and our esteemed panel. Of guests. I think I'm having some mic difficulties. If I could please have a handheld microphone. Um, in the meantime, I'll try not to move. I'll be a little AI robot here. Okay, I'll stay still. Um, we've heard, of course, congratulations on the announcement of AIM. Um, Minister, if I may come to you first. Um, help us really reconcile the marriage. Thank you so much. That's what I call great service in Dubai. Um, Marry for us the relationship between the UAE's focus on domestic agriculture, but also addressing climate change. Indivisible? Yes. So uh, I think it's really important for, for our, our listeners and uh, those of you here today to understand that um, food systems uh, are also a reason of why we have the issues we're facing uh, on, our, on our climate today. Food systems contribute to a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really important that we address, just as we're addressing the energy transformation, that we're also addressing this food systems transformation. And this is exactly why myself and my partner here, Secretary Vilsack, are, have put our heads together, our teams together to say we need to accelerate um, food systems transformation. And the only way to do that is really to have these conversations, to share knowledge, to, to have this kind of overarching platform so that, that partners can, can jump on and understand. I mean, we had a four-hour ministerial meeting today, and just listening to all our, our um, partners uh, sharing their ideas, what they're doing in their countries, has just enlightened us to do so much more. And um, so, we want you to understand that food systems is as important as the energy transformation, that food systems are 
are a challenge, but they are also a solution uh, for um, reducing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And it's really important that while we do this, we think of the, the over two billion people uh, whose livelihoods are directly connected to the food system sector. So we need to make our food systems more, more efficient. We need to decarbonize our food systems and we need to ensure the livelihoods of the people who are dependent on this sector. And this is exactly what aim for c is about. It's about coming together, and I was describing it to Secretary Vilsack, as a vehicle. So look at aim for c as a vehicle, and we as partners are jumping on this vehicle and putting turbo power on to accelerate what needs to be done in the transformation. Thank you, Your Excellency. Secretary Vilsack, um, you're nodding away, you're in complete agreement. We've got the analogy of this being a vehicle, a catalyst for change. Words like accelerating keep coming up, which brings me nicely to the sprints. Uh, we're going forward in motion. There are nine uh, sprints associated with this initiative, but what exactly are they? What does it mean? Well, first of all, let me take an opportunity to thank uh, the minister and her team for an extraordinary day. Uh, focused on the same for climate effort, uh, the, and certainly to uh, also congratulate Dubai on an amazing expo, uh, just an amazing, amazing place. Uh, you know, the sprint is a really important aspect of Aim for Climate, uh, because what it basically does is it basically says we want investments that are very specific, we want them ambitious, and we want to expedite innovation. We want you to basically invest in the future. Uh, it can be a government, it can be a non-government, it can be a partnership, it can be a combination, it could be non-profits. The, the goal here is to increase investment in innovation and to get it into the marketplace, to get it into the stream of commerce, to get it into the food system transformation that the minister just talked about. We started with eight innovation sprints and we heard reports today of, of uh, progress on a number of them already. Uh, and then today, we were able to announce a ninth innovation sprint. IBM is uh, working on a, uh, what they refer to as a sustainability accelerator. And we're excited about that because it's going to be focused on smallholder uh, farming operations uh, to really uh, allow them to understand their role as well and to use the technology, the expertise of IBM to assist them in making uh, sound decisions that are, that are consistent with climate smart agriculture. So, uh, tremendous opportunity for us, uh, and, and it's part of that multiple billion dollar investment that we hope to see uh, in, in all of this. Uh, Sprint, a very, very important part of it. Thank you. And you mentioned IBM. We will, of course, be hearing from them a little bit later on, so you don't want to go anywhere. Um, Minister, let me come back to you because um, speaking of coalitions, uh, we've got 140 partners players involved in, in this. Um, what exactly can we draw upon in terms of their experience, knowledge sharing? What is the most important thing for you to draw out of them? Okay, first of all, I think many people, and we've had this conversation also many times, many people may think, okay, what does the US and the UAE want to do in agriculture? I mean, the UAE is not known as an agriculture country. The thing that uh, brought us together is basically the whole idea of accelerating research and development when it comes to innovation. For those of you who are living in the UAE, I'm sure you've seen in the last few years uh, the emerging technology that has enabled us to produce foods we never thought we could produce before. So we're, we're producing berries and uh, we've got salmon, home, uh, locally grown salmon. Um, we've got quinoa, we've got salicornia. There are so many foods now coming up that we're seeing they can be sustainably grown in the UAE. And that's all because of technology and innovation. And this is what brought us together. You've got a, a, a huge agriculture country with a small food import dependent country coming together to solve a global challenge that we have and to solve this collectively and I think there needs to be much more of these kind of partnerships and so having these partners on board we're looking at not just government partners but also uh, international organizations and um, uh, non-profit organizations academia um, and 
and entrepreneurs, industry partners to actually come on board. There's so many things you can do from knowledge sharing, technology sharing, um, deploying kind of models that could be used in different parts of, of the world. And like I said, I mean, just the four hours I've had with, I think we had about 30 ministers giving statements today at the ministerial meeting. It's just been so enlightening to see the commitments coming from everybody and the kind of ideas we've already developed and we added one innovation sprint already just from the conversations. So this shows how much potential there is and there is a big need for us to drive this, this, this global movement. On top of the innovation sprints and also the doubling of investment, we also um, launched the Aim for C ideation and the whole idea of this is actually um, allowing the partners to host workshops, um, host uh, events that are under the umbrella of aim for c Again, the whole idea being let's share, let's talk, let's communicate, because this is the only way we can actually drive this accelerated motion. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up question. It's a four-hour meeting, more than 30 ministers in the room. <laughs> a sprint was already added. You say there's huge potential. Yes. Where do you see this going and how quickly? We've already, I think what's really important to make this initiative really move to the next level is that we put tangible outcomes, and this is also what, what we discussed. We already put some goals that by COP27, we want to have certain deliverables and moving then forward because COP26 started with the launch, COP27 will have deliverables and this will then move to the UAE as we're hosting uh, COP28 as well. So it's really important we look at the kind of deliverables. It's really important for uh, partners to see that we're not just looking at the high tech novelty uh, systems that we're looking also to assist on the low-tech side and also assist in developing countries to come up and step up because we're all at different levels and it's really important that for this global transformation we help each other. So uh, where this is going to go, I mean it could go to incredible, uh, incredible heights <laughs> I'd say here and, and for all of us, I mean what food brings us together and I think it's really important, and I think it's, we're very passionate about this, this subject. So. Yes, the sky is quite literally the limit. Secretary Vilsack, let me come to you. Um, I'm very nosy. I still want to know what was discussed in this meeting. You have to give me some insight. What was the most surprising thing that floated to the top? Well, I, I think what was surprising to me was how many countries are already engaged in this effort. Uh, and there's so much going on that you can sometimes feel overwhelmed. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to give some instruction and direction to our sprint partners. Instead of trying to cover the waterfront, we, we identified four key areas that we wanted them to focus on uh, in terms of the deliverables for COP27. We wanted to spend the uh, sprint projects on those small holder farmers uh, in low income and mid income uh, countries because they need to be part of this process. Uh, we wanted to, uh, our sprint partners to take a look at the emerging technologies, and that was uh, just amazing how many emerging technologies there are, nanotechnology, robotics, AI, digital, precision agriculture, sensors, drones, a tremendous capacity there. And we wanted to make sure that sprint partners were focused on that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we sp spent some time with methane. Uh, we had a, a very interesting uh, presentation from a methane hub. It's a, it's a group of philanthropies that have come together to make a major commitment at helping to reduce methane. Uh, and we know the, how significant that is in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think for me it was very surprising how significant it is and how much uh, we can immediately impact and affect our capacity to reduce the risk of climate change and that temperature increase uh, that we're facing through methane reduction. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that we spent some time with what is called agroecological research. It's really a, a fancy term for a circular economy, a regenerative agriculture. Uh, we want to make sure that we learn as much as we can and how we can incorporate that in Climate Smart. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, the single biggest thing, and I think the minister just uh, identified it, is the passion that was in the room. Uh, every single country is committed to this. Every single country is doing something about it. And every single country understands that, we, that they can't do it alone, that there has to be collaboration, there has to be cooperation, there has to be partnerships. 
Absolutely better altogether. Um, we're tight on time, unfortunately, but Secretary, let me come back to you for another question. Um, just to wrap things up, what has impressed you or what has sparked your curiosity since you've been on the ground in Dubai, meeting with ministers? We obviously are very passionate about agriculture here and sustainability and food security. What will you take home with you as a lesson from the UAE? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I think it's important uh, for the world to know the attitude and mentality of the people uh, here in Dubai. Uh, I've been schooled by the minister, my friend. Um, there is an innovative spirit here that I think uh, that all of us around the world should uh, emulate. Uh, there is a belief uh, in, in a better and brighter future uh, here's the most amazing thing. These folks have the audacity of creating a museum to the future. <laughs> now think about that. You know, when you think of museums, you think of places that celebrate past, history, static, right? You put an exhibit there, it doesn't change because it's from the past. These folks, they're gonna have a museum about the future. So every day, in a sense, that museum is going to have to update itself. I mean, that is an amazing undertaking. But I, said, I think it's, it says a lot about the people here. And I think, frankly, if we embrace that attitude globally, that there is no challenge, no, no significant problem that we face, and we face many, that we can't collaboratively and together solve. Thank you. Yes, it opens tomorrow, I believe. Yes. I hope you'll be in town to see it, but if not, we'll, we'll probably have one on the moon or Mars one day too, so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, Minister, let me come to you. Um, may I ask about your top priority for the next 12 months? And equally, what lessons can we take away from the United States in this regard? So top priority is to get more partners on board for aim for c uh, to continue the momentum we've already started, uh, we've got a lot to do going towards COP27 and then rolling on to COP28. Um, and I'm just really excited about this, this journey and uh, excited about uh, the new outcomes that will come from it. And I really hope that we can um, provide and offer a toolbox for our partners and for, for many countries around the world on how they can accelerate their efforts as well and scale up existing technologies, but also looking into new technologies coming forward. Thank you both so much. Your Excellency, Secretary well, Vilsack. I need to put a plug in for the fact Please that do. the next ministerial is going to be in That's Washington, right. D.C. Uh, the bar has been set quite high here. Um, and we're going to do our best to try to meet it, but it's, it will be next year in D.C., and it will be a summit where we will invite not just the ministers, but all of the partners, and we hope, obviously, today we have 140. We hope uh, by uh, next year at this time that number is significantly higher, and we're going to welcome them all to Washington, D.C. We very much hope so, and we wish you every continued success with this amazing endeavor. Please join me in thanking my esteemed guests for being here today. And just before we leave, sorry, just before we leave, um, thank you again, but let me tell you that coming up next, as we were talking about IBM, guess what, as if by magic, they're here. Uh, we're going to be spotlighting IBM Sustainability Accelerator with Justina Nixon St. Hill. She's coming up next. Thank you so much again. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. So thanks so much for giving me time here to present on the IBM Sustainability Accelerator. Um, we are very honored to be a part of Aim for Climate as an innovation sprint partner. So very excited to be here. So my name is Justina Nixon St. Hill. I'm the Vice President and Global Head of Corporate Social Responsibility at IBM. This announcement is actually a perfect example of how we work with nonprofit organizations, how we use our technology to accelerate sustainability efforts, and how we empower communities for the good of society. So how does IBM drive societal impact through nonprofit organizations? We do it because nonprofit organizations are the ones who drive real societal impact. Why do we do it? Because we believe the power of science, technology, and innovation are key to tackle environmental issues while helping underserved communities. Nonprofit organizations are strategically positioned to impact those communities. How do we do it? By uniting experts and technology with the purpose of improving lives. And in the end, what do we do? We enable organizations by leveraging the necessary resources and expertise to make a positive and lasting impact in their communities. So what is the Sustainability Accelerator? The Sustainability Accelerator is a way to use IBM's technologies, resources, and expertise, working in partnership with nonprofit organizations to mitigate the effects of climate change. Through 2025, the Accelerator will, receive an, will deliver an estimated market value of 30 million in IBM support, including 10 million just focused on sustainable agriculture. So what makes this program unique? It is global. So we are launching this program all over the world. It is available for any organization to join and apply and be a part of the Sustainability Accelerator. It is a two-year engagement. So we're not working with an organization for two months or three months. We're going to be working with them in partnership for over two years, and we're gonna provide end-to-end -end support from ideation to program implementation to actually measuring and evaluating the results. It also targets vulnerable populations. We wanted to make sure that we focused on climate justice and environmental justice, and we wanted to make sure that this makes a difference for those who are most vulnerable. And finally, all participation is free. We are providing all of the supports that the nonprofit organizations need to be successful in their communities. So what resources do we provide? The IBM Garage. The IBM Garage is IBM's proven methodology for applying design thinking and agile techniques to fast track meaningful innovation. You heard Secretary Vil Vilsack say earlier, this is really about investing in new innovations to really make a difference around sustainability. And we're able to do that through the IBM Garage. We provide cloud and weather credits as well so that organizations have access to data and information that's critical to making decisions to run their operations. We provide IBM technology. Some of the technologies are IBM Watson AI, IBM Cloud, and our environmental intelligence suite. And then we provide access to an IBM ecosystem, all the expertise that's needed to execute a comprehensive deployment, leveraging the extensive capabilities of IBM's breadth of technology and network of experts. We also provide access to other clients and other partners that can help support the program and scale the program. So the question is, is this really working? What have we seen so far? And the short answer is yes. We have conducted a pilot to test the program late um, in the fourth quarter, and we already have three organizations that we have worked with 
that have participated in the ideation and the initial development and deployment phase. These are the three organizations that are part of the first cohort of the, of the program. So the Nature Conservancy. So we partnered with the Nature Conservancy to build a public information platform to help eliminate crop residue burning in North India. And the final goal is to build this interactive hub that centralizes access to crop burning data. We're also going to provide farmers and communities with access to sustainable agriculture technology. Plan 21. So Plan 21 is helping smallholder farmers in Latin America manage their crops more sustainably. And the goal is increasing productivity, increasing yield, and increasing income. And they're also going to contribute to consumer awareness and the development of more responsible markets. Plan 21 is also used in our environmental intelligence suite to access weather forecasts that support their calculation of the farm's environmental footprints. And then finally, they are working with farmers to be able to showcase sustainability certifications and credentials for their crops. We're also working with Heifer International, and Heifer International is developing a scalable and affordable digital solution designed to equip farmers' cooperatives in Malawi. And they're going to provide weather and crop yield forecasts to help increase the farmers' yields and incomes. Their final goal is to provide digital solutions for farmers. And this is another way that we're reducing the digital divide for farmers in Malawi. So we're going to continue to measure and evaluate the impact of these projects. We're going to share insights about them. We're gonna support the scale of the projects, especially after we are able to demonstrate positive impact. And we're going to report on the results. So we're really excited to be able to do that at the upcoming COP26, uh, sorry, COP27 and COP28. So if anyone is interested in working with us on these programs, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free to access our IBM.org website where you can get more information. And we look forward to working with you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to Justina, and uh, thank you again, delegates, dignitaries, excellencies, for attending. Thank you very much. Time now for our final series of presentations, and we're going out on a high note with uh, more forward-looking strategies, looks towards a brighter future. We touched upon earlier the tech of tomorrow. We had part one, this is part two. We've already heard from the United Arab Emirates, we've heard from New Zealand, and also from Australia about both the challenges and the solutions facing the agricultural industries. Now we have three more countries for you. We're going to hear from Estonia, Hungary, and South Korea. So let me invite the first of our presenters to the stage. He is Martin Laidler. He is the PR manager of Click and Grow in Estonia. Please welcome him. Could I, could I also have a clicker here? Thank you. So, you know, there's this old Chinese proverb that's saying that if you want to be happy for a day, then get drunk. If you want to be happy for a month, then get married. But if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, then become a gardener. Now, as you can imagine, I'm not here to get you drunk tonight or give you marriage advice. But instead, I'm here to tell you all that we can all become gardeners and with this make our food systems more sustainable. Hi, my name is Martin Leidla. I'm from an Estonian and international urban farming company called Click and Grow. And at Click and Grow, we develop, produce, and market really simple to use indoor smart gardens. 
Now, these indoor smart gardens allow anyone to grow their own fresh, leafy greens, herbs, small fruits and vegetables indoors, anywhere around the world, in any indoor climate, all around the year. Now, this is what we call hyper-local hyper growing. It means that the growing is done at the exact same place where the consumption is taking place. And we believe that the future of fresh, vitamin-rich foods is hyper-local growing. Now, we see that the way we produce and consume food is the single biggest sustainability challenge we face today. There are a huge number of different problems with our food systems that we have been talking about throughout the day today. But what I'd like to emphasize is that we are already producing enough to feed everyone. But there's still so much overuse and so much food waste happening that many of us don't get the necessary vitamins from our food. But we see also an exciting opportunity to turn things around. And the opportunity lies in a more democratized way of farming, of us all becoming gardeners of sorts. Now, this cannot be done easily with staple crops like maize or wheat or, or soybeans or even milk and dairy products because obviously we cannot all get cows into our city apartments. But it could be done with the vitamin-rich part of our food plates, the one-fifth that gives us the most micronutrients. We see that the underlying problem of our food systems is that the supply chains are just too long. There are so many ways happening in different parts of it. There are so many different actors in it that it's hard to fix the whole system. There are really great solutions to different kind of food sustainability problems. For example, there are good food waste apps. There are vertical farms that are bringing farming closer to people. But all of these solutions just fix one part of the big, big problem without having any control over the rest of the big picture. Now, we would like to make the food supply chains really, really short, from thousands of kilometers to just kitchen to fork, from farm to fork, not farm to fork, but kitchen to fork. The small fixes that we are usually doing to our food supply chains, we believe that there, on the planet, we, we just don't have time to deal with them. So we need to reimagine the whole system. Obviously, it doesn't work, as I said, with staple crops. But if we would start focusing on the vitamin-rich part of our food systems, then we could do it. Now, why we should also focus not working, why we should also focus on the vitamin-rich part of our food plates, the leafy greens, uh, herbs, small fruits and vegetables, is because those food crops have the highest inefficiencies in our food supply chains. Globally, over 60% of leafy greens go to waste, while aver on average for food products, the waste rate is one-third. This is the biggest inefficiency. Also, the leafy greens that are supposed to give us a lot of nutrients don't do it because they're in the uh, food supply chains for so long time. They're in there for weeks and days, but if it would make them be in the supply chains for minutes, if we could farm at the exact place where we consume it, then this would preserve a lot of vitamins and it would help us in dealing with a big problem that is the micronutrient deficiency in our diets. Now, two billion people are getting enough or even too many calories, even in the wealthy world, but they're not getting enough micronutrients in their diets. And this is where hyperlocal growing could be a really game-changing solution. Now, growing some of our daily food where we consume it helps our planet and drastically improves our physical and also our mental health. So here I'd like to emphasize the mental health part as you might know, gardening is one of the most mentally beneficial, calming activities one can do. But then you might start asking, is it really possible 
that every one of us will become a gardener. So you would say usually that you don't have time to do it, you don't have the knowledge to do it, you don't know the first thing about how to grow food, uh, or you don't, just don't have the room to do it because all of us don't have gardens. Now, the key here is simplicity and ease of use. And that's why at Click and Grow we have focused, we have devoted to create this simplest to use indoor gardening technology. Now, all of our gardens use the same underlying technology and work as easily as operating an espresso capsule coffee machine. You just insert plant pods and the garden does the rest for you. All of our gardens use the same technology that's based on these soil pods, plant pods. We call it smart soil. These plant pods have all the nutrients inside, they control the pH levels, they control the perfect levels of moisture throughout the plant's life cycle. And all of our gardens, from the smaller ones to the industrial-sized ones, use the same technology, and this could be put into use in kind of other do-it-yourself situations as well, where you wouldn't have, for example, power to run the grow lights. Now, this technology also makes sense business-wise, because this essentially democratizes the way we are producing food. When growing hyper-locally with our solution, there's no huge upfront investment in farming equipment. The cost of energy is paid by the growers, and all the resources that are put into growing the plant are put into full use, since there's no food waste happening. This is something that even the innovative vertical farms cannot achieve, since they often cannot control the rest of the value chain. Now, using our technology, it also uses 95% less water. It creates two and a half times less greenhouse gas emissions. There's no pesticides used. There's, uh, there's no other chemicals used. So the produce that you get is organic, but we'd like to say that it's even beyond organic. Since you grow it yourself, you know that there's nothing on it except the plant that you have grown. Now, if you would like to, like to find out more about this technology, then come visit us at the Estonian Pavilion here at the Expo, where we have thousands of plants growing food on site for the local restaurant in their daily dishes. But to end things up, I'd like to come back to the Chinese proverb. I really believe that gardening can make us happier. It can help make our bellies happier, our planet happier, and our brains happier. <laughs> but what we also see throughout the world in 150 countries where our gardens are being used is that the people who start growing their own food, normal people, businessmen, everyone who, who usually don't have time to do it, what we see in them is that if they start growing their own food, if they become responsible for growing some of their foods daily, from seed to finish, and if they finally consume the plants that they have grown, then this creates the most profound and deep connection with plants and nature that you can get. You can't get, create this connection better with any other practice. And it also creates a huge appreciation towards nature. And this can foster other sustainable lifestyle choices, make the people more sustainable. So I'd like to invite you all to become gardeners, to make your friends gardeners and your families gardeners. And if you don't have the time, the knowledge, or the place to do it, then you can start using technologies like ours. Thank you. Thank you so much to Martin for that excellent presentation. Now, for our next guest, I would like to welcome to the stage Samea Amane. She is the business development consultant for Nthin Inc. Nthing Inc. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but I hope I've said it correctly. In South Korea, she's flown in to be with us today. Please welcome her.
Hello, everyone. So, um, when I say the year 2020, what comes first to your mind? The coronavirus pandemic, right? It is the newest entry to a long list of challenges that we've been facing for decades as humans. The newest one, but the ones that made us rethink many conventional um, processes and practices, and um, such as uh, farming, sustainability, and food supply. I'm Sumaya Aman, the uh, business development consultant at Enthink for MENA region. Enthink is a smart farm that uh, was founded in 2014 with the aim to revolutionize the food and agriculture industry with Internet of Things technology and to facilitate the sustainable supply of healthy, uh, safe, and tasty food anytime and anywhere, regardless of outdoors environment. That is how we came up with our IoT module, uh, an artificial intelligence-based solution for 100% controlled indoor vertical farming environment with a specific crop recipe for each crop. And we are using it to step forward in the, into the agriculture digital transformation. Uh, new to this. Um, so, how, you would ask me. Uh, we think conventional farming, and the first thing we imagine would be uh, extended uh, food mileage and uncontrolled risks, such as uh, poor crop nutrition and um, low productivity yields, etc. So with all the advantages of vertical farming, and in addition to those, digital transformation guarantee the quality and the quantity of uh, crops while minimizing the risks, and uh, all in a controlled environment by AI and uh, sensors. After a successful application in the Korean market, we wanted to expand um, our concept of digital transformation to other regions and markets. And we noticed that in the GCC, the food demand have been uh, boosted by growing population and uh, evolving diet um, uh, behaviors among consumers. Uh, inevitably, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions on food exports uh, did overturn the food supply uh, chain of worldwide and uh, struck fears on the uh, region uh, for food shortage um, because it's a region that relies on imports for over 85% of its food requirement. But supported by the governments, the GCC governments, uh, by investing in uh, development of R&D and innovation, the uh, GCC food sector has been more reliant in the last, uh, self-reliant in the last 10 years. Uh, in fact, the UAE leads uh, in the implementation of technology in agriculture. Hence our choice four years ago to bring our technology to the UAE, partner with Zaria Holding, and um, uh, set up our smart farm in Abu Dhabi in a strategic project called Smart Acres. It is represented in both uh, Abu Dhabi, um, UAE and South Korean pavilion. Uh, please visit if you still didn't have the chance to do it. So this video will allow you to see a little bit more about our products.
So, as we already know, in the next few decades, the uh, greater challenge will be to achieve food security. And the World Health Organization have developed uh, and included the development of crops that are nutritionally rich uh, to, one, uh, uh, to its main goals. So NFINC not only offers a low-risk, region-specific crop production to consumers and retailers, but also a sustainable solution to uh, provide micronutrient-rich functional crops to customers uh, and final consumers. What are the functional crops? So, unlike the conventional and other smart farms, our farm allows the control of nutrients supplied to crops through different uh, stages of growth. And these enhanced and optimized crops can contribute positively to the healthcare field. By, on one hand, the uh, benefits to uh, chronic disease patients like diabetes and uh, kidney failure disease uh, patients, and on the other hand, by reducing the risk of um, other chronic disease such as cancer and cardiovascular condition diseases. With more than 50 customizable and diverse uh, recipes for crops, we focus on crop development. Our R&D team works constantly on perfecting the uh, different types of uh, crop recipes, such as low nitrate, low potassium, and high calcium lettuce uh, recipe by uh, running uh, cultivation tests and uh, subjecting them to uh, mineral analysis constantly. Uh, what you can see here is example of uh, the samples on the Abu Dhabi farm. And we successfully doubled the levels of calcium and reduced by more than half the levels of potassium in red oak leaf. So this begs the question, I'm sure, um, how competitive and cost-effective is this innovative and unique solution. By examining the process from germination pot to the consumer plate, Enfink constantly works on improving the value chain. Based on our studies, the uh, costs of labor sourcing and uh, transportation storage for conventional farms can go up to 50% of the not so profitable uh, crop cost. Moreover, the distribution cost alone of leafy greens can uh, take up to 69% versus 25% only uh, from other uh, food crop distribution costs, and all due to a very uh, inefficient and complex process from farm to plate. That is why MFINC uh, proposes to set up the smart farm close by the retailers and customers, uh, reducing uh, the uh, food mileage and optimizing the healthy shelf life of the crop, and by the same mean, the food safety condition of it. This allows the retailers to become more sustainable by reducing the distribution cost and uh, food waste. To sum it up, choosing MFINC farm uh, solution means producing customizable and on-demand functional crops using scalable digital trans transformation with high quality and cost effectiveness, all part of an optimized value chain. So, 2021 was a good year for MFINC. We successfully completed our proof of concept in Abu Dhabi, allowing us to uh, move forward in the process of expanding our farm, CubeX84. And on a global scale, we launched the world's largest um, modular vertical farming 
in uh, Ichon, South Korea that will have the capacity to produce up to 400 tons of crops per year. This is how we envision 2023, um, to become the maturization of many ongoing projects with the priority to focus on uh, the GCC market and uh, specifically on the UAE and Kuwait uh, market. We believe strongly that um, our technology can help significantly achieving the food security in the region. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to Sumeya representing anything from South Korea and their ambitions here in the United Arab Emirates. Time for our final presentation, and it comes to you from Hungary. Let me introduce to you Karoli Ludwig. He is the technical manager at ABZ Drone. Please welcome him. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Efficient and the future of agricultural drones. My name is Karoj Ludwig, and I've been designing and building drones for more than 10 years. I'm the CTO of ABC Drone, a Hungarian drone company specialized in developing and distributing agricultural and other in industrial drones. Before we start, uh, let me give you a brief overview about one of the main challenges we are facing as the population of Earth is constantly growing. Food. As you all probably know, feeding so many people requires industrial solutions, which in reality means monoculture farming. But when we are focusing on only one type of crop at a specific field, it will become an easy target for pests and diseases. Using pesticides is a must when it comes to nearly 8 billion people. Unfortunately, these pesticides have some disadvantages, including negative environmental and health effects. That is why sustainable development goals were created by the United Nations to significantly reduce the number of death and illnesses caused by soil, water and air pollution due to the overuse of chemicals. The European Union went even further with a new re regulation that specified 50% reduction of pesticides by 2013. What if I told you that these ambitious goals could be met today with the help of agricultural drones? To understand the advantages of drones, first we have to talk about tradi traditional plant protection methods. Imagine a huge machine with an even bigger tank that slowly moves up and down the field with a wide hydraulic spraying boom. The problem with hydraulic spraying is the principle of droplet formation. It uses pressure to squeeze the water through the nozzles in order to create the mist that supports the plants. But this mist contains droplets of very different sizes. The small ones will never reach the plants. They will evaporate directly to the cloud base, causing pollution hundreds of miles away. The big ones will simply roll down to the ground, having no use whatsoever. And the end, around 50%, will not just go to waste, but will cause unnecessary pollution. Not to mention, this method needs water a lot, like 200 to 500 liters per hectare. These key issues can be addressed today by using drones. The simple fact alone that the drone is flying instead of rolling on wheels will provide more even and more efficient pesticide coverage for the plants. Why? The answer is very simple, actually. Uh, the drone creates downward airflow. 
with its propellers, like a fan tilted down. And if we release these droplets directly into this airflow, it will force them to evenly settle on the leaves. Adapting a more advanced spraying system could make even better use of this phenomenon, controlled droplet application. The secret of efficient spraying lies in the even and target targeted liquid distribution. CDA technology does exactly that. It uses low pressure to drip the water into a specifically designed fast rotating disc. Thanks to the centrifugal force, the droplets will break off evenly from the edge of the disc, as you can see in the picture. By adjusting how fast the disc spins, we can accurately set the desired droplet size. Being able to set different droplet sizes, customize intervention plans for specific needs, as all plants, all pests, and all diseases require different treatment possible results. Also, we can get rid of the previously mentioned two small and two big droplets, which means no waste and no unnecessary pollution. Our own experiments and real-life treatments that we've done over the years support the already existing studies that with drones, up to 95% of the water and up to 60% of pesticides can be saved compared to traditional methods. Just one example from last season, we had to do uh, weed control treatment in corn. In one half of the field, a tractor used 300 liters of water with two liters of monsoon active pesticide. In the other half, we used 10 liters of water with half the dose of pesticides. After seeing the results, the farmer bought three drones. Beyond the advanced spraying methods, there's another key aspect that can further decrease the use of chemicals. For decades, as a general practice, spraying meant that the whole field must be covered with pesticides to prevent any problems, also using the biggest dose allowed just to make sure. And it is understandable when there is no more information about the actual condition of the plants other than what we can see by walking near the edge of the field. With the appearance of drones, gathering data became, well, easy and effective. A small drone equipped with a special multispectral camera can help decide if spraying is really necessary or not. But to understand how multispectral imaging exactly works, we have to take a step back. Plants are like humans. Their appetite changes when they are not feeling well. A healthy corn will absorb blue and red light and will reflect green, hence the color of the leaves. But if there's a problem, it won't be able to absorb and reflect the normal amount of light. By measuring the reflectance of a plant at different wavelengths, multispectral imaging enables identification of areas S in a crop and provides a quantitative metric for the vigor of a plant. For this, we are not only able to focus treatment specifically when it's needed, but also can detect issues weeks before the human eye could. By analyzing data on crop health and stress, we can prevent diseases. Furthermore, from an environmental and, well, also a financial point of view, this means that data-based agriculture can further decrease the use of pesticides and chemicals. Imagine a 100 hectare crop field. On average, it needs five spraying throughout the year. It means 150,000 liters of water and around 1,000 liters of pesticides. By adapting a multispectral-based treatment plan, it only needs spraying when and where it is actually necessary. Instead of spraying the whole 100 hectares five times, it may only need four treatments on 50 hectares, and that is a very pessimistic example. 
Spot spraying only the affected areas with a drone needs 2,000 liters of water and around 200 liters of pesticides. That is 98.7% less water and 80% less pesticides. Finally, I would like to share with you one of my favorite experiments from last year. We spent three days at the hills of Tokai trying to find the best settings for spraying organic vineyards. In this experiment, for the sake of testing the precision and droplet evenness of the spraying, we used a special UV paint instead of pesticides. When night fell, the winemaker was able to thoroughly examine the leaves with a UV lamp. It is worth taking a look at the picture on the right. The dropness distribution, the drop dif dro droplet dif distribution is so even that there is no gap for pests to attack the leaves. We could achieve this coverage with 90% less water. Deploying the drones took half the time and the operating costs were reduced by 50% compared to a traditional grape spraying method like an axial fan. I know these numbers sound extreme, and to be honest, we are constantly in fear that after a while we will just realize that there was something wrong with our calculations. But it has been years with consistent data, and everybody else in the industry are getting similar results. We believe that looking into the not-so-distant future, there are drones flying in swarms, based on data also gathered by drones, providing us a sustainable food supply. If you maybe have any questions or just want to talk more about drones, you can find us tomorrow at the Hungarian Pavilion from 2 to 4, or just go to abzdrone.com. Thank you. Thank you so much to Carolee, to Samaya, and of course to Martin for their elucidating presentations and being here today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, draws our agenda to a close. Plenty of inspiring thoughts, I'm sure, uh, will be left with you from all of our speakers and presentations and our panel discussions. Some of them that stay top of mind for me, we must shorten the supply chain, make it as small as possible. We have to embrace non-conventional production, non-traditional foods, and alternative staples. We need to positively disrupt, as one speaker said, because just to disrupt without purpose means that you are simply a distraction. We know that the world's population is forecast to reach around 10 billion by 2050. We've heard this many times repeated today, but to truly understand it is scary because we know that we could also feed everybody in the world today if we just had better supply chains and distribution. It's our responsibility collectively to pull together to make sure that that does happen. As an, another speaker said today, we need to prioritize and respect not only food, but nature and people. People and the planet first, before profits. And so, with much work to be done and much optimism for the future from all of the speakers that we've heard from today, we hope that you enjoyed our forum. We thank you virtually for watching and for being here physically with us. On behalf of PepsiCo, the governments of New Zealand and Estonia, and of course the Dubai Chambers of Commerce, thank you for participating and attending. And we very much hope that you will step outside these doors and continue to explore all the delights of Expo. It's a wonderful experience. You won't be disappointed. You still have time. So until we meet again, thank you, take care, and enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>